Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Chime, the award-winning banking app and suite of basic banking features. Get started at chime.com slash sacred. That's C-H-I-M-E dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D today. Again, for basic banking accounts, a debit card, a credit card, and more, all wrapped up into a highly usable and flexible app, head to chime.com slash sacred today. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, a delightful way to break a notoriously bad habit. For the unaware, Fume is a so-called flavored air device, a completely analog implement that, as the name suggests, emits flavored air for the user. Instead of vapor and so on, Fume allows a user to literally just draw air that tastes and smells great. My friends, start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com sacred. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code sacred to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Again, for the completely analog, all natural fume, head to tryfume dot com slash sacred today. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash Media. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 292. How have we done so many of these? I don't know. It doesn't feel like it. I don't remember any of them. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, Chris Reagan. Now, Chris, your hat. Never seen it before. No. What is it? This is a, this is a Destiny hat, actually. Oh, okay. It's, it's a, it was given to me by a, a friend who works on trailers, apparently. Is it a bird? It's a, it's a warlock emblem. Warlock. Okay. Yeah. Boo. Yeah, I know. Warlocks. That's what I said. Yeah, that's, that's what I said. Yeah, better I than like, a Titan, though. All right, let's relax. You know, <laughs> the hunters are where it's at. <sighs> we have cloaks and capes. Whatever, man. So, what's with what's with Dagan calling himself the Dagster? He's been doing this recently. The Dagster. Yeah, he did it a few times. And I'm just I just looked up on my on my right monitor and hit tweet from him 15 minutes ago. Some people get annoyed that I break up my text into multiple texts, but when you hear that I patent double or triple or you know it's the Dagster coming through. I, I don't, don't know like about it. it. I don't. I mean, is this like a midlife crisis sitch? I don't know. You know, it's better than mm-hmm. saying Dagmeister. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'd rather have Dagster than Dagmeister. <laughs> right. The Dagmeister general, yeah. Right, 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 right. It'd be a problem. Dustin Furman, executive producer, good to see you. Hello. How are you today? Doing okay. I uh, yesterday I had a misfortune where some some of you may notice I'm a little more clean shaven than normal. Complete. Oh, you fucked. You fucked up. Yeah, I went. I got my. So last time I shaved my beard, I I left it on the kitchen sink like a degenerate. Not the kitchen sink, the bathroom sink like a degenerate. Holly very nicely put it away for me. I try not to do that. Very nice. Uh, when I got it out though, my my pieces were all over the place. I was like, oh, this is the right one. I put one line down the side and I was like, oh no, <laughs> that was not the right one, which it's okay. It grows back. I, yeah. I feel a little, I don't know. A little, what do you think? A little more youthful, a little more baby boyish. That's just a, that's just a little boy. That's just a young boy. Young boy. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin Furman, he's just a young boy. Don't like lad. that. He's just a little boy. Give me a little boy. So I'm going to sit on Papa's lap right now. Come Don't like over. that at all. Come on over oh. here to Vicksburg, Mississippi. All right. Why was I reading about Vicksburg recently? Oh, yeah. I've been reading a lot about Jefferson Davis for some reason in the last few days. That came mm-hmm. up on Knockback as well. I have no idea why. He married a woman. I didn't know this. He was in his 40s and she was 18. Oh, yeah. Take it easy, buddy. I mean, it's I- legal. It was legal even if she wasn't 18 back then, to be perfectly honest with you. But yeah. but uh, we found that a little strange. And there was a picture I was telling Dagan of, of the two of them together, and he looks like he's 70. People were aging hard back then. Yeah, it's because, really, really I, hard. I, yeah. It kind of blows my mind thinking about people because, like, you see interviews with people who grew up in the 70s, and they're like, yeah, we just didn't drink water. <laughs> I've yeah, seen I that a lot. Like, I, never, I never drank water at all. That was not a thing yeah. that happened. No, I know. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. <laughs> no one ever told me to drink water. No one ever said, do you want any water? When you consider how important hy- hydration is for just general <laughs> health, it makes sense why people are like 30 in, you know, the 1800s or whatever, and they look like they're on death's door. They've know? only ever had four glasses of water in their life. 
Yeah, it's like whiskey. They just like yeah, yeah. I wake up in the morning, have whiskey, coffee, and uh, that's it. Yep, <laughs> that was it. All people were drinking for ages. Right. What about the? Uh, you know, it's kind of. I don't know if construction workers are aging rapidly, but I think about these guys that go in. They grab two monsters, pack a zin, and uh, that's like breakfast and lunch right there. How are they surviving? They're built different. Yeah, the zin zin is becoming like this phenomenon. Yeah, the zin in some ways. sense. And especially in sports, I've noticed that a lot of people are fucking around with it. It's totally fine. I don't, I'm not a doctor. If you guys didn't know this, I don't in fact have my MD. Holy shit. Uh, But is nicotine that bad for you? I don't think so. It doesn't feel like that's what's bad for you. It feels like uh, there's some other things that are probably a lot worse for you than that. They say nicotine sharpens the mind. I think Mm -hmm. it was Tucker Carlson. I was watching an interview with him not too long ago where he said something about like how it, but I'm not really familiar with it on that level, so I don't I know mean, how it, how it feels. Yeah, that, go ahead. that's true, but that's that's kind of like, like meth does that too. Oh yeah, yeah, true. you know what I mean. Where true. it's like you gotta you gotta be really careful, right? With your uh, what's that? What's that saying? Moderation is key. Yeah, not that, not that you should be doing hardcore meth in moderation, but you yeah. know what I mean. Just do meth once or twice a week. Sure, and I think you'll be all right. Well, it's good to be here with all of you guys today. Big episode today, finally. Yeah. Also, there's a state. So we're going to talk about the state of play. Obviously, it's nice because we get to record the entire episode at once. Usually they do these on Thursday. And so we have to record an interstitial, but we can actually do it all at once, which is pretty sweet. In my opinion, I'm feeling pretty good. We're going to wait for it, though. We have so many things to get to before we get to the, the state of play. And I promise we'll talk about every game that was on there. I have copious notes everywhere. I also and it's not even in the in the, um, in the document because I forgot to put it in there. I have an exclusive as well that I'll be talking about later and what Fire Sprite's next game is, at least its code name, some details about it that were leaked to me by a reliable source. So we'll talk about that. I also want to uh, quickly congratulate, and I ran to get this before the show because I got this in the mail a couple days ago. My friend Sandy Bry doing the retro PlayStation magazine over on Kickstarter. The second issue is here. This is so cool. It's so well done. And I just want to give him a shout out for this because it's just so, let me see, like, like a whole God of War thing with with look, look at this layout. It's pretty nice. Like it's it's pretty sweet. I'm glad that now I'll pat myself on the back and say that it was originally the, the birth of this is my idea to have a retro PlayStation magazine, but I would have never actually executed on it. So here it is. Sandy Bry, go support him. He's a great guy over on Kickstarter, if you'd like. OK, it's, it's cool. Yeah, it is. It's got a nice little spine, nice little construction. It comes all the way from England, but it comes nice and nice and solid. And uh, I'm pr- I'm proud of them. It's it's hard to do. It's hard to do things like this. All right. Yeah. Well, this is Sacred Symbols of PlayStation Podcast. Good to be here with all of you today. Thank you for being here. Remember, you can get our show three days early and ad free over on Patreon at patreon.com slash last stand media. You get other perks there as well, including access to Sacred Symbols Plus Discord access. You can use the RSS feed to feed early ad free podcasts into your uh, into your podcast app of choice. We're also on Spotify. You can connect with Patreon. I'm not really sure how that works because I use Spotify, but I also own the company, so I don't have to pay for the content. So it's a little bit confusing there about how what I'm supposed to really do to test it. But um, Sacred Symbols Plus episodes tomorrow from when this goes live, big episode of Sacred Symbols Plus. We'll not tell you who it is. Again, what I would consider the most requested guest, non-developing guest we've ever had on the show. And I think it's it's an awesome episode. You're going to love it. Sacred Symbols Cross Defining Duke went up recently. We did the Insomniac Leak Breakdown, Fantasy Critic Picks, and so on and so forth. So check all those things out. Merch at laststandmedia.store. And if you listen or watch on free feeds, we appreciate you. Um, Leave us a nice review. Five stars. Tell a friend. And so on and so forth. Now, Eric Cave wrote in. Said, hello, Sacred Crew. I just wanted to write in to say that after a month's worth of reflection, I have been very pleased with the direction that Last Stand overall has taken in 2024. I can say with confidence that nowhere else on the internet can I spend $5 a month and receive the amount of length and girth of content as I do with the various shows you offer, and I thank you all immensely for it. You're very welcome for that. Thank you so much for your kind support. We had our biggest month ever in January. We call that the Bradley Ellis effect, (laughs) as I said. Now, did you like that I tagged Reset Era in the tweet? Yeah. I I wonder what they thought thought of that. I thought that was a little funny Easter egg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, live show coming up in New York City, March twenty fourth. Right? Is that what it is? Yeah. Tickets are available. I think it's March twenty fourth. Yeah, that's right. Palm Sunday. Tickets are available. Not very many. I mean, a smattering of tickets. I think we're going to sell the show out. 
which is pretty cool. So thank you for that. Check that out. Will Gear wrote into us on Patreon and said, hey, CDC, I may have missed an announcement on this, but will the New York City show be filmed? Thanks. Of course it will be. But we're going to put it up for patrons later and for free feeds much later. But I am going to do this, Dustin. I already instructed you for this episode because this episode is so important in some sense for the PlayStation community. We finally have things to talk about, exciting things, good things. Make this episode free for all immediately for everyone. Free feeds, YouTube. No Patreon paywall for this episode. So come on in. If you like what we do, come support us. We couldn't do it without you. $1 on a month, $2 in. a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. I'm sorry, Dustin, you have something to say. That's, that's a Southern gentleman says, come on in. Come on down. Sit down, sacred symbols. Come on down here with your pappy. <laughs> come on down here with your grandpappy and come on down here and sit down <laughs> on this rocking chair. Come on down. <laughs> Don't make eye contact with the help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The boy in the kitchen's a little bit crazy. Don't look at him. Mm. <laughs> all right. Oh, God. Appreciate all of you guys out there. Is there anything else? That I, I'm looking around my desk to make sure that there's nothing. No notes. Because I have actually have a bunch of notes this week because of the state of play. All right. Let's get into some quick topics of discussion. We'll get into the smaller news items. We'll get into what we're playing. Then we'll get into the state of play and the other news of the week. And wrap it up with six questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. Paul S. wrote in, we're going to talk about this game later, but corrections always go at the top. He says, hey, CDC, quick correction from last week. Colin, you said Prince of Persia was the first Metroidvania game you'd played with the stamp system on the map, allowing you to mark custom locations. Hollow Knight actually had this mechanic in it in 2017, although you had to buy the stamps from a vendor. Glad to hear you like the game, though, as I think it's the best new game in the genre since Hollow Knight. Um, thank you for the correction. A few people wrote in about this. I beat Hollow Knight. I don't remember that at all. But Hollow Knight was probably... 150 games ago at this point you have to think so like something literally like that right <laughs> yeah so i don't remember a goddamn thing about Knight. i just truly don't it was a lot of fun though i remember that i remember the end game stuff like the, the post game optional shit being so difficult that's what i remember about hollow Knight. but it was a fun game and that sequel apparently comes out soon it always it's always it makes a lot of sense what a metroidvania sequel takes uh eight years to make i don't know what that's all about a little strange um but thank you for the correction loud and clear appreciate that Adam Barnes wrote in and said, hey, Colin, can you please ban Ryan already? He's a pest. Who's Ryan? Fuck Ryan, dude. I don't know who Ryan is. I've had enough of him. That, what are you talking that? about? That, you know, Ryan, he's just always being a pest <sighs> wherever Who's he Ryan? goes. I need more specificity than this. <sighs> Have you ever known you a Ryan? Know. Do you know any Ryans? Like personally? I know one Ryan. I knew one when I was a kid, but that was it. Like a little kid. He was a friend of my good friend, and we kind of had a rivalry because we both wanted this kid to be our best friend. And his name was Ryan. And so I always think about that. Is that yeah. real? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking like 1990, you know, something like that. that. Sounds, it sounds like a very sitcom ass problem. Well, like yeah. I lived next to this kid. I was in, you know, I was a year younger than this kid, Tim, who lived next to me in my old neighborhood. And he, he was great. And he had a friend that was his age that they went to school with. So I was always jealous because we went to school and we could never be in the same classes or I was always a year wow. behind him and they yeah. were always together. And so I always kind of envied their friendship. Yeah. Right. Because you were right next door, but like you were a year behind. So you never had classes. It was like, right, weird. exactly. And then they right. would come over and then I wasn't really like, they didn't ask me to play with them when they were together. And you know, mm. so I was, I was, I was the young, I was always the youngest in all these different situations, whether with my siblings and my family, whatever, poor Colin, it explains a lot. Speaking about myself in third person, by the way, Adam, I have no I don't know who Ryan is. Yeah, I'm going to need more specificity next time. But I thought the, the comment was nebulous enough that I wanted to read it. <laughs> King Kulak wrote in. Said, hey, SS boys, glad to see Dustin getting on the health train. As someone who recently lost about 70 pounds from dieting and exercise, I am cheering for you. I am a six two man, six foot two inches who went from being over 260 pounds and now down to 190. I can tell you getting my health in check is the best thing I've decided to do in a long time. I feel better. I sleep better. I look better and have a better long term health forecast. As a side note, I will say it's funny to me when people ask what I did to lose weight and what diet I tried. And I reply dryly with counting calories and running. They're almost never pleased with that answer. Everyone wants to hear that I went on some secret magic diet that they haven't tried. But unfortunately for them, there aren't any shortcuts to health and weight loss. Good luck to you on your journey and keep up the fitness. y'all. I mean, that's the whole thing with me. And congratulations to you, Dustin, because you look great. I mean, I can tell that 10 pounds oh, today. Ten one pounds, month, that's great. Today's the yeah. one month in. So, how do you feel? Do you feel better? 
No, I don't feel any different. Uh, I just feel like my shirts feel a little better, fit a little better now, which is a big part of it. I didn't feel really bad. I just knew that I was on the verge of going to feel bad. Ten where pounds I was is pretty have, yeah. as serious in a month. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping, Mike, I originally told Holly, I was like, I want to do 30 before Sacred 300. She's like, that might be unhealthy. I realize that probably yeah. would be unhealthy. But if I could do yeah, another that- 10, 10-ish before Sacred 300, I'd be pumped. Mm. That would be cra- that would be crazy. Sincerely, like that, that, that's an insane amount of weight to. You'd have to do that thing that uh, boxers do, where they like they sleep in like a like a oh, giant blankets? bag. Yeah. Oh. And they just, and they just sweat it all out. Sweat the, it in out. Their sleep. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's, uh, uh, it's so gross. Ugh. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty rough. Yeah, that doesn't sound uh, very fun at all. I mean, I barely, no. I, I can't stand sweating. Period. Uh, at all. No, exactly. I hate it. I avoided yeah. all possibilities, though. I am doing, like I said, the, the treadmill after 45 minutes at a good pace. You will break a little sweat. Not a big one. A little bit. And I don't like not it. Go, not going hard enough. Well, I was so I've, I've watched many YouTube videos. So that means I'm fully educated. And apparently walking is really the, like just as good as running in some cases overall, uh, depending on what you're trying to do whether you know cardio versus just like movement and stuff like that so yeah just the walking has been good it made a difference immediately because i was stuck at the same weight and then i decided i was like okay i gotta get movement in so i added movement and added drinking water and then i immediately dropped three more pounds yeah so good for you that's awesome congratulations yeah i i've never tried to go on i I, there have been a few specific diets i've gone on just to see if they would work not even for weight loss like i when i was in san francisco i remember trying to do like paleo for a little while or like trying not to eat carbs. You know, I think you can eat fewer than 10 grams of carbs a day or something. And then you go into ketosis. Yeah. I never even went into it, but cause I had no discipline, but I remember trying out all of these different things just out of curiosity. There's like the carnivore diet and all this, but I'm a believer. I'm just a rational person, I think. And I think that it's literally just a math equation mm-hmm. and that's it. There, there's nothing more or less to it than that. And whatever works for people works for people. But I believe that it's just, you I'm not going to stop eating whatever I want to eat. It's about volume. It totally is. And about movement, like you said. Right. So I don't know. My weight's pretty steady. I'm probably about between 190 and 200 right now. But I've gained a lot of muscle weight, to be fair. So because um, I, I got to say, I look at myself in the mirror without a shirt on sometimes. And I'm like, not that I'm like ripped or cut, but I'm so you're so used to looking. I'm 30. I'm 39. You know, I've looked at myself in the mirror a lot. And it's like, holy mm. shit, like you're kind of built now. It's a little weird that was seeing that was very it motivated me because I was like, holy shit, you actually can see the muscles like the difference like you are. It hurts and it sucks when you're doing it. But then like, holy shit, you have arms. And and, and so it's a it's a nice (laughs) feeling. Yeah. So I don't look like a little girl anymore because I was was looking at Ramon was sending me some old pictures of us in college and I was like, holy shit, dude, I was like so skinny. And Mm. It's great. I mean, I loved it. I ate whatever I wanted, did whatever I wanted. I was a great, I, I was very athletic, but some, somewhere along the line, you shut down. And um, have you cheated at all? I mean, that, I hear that's very important, actually, for, for your, not even for your mental yeah. stuff, which it is, but for your metabolism, it's important, apparently, to spike it. Right? I would say I've kind of half cheated. And what I mean by that is there's been a few cases on the weekends where, uh, like, when my parents were here, they wanted to go out. And I was like, well, fuck. I can't count calories at the local at the at the chop shop, the place we went here in Butler. So what I did was for lunch, I ate two eggs and a like low calorie pita. I think it was like less than 200 calories. And then I had like a reasonable burger with water. I don't know how many calories it was. I think it was in the right realm, but I don't really know. So but as far as like. Oh, like cheat days or full blown cheat meals or evenings? No, like that's that, so interesting. Yeah, I think that will totally throw you off. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the philosophy is behind it. Like, I the first time I ever really heard about it in a major way actually was from The Rock, because he would. I think he still does post pictures of his cheat days, and they're nuts. Right, you know, like he eats like a whole pizza and like a bunch of burgers and fries. Like, and apparently this like kind of shocks your metabolism because otherwise you eat 1500 calories, let's say a day. And they're like, okay, that's all I need. So then when you like, as you get older and then you get bumped to like 1800, it's like, well, you're eating too much. And apparently mm. this kind of shocks it. Yeah. And, and to not doing that, I, that's, I guess the philosophy behind it, but I don't really know for sure. 
Yeah, I'd imagine it's probably more okay if you're in a maintenance mode or if you're <laughs> the rock and working out and doing crazy shit. <laughs> but I'm not I'm not risking it for now. I mean, I'm I'm only a month in and I've been I've been fine with those like semi cheats where I suffer most of the day in order to eat one meal. I don't Good like doing it. That's great. Well, I'm happy for you. Thanks. I think it's wonderful. Um health is wealth. Mm-hmm. And uh Cog and I did a did an episode all about that last year, just about our own little regimens. I like to see people taking care of themselves. You know, I'm not God's gift to, to man at all. I'm, I'm, I would, I have a little bit of a belly obviously and stuff like that. Cause I, no matter how much I work out, you cannot run your diet, but I don't like seeing people out there just really losing touch with normalcy with their bodies. Cause it's like you, you fuck your whole life up. Like everything is fucked up when you do that to yourself. It's really important that you don't become like obese and, and whatever and big. And if you do that, you do something about it because how many 80 year old, 300 pound people do you know? How many 70 year old, 60 year old, 300 pound people do you know? You know, I, I think about all of the, the heavy people. Like I remember when the, do you guys remember the two fat women? I think that was what it was called. It was like, it was the British mm-hmm. cooking show. You might be a little too young for it. It was like there was these, I think it was called two fat women or something like that. And it was like these two obese British chicks that would put like whole, the whole thing was like, here's a stick of butter in the thing. Here's a thing of lard in the thing. And then one of them just straight up died. This is the second time I'm hearing about this show for the, this is the second time I'm hearing about this show this week after never hearing about it my entire life. And I find that strange. You're telling me this for the first time. (laughs) You're telling me this for the first time. (laughs) <laughs> Hold me closer, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> Eugene, baby. It's so good to hold. Because I was saying to I was saying to my wife, like, we love that clip. And I'm like, wouldn't it be funnier if they could isolate just like, oh, you're telling me this for the first time? But she's like, no, that's what makes it funny. Yeah, it's is the that, song that, in that's the background. just blasting in the background. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. All right. Let's see here. Well, congratulations, Dustin. Thank you. Everyone, everyone take care of yourself out there. Mind, yes. body, and spirit. You know, as best you can. I think just make making positive gains is good. You know, there's a guy named, um, you guys wouldn't know this person at all, but I'm, I'm Barstool Sports. There's this guy named Frank the Tank, and he's huge. He's like morbidly obese. And he's like a famous like Devils fan, Mets fan. He's just kind of like one of their characters over there in their stable. And over the last few months, like one of the guys is ta- over there has taken an interest in him and like Basically, they've just been going on 10,000 step walks around New York City every day. And he's and there's like these pictures of him. Like there's a picture of him at a concession stand at like a devil's game, like from, I don't know, September. And he's just huge. And then there's one of him at one and he just had lost all of this weight. It's like it's never too far away from you to be able to do just from walking. Like yep. Dude, walking is great, especially for people who hate, who hate exercise like me, because it's not. I'm just surprised by I, when I would think about exercising, I'm like, uh, strenuous, which that's good. I should do that still. And I think I'll eventually get to yeah. that point. But walking doesn't feel like exercise. But when I like do it on my Apple watch and I see the calories I lose, which I choose not to eat, by the way. But when I see all the calories, I'm like, wow, I watched two episodes of a show or and I was getting stuff downloaded for work and I burned all these calories and it didn't feel like anything. It's great. Try yeah. walking. That's awesome. That, that was that was that was the big cheat in in New York City. It was just like you could you could walk everywhere. Mm-hmm. So like you were just like like everybody I knew was always walking. They never really took a taxi. They took a train maybe sometimes, but like it was it's such a huge benefit to be able. And it's weird like living here in, in Los Angeles because no one wants to walk anywhere. That's what that's one of the things I noticed. It was like nobody. Oh, it's too far. It's like it's five blocks. Nobody walks in L.A. Like the missing person it's said so, back in the early eighties. It's, it's so weird. It's so it'll be like 11 at night in the middle of the city, like Los Angeles proper. And there'll be nobody on the street, maybe three people. That's what was fun about Santa Monica was it seemed Santa Monica was like a very walk uh, shock. You know how they have that walking score? I don't remember what it was called, but it's like how walkable your area is. It was like shockingly walkable for L.A., which is why we part of why we moved there. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very New York area in that sense, because just walking from like place to place and just key area to key areas like and it's super not so doable. hot either you know it's like not so oppressive in santa monica that you can't 
Yeah, but I think I took that for I think I took that for granted because I gained weight when I moved to Virginia. And I'm like, why am I gaining weight? You know, like it's like, yeah, you just don't walk anywhere anymore. You just have to walk everywhere. So you're totally right. That's a and I we we it's cold now, but we walk around the neighborhood once or twice a day. And you do, you burn like, you know, 150 calories or whatever for if you walk for like, you know, 30 minutes or something pretty briskly, which is, which is great. I do eat my calories though, that I learn that I lose when I, when I get off the bike, like when I lift weights and then I get off like an hour of the elliptical, like really hard. And it's like, you burned 550 calories. I'm like, hell yeah, I did. And then I go <laughs> eat three donuts. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You've earned it. Yeah. That, I'm, I am just in maintenance. Like I'm not trying right. to necessarily do anything. Exactly. It would be nice to lose. I could probably stand to lose 10 pounds, something like that. Yeah. You should give yourself a challenge. Like maybe like one month, you just like, you don't eat the calories that you lose. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not even for like a, not even just, not even for a long period of time, but just like for a little bit, just to see like if the results are worth it to you. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Chime, the award-winning banking app and suite of basic banking features you can learn more about right this instant at chime.com slash sacred. My friends, who doesn't love money? I sure do, and here well into the 21st century as we are, you obviously have a ton of options when it comes to how you store and spend your hard-earned dough. This is where Chime comes in, a banking app with a checking account, a savings account, a debit card, and even a credit card made for people who only need basic banking access, which is most of you listening. After all, why pay for and use services you don't need and don't want that merely complicate the issue, raise rates and fees, and make it a bummer to deal with your own money? I suspect all a vast majority of you are looking for is a way to shop online, use credit, receive your direct deposit, store your cash, and deploy it at will. With 60,000 fee-free ATMs around the U.S., early access to your regular direct deposit from work, overdraft protections up to $200, fee-free transfers, and more, Chime could very well be the solid financial rock you've been seeking. Trustworthy, used by millions, reliable, accessible, and usable. Chime floats to the top in a sea of half-rate competitors that seek to take advantage of you, not serve. Sign up for Chime today. Joining takes just minutes. Get started at Chime.com slash sacred. That's C-H-I-M-E dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D today. Again, for basic banking accounts, a debit card, a credit card, and more, all wrapped up into a highly usable and flexible app, head to Chime.com slash sacred today. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank N.A. or Stride Bank N.A. members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements and overdraft limits apply. Early access to direct deposit funds depends on payer. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, a delightful way to break a notoriously bad habit. Learn more now at tryfume.com slash sacred today. That's F-U-M. And get started on your journey into the world of modern cessation. So sometimes here in reality, we need a little bit of prodding to get back on the right track. This is why I'm so honored to have Fume sponsor Sacred Symbols, since I really believe in their mission. Their approach is frankly revolutionary. For the unaware, Fume is a so-called flavored air device, a completely analog implement that, as the name suggests, emits flavored air for the user. Instead of vapor and so on, Fume allows a user to literally just draw air that tastes and smells great, and its uses, especially with cessation, are obvious. I'm honored that since we started running Fume ads, we've had multiple listeners reach out unprompted to tell us how much they love the product and how amped they were to learn about it. And I'm amped for them, because while I'm not personally trying to stop much of anything, except maybe being so handsome so as to not further intimidate, I know a lot of you out there are fighting what seems like an uphill battle. But the war in front of you is actually totally manageable, if only you employ the tools of modernity. Fume uses replaceable so-called cores, flavored in all sorts of ways, including an orange variety that I'm quite fond of. And since there isn't a single piece of electronics associated with your fume, you cannot charge it or even plug it in. It just works, all natural-like, because that's precisely what it is. Made of sturdy wood and metal, my fume sits here at my desk as I work, and I think it's a truly wonderful idea that can help so many of you out there find a healthier way to live. My friends, start the year off right with the good habit by going to tryfume.com sacred. That's T-R-Y-F-U-M dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D and getting the journey pack today. Fume is giving listeners of the show 10% off when they use the code sacred to help make starting the good habit that much easier. Again, for the completely analog, all natural fume, head to tryfume dot com slash sacred today. Mike has been encouraging me to try to go see a dietitian, and I'm afraid to just because I know what they're going to tell me, like what you're doing is insane. And <laughs> hey, yeah. um, you really should eat throughout the day, but I'm just simply not hungry i'm just not hungry right now i'm just not hungry at all i haven't eaten in you know a long time at this point Mm -hmm. so thank god god if i was hungry and i added like a breakfast and a lunch onto what i was doing i would be rolling around like fucking violet beauregard yeah you know a blueberry around wonka's fucking factory 
And then you got to do the little whistle thing. And then the fucking Oompa Loompas come out and then they turn yeah. you around. They roll you and they bring you to the popping room. You know, it's unbelievable. It's a horrifying. It's a horrifying story. You want to see something interesting? I don't know how the fuck anything could possibly transition into this. There's a pillow. What we just... This is what a is this? Cust- this is a custom made pillow that um, my brother-in-law got made for me. Uh, it's an obscure Willy Wonka reference. That is. <laughs> can you can you read it? it says, yeah, we... <laughs> I am now telling the computer exactly what he can do with a lifetime supply of chocolate. <laughs> and it's it's one of those interstitials, you know, from the movie. Yeah. Because because when I was that's always been a favorite of mine. But when I was oh fell on the ground on the ground. But when I was uh, <laughs> we have this funny memory he and I because he's he's been with my sister since the the you know the mid nineties is uh I was like on the computer in my room in high school, and he just came into my room, and I just looked at him, and I was like, "I'm now telling the computer exactly what it can do with a lifetime supply of chocolate." And he thought it was like the funniest thing in the world, so he gave me this pillow as a little prize. We always reference Willy Wonka in this household. Hence yeah. the Violet Beauregard reference. Okay. Hmm. Very good. Anything else to say here? I don't think so. Who wrote it? What were we even talking about? Oh, King Kulak. Congratulations to you, my friend. Yeah. We're happy oh, yeah. for you. We're happy for all of you guys out there that are taking good, good care of yourself or at least making positive choices, even if it's a losing right. battle. It's very, it's, it's very important. I don't know if I'm happy for you. I'm fine for you, but you know what I mean? I wouldn't say happy necessarily. I'm happy for anyone that's like watching their weight just because it's becoming a big problem. Pardon the pun. You know, like okay. it's it's. Uh, I see it like you just see it all around you. It's just too easy. It's too easy to eat. It's too easy to eat cheap. It's too easy, like cheap, bad for you food. Yeah. That's easily accessible. I mean, that's all fine. It's a cho- that's the thing is it's a choice. But it I don't think when people realize when they put on and I've never done this or whatever, but I remember when I was 200 plus pounds at one point in my life, I was like, holy fuck. Like, and then you have to do the work to get it off you. And the more you do to yourself, the worse it's going to get. And then the, the, the hole is going to become deeper. Yeah. And I just could get concerned for people because we were I was watching. Actually, we Dagan and I did Jaws. Um, from 1975, the Spielberg film and there's this like heavier woman on the beach. And I'm like, and we were saying when we were watching, like that woman must have been like morbidly obese for that era, but she's like nothing today. And it's just, it's not people's fault really. I mean, it is, it's a choice, but it's like all of the things that are available to you are just, it's not the same. And yeah. And so I worry about people getting into these cycles where you fuck with your weight and your bodily health and you're going to not live a full life and a health and a, and a, you know, not only a full life lengthwise, but a full life. You know, I just yeah. feel bad for people that, that get into those positions and those situations. I want people to watch it. And if it ever happens to me, you guys better. I've already told I told you guys I have a fucking blood oath with my wife being like, if I start getting heavier, like you need to tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's important. Like, yeah, like because I don't I don't want to do the scale thing. I'm not doing the calorie counting thing. I can't. I you guys know me. <laughs> like if I open that Pandora's box, it's going to be bad. Yeah. And I know it. Because I, I already did it with the weight, weight thing. I weighed myself all of the time, multiple times a day for years. And I would make choices just based on it in the moment. Oh, I'm 181. Oh, let's go get McDonald's. Oh, I'm 185. Let's go get a salad. That's literally how I live my life. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I would like I would, in Santa Monica. There were the bathroom next to my you might remember, Chris, there was a bathroom next to my the front door. And I used yeah, to just yeah. walk into there on the scale before I'd go out and be like, all right, what am I going to get to eat? Go walk on the scale, look down, be like, OK. And then I would go based on that, <laughs> based on what it said. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I try to like it does concern me. I also try to be aware of the fact that I'm just like I'm pretty lucky. Uh, metabolically speaking, because like I eat pre- like there, there's no reason why I should look the way I do, given. <laughs> the food that I eat on a regular basis, you know, it's just, it's all, it's all the stuff that you shouldn't eat, you know, uh, truly. So like, if I didn't have this metabolism, I know I'd be, I'd be fucked or, and if I, and if I was fucked, I'd have a really hard time cutting all that shit out because to me, I'm like, well, dude, like if I can't enjoy any meal throughout the day, like, do I, like I remember having a conversation. It's like, do I want to live to 106 eating nothing but cabbage and hot water? The answer is no. You know, that's, like my that's forefathers like, in Ireland. Yeah, it's like a wasted. A, that's a wasted life. In my, like, I'd rather totally. live like half the time and like enjoying like not ever at least some meals. Don't definitely, you know? definitely, yeah. And I think that the thing is that once you, so like in my case, my goal is to lose 
get back down to a weight that I feel good with. And then right. the key choice is like, okay, you can have an insane dinner, but don't have McDonald's for lunch in the same day. Avoid that. Or don't yeah, have, yeah, yeah. don't eat at a whole thing of pizza rolls at 1130 at night after having an insane dinner. Cause that's the type of shit that I would do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Oh, so, dude, yeah. so there is a thing. I mean, and Chris, you are a hundred percent very, very blessed to have the metabolism. Yeah. You're it's that, great, dude. That you I, do. Hope it, yeah. I hope it lasts forever for you. you know? But I, I think it's important yeah. for people to realize it's like, just because yeah, it, it's going to, it's, it's hard to lose weight. Anyone who tells you it's not hard is a liar. It is hard. Uh, just from the last month, it's been hard, but it's not impossible. You can do it. And it's not necessarily forever because once you get it down and you get to that maintenance uh, space, it's just about making some lifestyle choices and reining it in. Yeah. You know, truly. and I'm not trying to preach. I'm a month in. So no, no, I'm not totally. like the know it all. But that's the thing that makes me not afraid to do it is that it's not like, oh, I can never eat half of a pizza ever again. You know, right. it's like eventually I will be able to do that and it'll be fine. I just can't I'm gonna rein it in a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Truly. Truly. Yeah. I, I, I yeah, just yesterday, you know, go go through the you know, work out. I did just a half an hour yesterday of uh, that's all I did of um cardio, but it was the what I call the 2020 cardio. It's uh when I put the the elliptical to the maximum incline and the maximum weight resistance of 20 and 20, and then I do it for a half an hour. And by mm -hmm. the end, I'm just fucking dead. Like you're just dead by the end. Uh, high impact training. So one minute normal, one minute hard, one minute normal, one minute backwards, one minute normal, one minute hard, so on and so forth. And then I just ate two huge plates of pasta after that with meatballs and garlic bread or whatever. And then three donuts. Mm. <laughs> I love donuts. And it really is. Yeah. It really is hard just to have one donut. Well, the little one, you know, like they, they if I'm going to a real donut shop, where the donuts are a little more substantial. I could probably get away with one donut, but yeah, the, the little like donuts you get in the store from, I don't know if they're Entenmann's or whatever, but they're too small. I mean, three of them combined is like 700 calories or something. I'm like, whatever, dude. So I had the big right. thing of, I mean, that's a lot, but I had the big thing, the pasta and then I was just, and then you call it a day. I just, I just know that that's limiting the damage I could do to myself. Cause I'm telling you right now, if I ate during the day, I would still eat like that at night anyway. <laughs> Right so, right, right. so I might as well just stop myself. Anyway, King Kula, congratulations. Good, good for all of you out there, including Dustin, that are taking good care of themselves. David Joyner wrote in, said, Guten Tag to the last standing SS soldiers. You can't say that. Also, the SS weren't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get into the weeds, but the SS weren't soldiers. They're not, they weren't the army. You Dude, know? The SS is the new Slitterhead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've just moved on to something else. Like the what was it called? Like the Schuffenschlatzel or some fucking bullshit in Germany. They were like uh, they were like almost a marine detachment. This is yeah. <laughs> this is kind of one of those things where it's like the oh the SSR technically so this is this is like one of those things where it's like well he, technically he's an ephibophile. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where where it's like <laughs> probably shouldn't explain. <laughs> <laughs> the detailed differences with that. Yeah, it, that's you fair. Can't, you can't you can't explain it without coming across. Did I did I tell you du Dustin was on this on this email chain, but Dagan was making early sacred symbol. Dagan's not a history guy. Like he really isn't. So right. he was making the early summon sign logos, and one of them had like two S's in it. And I was like, you can't you can't we can't you and can't. i literally just wiki sent him the wikipedia for the ss and i was like you can't make any logo that looks like two lightning bolts what are you doing you know <laughs> like how can you not how can you what are you trying to do you know that so it's a shame it is a shame how many <laughs> it, it i feel i feel so bad for certain iconography because there's certain iconography that's just like that's just cool and then they it's just completely ruined by dude, these, the, dude, the, the by Nazis were code. the Nazis were killing it in fashion. I mean, everyone it's knows shame. that. Yeah, everyone knows that. It's just like a matter really... of the it's the i it's the ideology. I mean, it was literally Hugo Boss that designed all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so, yeah. not a huge surprise, but I do like how our GIs like comparably they looked like they just were like kind of ragtag. I dug that too. You know, like yeah, loose sure, fitting, yeah. like they had very tight fitting tailored uniforms, and our guys kind of had these. Not one size fits all, but it's like, here's the large, here's the medium. And it's just like, it was a different, it's like a democratic vibe, you know, as yeah. opposed to the fascistic vibe. It's just a shame. Like, I feel bad for like, he, he ruined an entire mustache, you know? Yep. 
Yep, he sure did. It's an entire mustache that people probably had and were like, yeah, I like it. It's Michael Jordan tried to bring it back. We've talked about that on the show. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. There was a Haynes commercial <laughs> where oh, Michael Jordan fuck. had a Hitler mustache straight up. Yeah. And tried to real. just get and just tried to get away with it. Like no one was going to notice that he had a fucking Hitler mustache in the Haynes commercial. I love the idea of anybody at like a, like PAs on that shoot or like the director or like just anybody on that shoot being like, just not saying anything. Just like. Yeah, no one can say anything about. Can't say anything yeah. to Michael, dude. Michael, you know. What were we talking about? Oh, David, we were, you were talking about your right. We we're talking about your right in here. Got We got sidetracked for about 10 or 15 minutes. I wanted to continue the great double space debate with an anecdote from my professional life. I work for a construction contractor and a big part of my job is to write claim letters to legally protect my company on large infrastructure projects. The first claim letter I drafted to be reviewed by my superior, he marked up my draft and double spaced the first word of each sentence. He, being a late 30s, early 40s millennial, responded that all legal letters must be double spaced. I write many legal letters each month doomed into this double spaced pandemonium. Does he have a valid argument regarding the need to double space legal letters or am I a young man becoming a victim to bad millennial habits? Keep it up, gents. That's made up. I don't know how many more times I can speak about this. You don't need to double space yeah. for any reason. OK, your boss is arguably younger than me. People are making this up. I deal with legal and financial documents all the time. If my lawyers double space that shit, I would fire them. Boom, yeah. gone. Dude, I'm, it's lucky I didn't double space my first email to you. I wouldn't be here. I always notice it. I'm I have so a confused. really great eye for like, you You know, when you're just typing and there's and you're reading it over and there's just a random space that there, where there shouldn't be. I can always see it. I'm, like, I'm I don't just, know how people can't see that shit. You know, I, I, I am so confused about this entire premise because my entire life. I've never heard of this until it, it was it was brought up on this show, like the concept of double spacing and that like double spaced when I was going to school meant. Literally, like an entire like double spaced essays were you're right, like you know, your you paragraph have, you have structure, right, right. Yeah, your paragraph structure. And it's just like. So so the idea that this is a commonly like even known thing is kind of blowing my mind, really. Well, it's, that, that, it, it's funny on Wikipedia, there's a double spacing wiki for what you're talking about and then a double spacing wiki for what I'm talking about. And they're both called double spacing. Mine is yeah. called double spacing at the end of a sentence. Yeah. Yeah. I just never heard. I was never told to do that. It's just that's a strange. That's uh, it, it's confusing. And now that I think about it, I've seen it a lot in my life and I just kind of ignored it because I just always assumed it was like a quirk of like websites that I was reading or just like maybe like just some weird stylistic choice on the on the writer's part. But like apparently like. Now that it's. Now that it's apparently this thing that people were taught for a while yeah. in schools and then we're undone, it's kind of kind of I don't know, it kind of blows my mind a little bit. Wikipedia says the desire to correct sentence spacing is often debated, but most sources now state that an additional space is not necessary or desirable. From around 1950, single sentence spacing became standard in books, magazines and newspapers and the majority of style guides that use a Latin derived alphabet as a language base now prescribe or recommend the use of a single space after the concluding punctuation of a sentence. So tell yep. your fucking stupid boss that. <laughs> Sick of this shit, David. Fight back. Show him the Wikipedia page. And tell him you're going to quit if you don't fucking stop doing this. Yeah. I'm out of here. Me you need to tell me you need some space. <laughs> yes, indeed. Finally, let's get into. We'll get into a few news items after this. Eric S. Wrote in. Just wanted to shout this out. Colin. Like you, I am a sweaty boy, to, but to make it worse, I live in Palm Springs, California, where it is hot as hell in the summer. You guys talk about the importance of clean and showers a lot, which I am in total agreement with, but do you take care of your face with high quality products? I am the weird guy that has more skincare products for my face than my wife does. What is your guy's skincare routine for your face? Two face washes, oil, and a liquid? Do you use serums, retinol, and moisturizer? Thank you for all that you guys do and keep those faces hydrated. I don't do fucking shit. I'll be honest with you right now. Oh. I don't know if you can't, you probably can't tell. I'm sure you could. Um, well, Luberderm, you know, on the face, on the body. But that's it. Mike is in there like a fucking chemistry teacher, you know, <laughs> right? He's got all these different yeah. beakers She's and meme. Walter right. White cooking. Yeah, right. For me, I just can't do it. By the way, I just wanted to also say, Eric, because I've been to Palm Springs a couple of times. It is so fucking hot there. 
that yeah. I cannot even believe it that it's people unreal. live there. That that was the only place in my life where I was like, I got fucked up from the heat where I'm like, I got to sit down. I remember it. And yeah. it was very weird where I'm like, holy Christ, dude, it is so oppressive. How does any you got? Yeah, I don't think you should be living there. I think it's going to be pretty bad there in the years to come, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I feel that way about Vegas. Like, I, I don't I, I don't understand Vegas at all. 117 degrees. What? What is Sweet Tooth oh. doing there in the Twisted Metal show without <laughs> air conditioning? Yeah, I mean, peop- I mean, in fairness, people that, that would be a place where people really do need ice cream. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, well said, well said. All right. So any anything we need to know about about skin care routines here? Uh, I don't know. if there's. I use a, like a face a face moisturizer after the show. I use a an Aldi face wash, Aldi brand face wash. It's great. No problems with that. Leaves my face a little dry, though. It's just a little, a little moisturizer. You know, it helps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I have a like an exfoliating face wash that i do and then i and then i i have that th- i have that thing uh, uh, like you ever see those um i think it's like a charcoal oh my god oh, I, those I, are I, awesome I, they're so they're so you fun. put it on your nose and then you pull it off and it's like you're like wow i am a disgusting human yeah being. yeah yeah I, so i decided so i have an exfoliating face wash i have that and then after all that because that that does tend to leave your skin a little dry i have like a just like a specific face moisturizer Colin, have it's you done point. one of those? It's like a no. it's a, a patch you put on your nose and it almost yeah. feels like paper mache. You wet it and then you let it sit for 15 to 20 minutes and it gets super hard. And then when you peel it off, any of the nasty shit in the pores of your nose comes right out. Oh, that sounds satisfying. And then you it's, get it's like yeah. uh, like this like fuzzy uh, nastiness, uh, like the sheet where you can like, wow, look at all this trash. It yeah. was embedded in my skin. It's yeah. like a forest. It's awesome. Yeah, that, that really sounds cool. fun. Yeah. yeah. I recommend it. That sounds satisfying. Yeah, yeah. highly recommended that. Yeah, if, if you haven't. I don't know. Skincare is kind of, I don't know. It's vain, I guess. But uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's important mm-hmm. to do it. At the very least, just for skin health. And also just like, I do, it, like we were talking about earlier, people in the 30s, <laughs> like when they're, when they were like 40, they looked like 80. And that's. I, I just I have a really strong suspicion that that's really not going to be. I feel like we're going to have confusingly decent looking old people by the time that I'm. Yeah, probably. Old. That's probably true. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I I um, I made a discovery. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it was for, it was for my own personal edification, I guess, is that I was long a, a body moisturizer. Like I get out of the shower. I Lubriner, I love the mm. blue, in the blue bottle. I think it's for normal to dry skin is that is the, the formula. And I would put it on my arms, my elbows and just my face or whatever and then so i used to wear chapstick all the time too chapstick brand like the black tube chapstick and then someone told me and i was fascinated by it this was years ago where they're like you just are making your lips need it yes and if you stopped using it you would never need it after you like got through over that hump and the person was totally right and i stopped i used to carry chapstick with me and use it and then i stopped and then a couple of years ago i was like what if i did the same thing with lotion and it turns out that like my body doesn't really demand it anymore now that I don't use it. And I'm wondering. So like I don't when I get out of the shower, I'm just I just don't do anything anymore. Yeah. And right. it's, yeah. Because I, 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 I feel like I might be clogging my pores or doing something like that. I don't really know. I, I feel like there's a lot of mysticism with skincare, like where it, I've known people with horrible skin that do everything right. And then there are people like me that wash their face with fucking dial soap. And well, I, don't, the, I don't get any yeah. blemishes. You know? It's it's more of a long term thing. I think it's it's in the short term. You don't really need any of this stuff like you're fine, really. Uh, your oils are supposed to be there. It's not really that big of a problem. It's more about like as you age and when you get older, like I'm sure you've seen people with like where like they put a lot of um, like they've had a lot of lotion on their or, or they, they take care of their face, but they ignore their necks or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. And then they mm. like and then they're like 70 and then they got this like perfectly like this baby face. <laughs> but then their neck is all fucked, you know, because they've ignored it over time. That's really what it is. Same thing with sunscreen. Sunscreen, like you got to. You got to put that shit on. Yeah, I'm very mindful. Well, I'm not very, but I'm, I'm much more mindful of that after getting skin cancer. <laughs> granted. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that was, that was, yeah. To be fair, granted. Yeah, go ahead. Gra- granted. Uh, it's probably more important in California than it is other places. But, Definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, you uh, you don't want to fuck with that. Well, you 
in San Francisco, a notoriously vitamin D deficient place. People have serious vitamin D deficiencies in San Francisco because the weather's so weird. But I, I, I got diagnosed with the, the, the whatever the survivable form of skin cancer is, obviously. And I had it in multiple places on my face. And they were like, because that's why I have, you can't really see it in the video, but I have scars on, on my nose and on my cheek and stuff like that you can see. And they were like, um, this goes back to the water conversation. Where yeah. they're like, so where did you grow up? Like, it's very, it's it's odd to have someone this as young as you with this problem. You didn't grow up around here, obviously. And they're like, no, I grew up on Long Island. And they're like, oh, okay, so like beach communities that you you wore a lot of like sunscreen and stuff. And I'm like, I don't think anyone ever told me to wear sunscreen in my entire life when I was a kid. Just just throwing that out there. Again, like they're like, so you were outside all day playing. I'm like, yeah, that's. And they're like, well, that's why you have this on your. I'm like, yeah, but no one told me to like do anything about it i wasn't even really susceptible to sunburn like you get that base you know yeah like yeah. i'm very light right now but you'll you can tell just by looking when we're recording in the winter and when we're recording in the summer i become very olive and like italian looking and i think i just didn't <laughs> deal with the, the repercussions of you know sunburn and stuff like that like my other friends did and so i just never it's, it's just another one of those things you just didn't know it's like what were my parents doing it really is what, the, what were they doing i mean to be fair it is Look, man, it's it's crazy that the sun gives you cancer. Like, like that's just it so also gives you wild. vitamin D. So it's like it gives and takes away. You know, right. it'll, it'll make you not depressed and it will also make you dead. Right. That's right. Yeah. It's like drugs. And it too will die. Yeah, it's exactly right. <laughs> Colin, you, you brought up chapstick. I have to bring up. Have you ever tried Burt's Bees chapstick? Yeah, I have. That yeah. shit is like crack for your lips. It's amazing. I also. What is that? Don't use it. It's a it's is a that yellow tube. You know, like yeah, it's a yellow, yellow tube. It's amazing. It, it makes your lips tingle. Uh, I love it. But like you, I don't want to become a chapstick addict. But in the wintertime here in Western PA, sometimes you just you get in from being out for a little bit and you're like, boy, my lips are completely destroyed right now. So mm. I always keep it on hand. Mm. But I recommend the Burt's Bees. Yeah. You need it. I don't. Yeah, I, I only have chapstick when I'm sick or something like what like when my lips are like prone to getting chapped you know like if, if i have like a cold or like a flu or something then i'll carry it. but I, I, outside of that i never i never use chapstick really a negative 10 wind chill changes that that um. is true yeah that's <laughs> to, to be fair that is that, yeah. that does make a lot of yeah and when it's cold for sure right. like in the winter <laughs> that does make sense but i also have this habit though like where like i kind of i don't know if this is gonna make sense to people but like I'm sure people have habits where like they, they might like bite their calluses or like they, they might bite their fingernails or something as like just like oh, as yeah, a, the cannibal as a habit. debate. Yeah, you brought up. Yeah, I I kind of bite my lips in that way. Mm. You know, so like if I have dry skin on my lips, it's usually just kind of gone. I bite your lips in a sexy way. No, not a sexy way at all. It's, no. it's more more of a more of a like a like an ape picking flies off another ape kind of maintenance way. Sure. Right. You know. It's like when Treble and Rush, my, my Boston Terriers, they lick each other's ears because they like, the, oh. I guess, the earwax. But then they lick each other's mouths when they're done, too, so they can get some of the earwax. You know? Beautiful. I don't know what they're fucking touched in the head, dude. Those two. Yeah. I don't know what, like, on any day, I don't know what's going on with them. Like one brain cell between the two of them. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right. Let's get into... uh some smaller news items. I do have something I want to say. Bigger news item to begin, though. Just to throw this out there. I didn't even put it in the document. A reliable source that is uh, giving me other things that have come true in the past reached out to me recently and told me just a few details that he's encountered about an upcoming project that I thought I'd share. Nothing crazy, but fi so Fire Sprite, right? <laughs> This is an, a team founded a, a little more than 10 years ago that Sony purchased in 2021, as we know. And they are most noted for that game, The Persistence. That was kind of a second party game and it was a VR game. And then they did Horizon Call of the Mountain. They are working on a game called, according to my source, Project Heartbreak. And details about this game are limited. However, um, I can say a few things about it as far as personnel is concerned. Uh, I just want to make sure I have the right document here. Yeah. So I can say that the animation director is a guy named Mondo Ghulam. He's been with Fire Sprite for a little while, but he was actually a longtime animation director at none other than Rockstar. 
and he'll be working oh. on this game. And I can also say that the game is being written, at least in part, by a guy named Pierre Charette. And Pierre Charette was a longtime director of writing at Telltale, the original Telltale, and wrote The Walking Dead, or helped write The Walking Dead, The Wolf Among Us, Tales of the Border, from the Borderlands, the Batman Telltale series, and so on and so forth. Um, I've examined some documents from the game, and I don't want to speak too, too specifically um, because a lot of it's pretty nebulous, but it appears that the game is has at least a female protagonist. Contemporary times takes place perhaps on an island. Um, I know I'm being kind of vague, but these are just the kind of the things I saw from this person, and I don't want to say too much because then it'll be obvious maybe what I'm seeing. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's it. Unsolicited in my inbox from a very reliable source, Fire Sprite's new game is being worked on as Project Heartbreak. Um, and it's important to note that this is not, you know, there's this rumors of the rumors that they're making a Twisted Metal game. I don't know anything about that other than the, the other rumors, but this comes from a reliable source. So Project Heartbreak in development over at Fire Sprite starring a female protagonist, contemporary times. Um, and also the the producer of the game is a guy named Matthew O'Sullivan, who has been with Fire Sprite since around the time of purchase. So interesting stuff here. Colin, can I there. ask, yeah, sure. maybe you want to reveal, maybe, you know, maybe you don't, but is this a VR game since they came off call of the mountain? I asked specifically and to, to my person what it was and it's unclear. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. So yeah, fire Sprite project heartbreak. Um, not, you know, n- nothing too crazy about it, but I just wanted to get out there again. Mondo Gulam is the uh, animation director. Matthew O'Sullivan producing Pierre Charette writing. Mm. And that's that. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about some of the things here in this document, though. Did you guys see this tweet? It has nothing to do with PlayStation, but I thought it was so funny that I need to put this in there. You might as well actually, Dustin, maybe you can put this on the screen for people if you can, if you don't mind. Yeah. Maybe that'll make yeah. it, they'll make editing a little more complicated, but that's okay. Um, this comes from a game. I don't a, a mobile game. Love Live School Idol Festival 2 Miracle Live. 25,000 followers. So it's some sort of mobile game. They tweeted this thing out. This made me actually laugh out loud, like literally gutturally laugh out loud. And I had to share it with the audience. So it says global launch notice. This is all one tweet. Global launch notice. We are excited to break the news to you that the global version of Love Live School Idol Festival 2 Miracle Live is launching soon in February 2024. However, we also want to inform you that the global version will close its doors on May 31st, 2024 and cease in-app purchases accordingly. We appreciate the love and support you've shown and are committed to making these last few months an unforgettable moment. That's the funniest shit. I've, I've never seen anything like that before in my entire life. That's hysterical. They announced the game is launching and then, clo- and then they announced the date that the game is going to close all in the same tweet. It's almost like they had this linear. It didn't happen like this, I'm sure, but almost had this like linear like this is how we're going to support it we see the writing on the wall so these are the tweets that need to go out and then they just like all right we'll put them all at once you know <laughs> I, I, when you when you put this in the document i i looked at it and i i, I think i stared at it for like 10 straight minutes and i still couldn't quite understand what i was looking at and, it's then, so I, funny. and then i went to and then i went to bed this is the last thing i saw before i closed my eyes <laughs> it's so funny i don't know it has nothing to do with our show but i just thought it was people it's needed to see it i've never seen a tweet like that before in games yeah That's no i've I'd, I'd be like hey we're, we're hey we're excited bye yeah we're, <laughs> our game launches on this date and this is the day it will no longer work okay very good it is, it is it is pretty crazy the announcement of a global version implies to me a uh you know that maybe this is already out in japan and they were making this uh, i'm not sure i and I wonder, is is this a paid or free to play? Because if it's free to play, then it's even more hilarious. But maybe they just expect people will buy it. And then it's like, oh, well, we're not going to you won't be able to buy the in-app purchases after it's this game, though. I mean, a little intriguing to me. You know, it's got some. Uh, dancing anime girls, maybe. I don't know. They look they look. um They're a little young. Doesn't they look a little young. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. I'm showing concern at the same time okay fair enough <laughs> uh all right real playstation news 
MLB The Show 24. It's time to go. The game comes March 20. I'm sorry. What is it? March 19th. Is that right? It's March 21st. Early. That's right. Pre-order. Yeah, it'll launch March. I'm sorry. I, I, my notes are all oh, fucked yeah, up here. Yeah, 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 we yeah. are excited to announce that the MLB The Show 24 will launch on March 19th, 2024 for PS5 and PS4. It'll obviously be available on Switch and Xbox as well. It will be on Game Pass as usual or on Xbox if you are interested. However, the cover athlete is Vladimir Guerrero, Vlad Guerrero Jr. of the Blue Jays. I find it so disturbing that he exists because I grew up watching his dad play. Vladimir Guerrero mm. was an amazing hitter. He played for the Expos for many years, and I think he finished his career with the Angels. So it's weird. It's like, oh, here's my fucking 24-year-old son on the cover of uh, MLB The Show. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So that's happening. Exciting times a huge game for PlayStation every year and it being multi-platform is just helping it really solidify itself as a one, you know, probably behind, you know, the EA gauntlet and maybe NBA 2K as the, as the go, go to sports game in the, in the West. So good for them. All right. This came out right after we recorded last week. So this is old news, but I want to get it on the record. Nonetheless, horizon forbidden West complete edition from Nixus, Sony owned Nixus comes to PC. March 21st, and you can pre-order over there now on Steam if you'd like. It's also on Epic Game Store if you play over there. Is anyone going to check this Check this out on PC? It's probably going to be pretty beautiful, but I don't need to play it over there. Any, any interest? From, no, not, not, neither from you guys? No interest for me other than just reading the blog post. I like that these PC ports, I know the first one had a few issues at launch, but seeing the feature set, it has all these different upscaling far as dlss and amd fsr tons of different uh ratio support if you have like an ultra wide monitor stuff like that so seeing them if they're going to do a pc port do a good one hopefully we'll see <laughs> the jury's still out on any pc port ever but the yeah. feature set sounds like it's going to be there bungie i want to get over to this for you dustin oh, i'm sorry chris although dustin i want to hear from you too if you'd like Omnitron wrote into us on Patreon. Remember, you can write us on, write into us on Patreon. It's part of your set of perks for supporting us over on patreon.com slash last media. I put up a thread every week in the news feed. You respond to it with your inquiries. I pick through it. A lot of you are writing in now, so it's 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 getting harder and harder to get on the show, I think. So I appreciate you guys. A lot of good inquiries, though. I'm doing the best I can to I kind of have this mental list of who I've used, but I don't know how accurate it is because I'm kind of shot, you know, so mm -hmm. who knows? Omnitron, though, all in caps, he wrote. His name, not what he says. Hello, Sacred Crew. This week, Destiny 2 director Joe Blackburn announced he will be leaving Bungie following the release of Final Shape. Is he reading the tea leaves and deciding to jump the ship before it goes under? This comes from um, a tweet or a series of tweets from Joe Blackburn's official Twitter account where he announced that they're going to do their end to end play test for the Final Shape as they get ready to release it, I think, in June. And then at the end of that thread, he says he's going to be leaving and going to be leaving the game in. Um, in Tyson Green's hands, and I'll be interested to know more about him. So, Chris, I want to know what you have to say about this, just because I I was under the assumption that Sony locked the talent down. Yeah. And so either this person is not vesting, choosing not to vest, or he's being removed, or he's just leaving. Like I don't know, like what I don't know why you would leave. In other words, he has to stay to get his money. So I don't I don't get this. This is weird to me. It doesn't yeah. feel. I mean, I, I don't want to say it, it, I don't. It's all conjecture, but it doesn't feel voluntary, frankly. Um, because I don't yeah. know why you would leave when you're about to make millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very confusing. I, I don't know exactly, exactly how I feel about it. I, I do think, so here, here's what I think about it. I think, I think Joe Blackburn did a lot of good. I think he was, he was a lead on uh witch queen, which is, I think easily like by a long shot, the best destiny expansion that destiny's ever had. I know that's like kind of, that's somewhat of a controversial statement because, oh, well, it's not, you know, Taken King is kind of that thing for a lot of people. But like, I, I don't know, I, in my opinion, just completely or Forsaken is another one. But I, Witch Queen was just so good. Uh, but he's also, you know, he was in charge of or really high up on Beyond Light and um, this last one, Lightfall, which were not not wonderful. So it's it's a mixed bag there for sure, whether or not he's leaving for a reason that he has not disclosed. That's kind of a big thing too. Like it could be that he got a crazy offer 
to go somewhere else. I don't know. I have no idea how any, <laughs> I, d- I doubt he would say that unless it was for sure. Um, or maybe it's just not necessarily any of our business. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how these people feel about unveiling that information necessarily on Twitter, especially when they're in the middle of promoting, you know, what they're doing for their game. They want to be like, Hey, I'm going to Ubisoft. You know what I mean? Uh, but leaving, <sighs> leaving it in the hands of Tyson green, I think is actually not as dire as I thought. Tyson Green's been at Bungie for a very, very long time. I recognize that name. I recognize that face. I've seen that guy in a lot of uh, Vidocs for a very, 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 very long time. I think he's been with Bungie since since Combat Evolved, at least, which is... Um, I'll look him up on Moby Games. Yeah, I, I'm fairly certain 2000... Like, there's a, there's a Vidoc... There's Vidoc footage of him, <clears throat> like, in 2001. He was... So, uh, um, yeah. Myth 2... Yeah, so that's even early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was so his he's, first he's credit. Been, so he's been there for a while. Um, Tyson's a really interesting guy. I think, I don't know, man. It, it's it's confusing with, with Destiny right now because there's so many things going against it. Obviously, their historic miss in revenue that, that you know, led to all those layoffs. The, the thing that we know now about the power struggle between Sony and uh, the Bungie's, Bungie's board of directors. Um, you know, life falls just kind of really, really paltry critical reception. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm concerned about it, but also I'm concerned about the game and I'm concerned about Bungie. I'm concerned about Destiny, but at the same time, there's probably not a better option. There's not a better person to leave it with than Tyson Green, I think. Well, he's got a, I mean, I'm reading his credit. It seems like he has a design background. He was a designer on yeah. Myth 2, a designer on Halo, designer, Halo 2, designer, multiplayer design lead, Halo 3, design lead, Destiny. Yeah. Game design lead, Destiny 2. Yeah, yeah. So he's, so, he's been know. there for a while. He's experienced it. That's, that's a good, that's not a bad trade. It's just, why is he leaving? Is really the is really the concern because it's it's fine if he if Tyson Green stays to you know do stuff for the future and that's you know he might be very loyal to the company he's been there for a very very long time and obviously there's obviously the um the money aspect too where like well dude you want to get vested so I guess my main question for this is like what pulled him away and is it voluntary is it not is did he get a better offer to go somewhere else that was a little bit more stable is he is he just kind of does he just want to exit games entirely like i have no idea yeah it's interesting I, I i hate you're right chris that i, I hate skept, i hate being skept, not skeptical i hate i hate you know gossiping as it were over a person's personal decisions which is not my intent right. but when you're the game director of a big game like this and then you leave it's just strange because like what kind yeah, of no. offer could he have gotten that would exactly. have that would have paid him what he was what he's going to make I mean, I'm not, I'm not, we don't know the specific numbers, but people have to, out there have to understand if Sony's saying that they allotted more than a billion dollars to keep people at Bungie, then people right. at the director level mm-hmm. are going to, I mean, you could imagine that being like $10 yeah, million dollars or something insane. Like, I mean, you're talking about to like, in, and now people have to understand, I mean, maybe not that much money, but people have to understand that vesting. And that's what we were talking about. When a company buys another company and then gives you money, it happens over time. And that's to keep you. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so three years, five years, seven years, like whatever the term is. And that's why people always just conspicuously leave at the end of these, at the end of what you can assume are these terms. I just, I saw that and I was like, that's just so strange. It is weird. I, yeah. Like I just, uh, it's, it's not, it's yeah. not so weird that, that a director would leave. Um, cause live service is different than like a, a, a standalone kind of game. I, I do think there's like a certain amount of directing that needs to be done, but at a certain point you're just kind of, you're kind of just making sure all the content is working and, and is complete and flows well together. It's not really, it's not really that weird for a, for a game director for a live service game to maybe leave or like hand it off to somebody else as they're, tra- as they're getting ready to transition to whatever the next phase is going to be. Cause it's just very different from traditional games development. It's not the, it's not the same as like seeing a game through to the finish because that's the finish. And then, and then you move on. But I don't know. My, the main takeaway is, it's concerning that he's leaving. Bungie's in a really precarious position as it is, which doesn't really help. Um, I don't think Destiny is in a good spot at the moment. Um, I don't think Bungie's in a good spot in the moment. So Certainly him leaving not. despite him leaving despite having that obvious vested interest in staying does say a lot. Yeah. We don't know the reasons. 
Um, by the way, by the way, the literal use of the term vested interest, which, which, you know, yeah. it became, it became a like nomenclature, but is actually yeah, yeah, the yeah. exact term for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain. I, yeah, I used it right. right? No, you, I'm saying I'm, um, I'm saying you did use it right. I'm saying you're using it perfectly. Like that's the actual right, yeah. use of it. Which is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a vested interest in staying. And, and so to me, it's like this is all this is all very negative. But in the silver lining of the storm is I really I, I, I do think in some ways um, the person they're leaving it with, because I saw a lot of con- concerns about like, oh, my God, he's leaving. And then now it's in the hands of somebody who doesn't know it or, or or wouldn't do a good job i don't think that's the case i think tyson green is very very capable i think that's the best hands that you could possibly leave the game in at this moment um but it's still a very very bleak picture for bungie overall that's my takeaway anything you want to add dustin to this sorry i was muted um nothing but speculation which i think chris already kind of you guys both covered but it's a really yeah just a strange situation when you've got that much money potentially on the line but again we might not know what the details are specifically but i had a question uh for chris just overall about destiny because i'm curious the final shape is the last announced thing for the game do you see there being a future i mean there will be some kind of future for for destiny after this but to my understanding this was kind of the end of the road here Right. Yeah, this is supposed to be like the last major expansion in the way that they've been doing them is what is what mm. I've heard. So basically, this marks the final uh, chapter in the in in the type of storytelling that they've been doing. Apparently, like after this, they're going to be going in instead of seasons, they're going to be going in episodes, which is kind of something that is happening over on the Halo side too. like they announced that they're not doing seasons anymore. They're just doing content updates, which is fascinating but that usually kind of indicates the the trailing off of like okay well we're, we're we're starting to wind things down over here there there is there's still going to be a narrative future and there's still going to be like expansion like things i think but this is the last major expansion that they've announced for sure so i don't know what that i don't know what that entails i haven't played destiny in a while quite frankly like there's a lot there's a lot to play there's a lot to get through even just in the live service space halo's kind of doing a really good job right now actually uh, so I'm, I've been a lot more interested in that, but um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's it's a it's very confusing. Hopefully they can stick the landing, but like even if they do, like I just I I don't know, don't know. And Destiny, if I recall, remember it was pitched as a ten year project, right? Yeah. So are we we're getting to that ten year point, right? Because Destiny One was twenty fourteen, twenty fourteen, yeah. So. That makes sense that it's kind of yeah. uh, slowing down. One thing I did uh, forget to mention is that it, it could also be, you know, th- there it, it, there is the vested interest, but there is also the fact that despite that vested interest, there were many layoffs of really high profile people anyway. So it could be just like, hey, listen, I'm going to see this through, but like this, the future here is fucking mega uncertain. <laughs> I just want to, I just, I don't want to like hang on for dear life or something that I might not even really see the returns on. So like maybe he's moved that that's, that's a possibility. I don't know. I'm not saying that that's, that is true, but yeah, I I definitely would feel a certain way if I was like a key talent at Bungie. And then I saw Michael Salvatore go, you know, like that, that would definitely be like, uh, uh, I'm probably going to start maybe looking for something a little bit more stable, but again, outside of games, even probably like I, I could imagine that based on all these layoffs that have happened and, and all the layoffs that will continue to happen. Oh my God. It's going to be doggy um, dog, dude. That like, I can imagine that a lot of people are being like, well, fuck this. I'm going to go into software. <laughs> I'm just going to go into general software and just not have to worry about all these insane, this insane turnover. I think that I think Sony got a lemon. I mean, I've said it before. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know what the fuck they they spent so much money on this thing, and especially for them, yeah. the biggest purchase yeah. by far they've yeah. ever made, right? As an entity and in video games, and for what? Like I don't even like even from a PlayStation perspective, it's like so this guy's leaving. Like we yeah. bought this place for the expertise. Now, an important caveat that I don't think we brought up is that it is known internally, apparently, according to reporting, 
that there's going to be layoffs after this thing comes out again. That, right, like, they're right. going to be showing a lot of people the door and he might just know that and want to get out of there before he has to be the one doing that or he's shown the door himself. I just feel like there's too much pointing to this being like, yeah, I'm just leaving. It's like, nah, maybe, but it feels yeah. like you have been there a long time. And and again, this is all speculation. I can imagine him watching. He's not going to see this, but I can imagine him watching this. Being like, this guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Oh, yeah. But it just feels like there's it's just strange specifically just from the vesting that's that I'm fo- I'm fixated on that because that's real mo- that's general like not it's a lot of money that the it's not it, you're not getting I mean fifty thousand a hundred thousand four hundred thousand dollars whatever those are huge sums but these guys at the director level are not getting that and so because you can imagine a guy being like oh I can stay invest for a hundred thousand dollars I can just go take this job at this other steady or studio get a twenty five thousand dollar raise and just kind of wash out and or you know all equals out who cares you know but not you're never I don't know that. So I saw that and I was like, this is so weird. <laughs> and that they're announcing it early because I assume they're afraid it's going to leak. Since a lot of things out there do leak. So who the fuck knows, dude? Uh, I just. Yeah. Marathon can turn out to be really great, and I hope it is. Um, it doesn't seem like it's a game for me, but I, I think Bungie has a great opportunity to, to strike with that. But I just don't have any idea what Sony was thinking with this purchase at this point. And. In the, it, it's going to become more and more of a Sony entity, which defeats the purpose. And I, so I just, it wasn't purchased as a, an internal first party studio. People need to remember that it was, it was purchased for its, it's not even, it wasn't even purchased for its IP because it doesn't really own IP that has a long term tail. Destiny is, seems like it's dying in some sense. And so they bought it for the fucking people. <laughs> yeah. And now they're leaving. It's like, after, oh, after very the- good. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. It's crazy. And that's his right. I mean, I'm not saying like he's a fucking, he's indentured to, to Bungie. I'm just saying like, why didn't they know? You should, don't you? Sh- it goes into Jaffe's, J- Jaffe's theory that Jim Ryan could have been removed for a series of bad decisions, like financial decisions. And this could be one of them. And they, they would know better than anyone internally. Like, holy shit, what, the, what did you get us involved in with this? We can't even really sell it at this point because it's injured. So people would know that they were getting one over on us. Like, we're not going to give you shit for this. You know, we'll, we'll take it for half a billion or something and let you eat, you know, an 80% loss or a 70% loss. I just think it's, uh, it's very strange. Okay. Yeah. Well, shout out. We'll see the final shape in June. All right. This has been making the rounds. This is, we, we have to put our PlayStation history caps on here for this one. Real Radic wrote in and said, hey, CDC. Colin, as a trophy expert, can you explain what is going on with this hardware rivals light situation? People have started to notice that this very obscure PS4 first party game, Hardware Rivals, has its own separate PS5 trophy list with two additional DLC lists and different trophy requirements. There's actually footage on Twitter of someone earning these trophies while showing that the game has a different UI than the PS4 version, along with proper PS5 button prompts. Is this actually getting a remaster? I find it odd that Sony would revive Hardware Rivals at all, considering they just shut down the servers for it on PS4 in December of 2021. Some argue that it could have been used for testing trophies on PS5, but why would they change the UI of the game at all if they wanted to do as test trophies? With hardware rivals, Destruction All-Stars, and the rumored PS5 Twisted Metal game, it feels like Sony keeps desperately trying to make car combat a thing again. Thanks, and take care, boys. Well, thank you for writing in. And this is indeed very strange. So the story goes a little bit like this. Gamatsu, so the website gamatsu.com, which we use all the time on this show, discovered... That on Exophase, so Exophase is this website, I don't know if you guys use it, where it, it tracks, it is a universal trophy system, but a universal trophy and achievement and tracking system. So it has this, this feed of like, oh, Steam, Steam uploaded this, PSN uploaded this, Xbox uploaded this, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like this linear list and then you can separate it. So it's like PSN profiles, but for everything. And Hardware Rivals Lite, when they scraped the PSN, came up. And no one knows what the hell this is. Now, there are two weird things about this, but we need to go back to the very beginning. Hardware Rivals is actually the second hardware game. There is an obscure PlayStation 2 first party game released in 2003 called Hardware Online Arena. And this was a game London Studio made and released right around the time that they like a little bit after the getaway came out. And it was one of the games that used the PS2's online functionality with the external modem. And it was never released anywhere, but in the European market. 
And they followed it up in 2016 with a similarly vehicular combat game called Hardware Rivals that was released on PS4 and, like you said, shut down in 2021. The strange thing about this is that the you so <laughs> this is what this is like where it gets like weird. The footage of the person on Twitter playing hardware rivals light on PS5 with the new UI and trophies is in a video from before the PS5 came out. So something weird's going on with this. Now, it could be very well and in there. I don't know if people remember. I'd have to go and look at specifically what they are, but there are dud, there are a series, small series of dud trophy lists for games that never came out that were used to test things. Like when the PS4 was coming out on on different tracking sites, a fake shooter trophy list came out that was like for and everyone's like, what the hell is this? And it was for apparently for testing trophies. This could have the same functionality, but what it appears is that this thing has just been bouncing around internally for years and they might actually release it. I don't know where it fits, but I think we have to think about it through this lens specifically is that as Americans on this podcast and with a largely American audience, we have no memory of this game because it never came here. So it very well may be that this game has more relevance for some people in like Europe or in just obscure markets that Sony wants to tap into and they're just going to re-release it again. But I I don't think you rename a game, give it new trophies, give it DLC trophies and all that if you're not going to release it. I just think it's weird that this thing has apparently been bouncing around for at least three and a half years. And so we yeah. have no idea what's going to what's going to happen. So that's the story of um of Hardware Rivals. My <laughs> friends. And Hardware Rivals Light. Have you ever heard of that well, game before? Either of you? No. No, when I read this, I thought I thought it was one of those like Mandela things where I'm like, what the fuck is this? This is fake. This is not, this is not real. This is fa- even, even the image of the game, like in these tweets, right? Where like it's, it's that car or whatever. Just even that like looks like not real to me. Like it just it, it's something about it looks like I'm looking at like, I don't know if it's AI or what, but like the, the tweet that you linked is just like, that's not a, that's not real. It doesn't look it looks like a game you'd see in like a TV show. You know what I mean? And so I'm like, did something fucking happen? But like, yeah, no, I, I've I've never heard of this in my entire life. I've never heard anybody mention this. I've never seen gameplay footage of this even in, in and I've watched so much. Dude, I've watched so much content about obscure games. Like there's like there's like Darby the Dragon and shit that I'm aware of. You know what I mean? So, so like, I don't know what the fuck. I don't know how this could have possibly escaped my purview. My assumption about the original hardware game, and I think this is probably right, although you guys can tell me if these instincts are are accurate, is it was a European game with in an era where you could tether to the PSN with or what would become the PSN with a dial up modem. And it would have required servers around the world, right, to support Right. The game, and so I think they just didn't bother releasing it anywhere but in Europe. And I, so yeah. I think it, it, it there, it, it's funny, man. There are just games like that. We usually look at, I mean, there's some bajillion Japanese only games, but occasionally a game only comes out in Europe or only comes out in the U.S. that you kind of don't even realize didn't come out anywhere else. And I think this was one of the last vestiges of that kind of as the online. You know, by the time we got the PS3, PSP first, really, but PS3 after that, and it became a PSN became a global entity Then I think that. That, you know, then we, there were other games like the so the later SoCal games and stuff that didn't suffer from that. Well, go ahead, Dustin. Well, Colin, just I want to make sure that I'm not confused. So hardware rivals, though, the PS4 one that had that wasn't Europe only. No, that was everywhere. OK, yeah, because I was I. When I see this gameplay, it makes me think that I played it. I checked my trophies, though. I have no record of playing it. So maybe this is just a fever dream. But OK, so it was just the PS2 one that was Europe only. But this sounds like a testing thing to me. And that maybe even someone was because there was the there was the point about it having PlayStation 5 UI on it. And, you know, there is different instances where developers, when they're first getting hands on with the hardware they're like oh let's just port this over and see how it goes and figure out see what we learn so i don't know though that is 
really strange. This game, yeah. I'm kind of like Chris, where I I feel like I kind of remember it, but I I really don't know. There were a series of first of all, London Studio was churning games out at that in that era. I mean, it got crazy by the PS3 era that they made so many weird games. I reviewed some of them at IGN, like TV Superstars, which comes up every once in a while. It's just like so strange, but they were. I think they were pretty desperately trying to get things out to compete with Xbox because Xbox from a services standpoint was so superior to PlayStation 2 with just native online Ethernet only gameplay by 2002 when Xbox Live launched. I think they were somewhat scared. I think a lot of things came from that era and they never really figured it out. I mean, I, Killzone is probably the closest they ever got. Killzone 2 specifically is probably the closest they ever got to getting like a real game moving online that people actually liked until maybe factions and some of the uncharted stuff. But anyway, yeah, I like a little piece of PlayStation history. And so there, there you go for hardware, hardware rivals, hardware rivals light. I would assume that's going to be a thing. Why they're doing this with the rumors of with the destruction, all stars lucid kind of going away out of the PlayStation second party family. And then this twisted metal game reportedly coming. I really don't know. Okay. Real radic. Thank you for writing in guys. I wanted to know what you thought of this. We all remember never soft. The one time Activision studio founded in the mid 90s that was responsible for the seminal Tony Hawk games and then later a lot of Guitar Hero stuff. They were shut down in 2014 after doing support work on a number of Call of Duty games. This was kind of the beginning of that. Everyone's going to do Call of Duty generation or era with Raven and others. Someone put this on Twitter, just said, fuck it, NX one. And it's a video. And this show is apparently an unreleased Call of Duty game. It's two minutes and 20 seconds long because obviously that's Twitter's video format um, limit for unverified accounts. And it shows Neversoft's unreleased futuristic PS3 era shooter Call of Duty game. And apparently it was being made in the Tony Hawk engine. Um, and, uh, and then they moved over. So what do we think about this? Anything to say? Just a little piece of lost gaming archaeology. It was I love seeing vertical slices like this because they put a lot of work into it like they were going to do this. And um, and it was and never came to be. Of course, we ended up getting what do we get later, like advanced warfare and stuff like that. That kind of yeah. did the same stuff. But any any thoughts? Did you see this? There's a follow up reply tweet. I, mean, I, th- I would imagine this guy's on Moby Games. Brian Bright who this tweet has 2.7k it says this was nx1 after infinite warfare imploded and split into re or iw so infinity war infinity war yeah uh, imploded and split into respawn never soft pivoted from guitar hero to make futuristic cod game this mission was on the moon some experience with low g and was really about the team learning the engine we were making guitar hero games on our tony hawk pro skater engine prior he uh brian bright has an extensive moby games and is producer of a number of games yeah leading up to let me see here he yeah he produced a bunch of like tony hawk stuff and like matt hoffman's pro bmx and all of that but he more recently fell into design call of duty warzone call of duty modern warfare and so on and so forth some sound design he's got a lot of credits yeah so i'm just just as a verification of it's not just some guy (laughs) responding to this tweet it's someone who actually has some info which is cool any thoughts chris before we move on yeah it looks sick (laughs) this is cool i like it r.i.p uh, neversoft dude yeah man i loved neversoft for for so long that was like that one that was i think they were the first game studio that i was really like cognizantly aware of being a studio that made things I don't know why, but like that, that had the, that strikes me. Like, I remember seeing that logo with the eyeball getting stabbed and being like, these guys, and I, I just remember th- thinking, like, these guys must be sick. <laughs> these guys must be cool. And then everything they made was awesome. Yeah, they are. It was a shame. It's Loved too it. bad. It's too bad they didn't live long enough for Xbox to shut them down. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> guys, bad news about a wonderful game. In 2012, the German developer Jaeger collaborated with Take-Two on a long development game called Spec Ops The Line, one of the worst named games of all time. Underneath that game was a third person shooter that was amongst the most revolutionary ever released, in my opinion, with one of the greatest stories in games and this really grounded element to it that has people coming back to it 
for many years. And as I told people when I was with Harper writing a book with Harper Collins, which I ended up not doing, I wrote my sample chapter on Spec Ops the Line. And it was all about video game storytelling. And I interviewed Walt Williams, who was the writer. He's a protege of Ken Levine's. And so this is a wonderful game. Everyone should play it. It's on PS3. It's on 360. It's on PC. Or it was. Because we've discovered here through Stephen Totillo, the journalist, says new spec ops to be delisted entirely from online gaming stores. A take two representative tells me, quote, spec ops, the line will no longer be available on online storefronts as several partnerships licensed related to the games are expiring. Players who have purchased the game can still download and play the game uninterrupted. 2K would like to thank our community of players who have supported the game. And we look forward to bringing you more offerings from our label throughout this year and beyond. End quote. So this game has been removed. Unfortunately, the licenses almost certainly have to do with music. And now, well, let's go to a letter from the audience and I'll let I'll let Otrant wrote and say it. He says, without warning, Spec Ops The Line was removed from Steam. It was only after news sites began writing their articles that 2K even bothered to clarify that, yes, Spec Ops The Line is being removed from all digital storefronts due to expired licenses. Spec Ops is one of those games I've been interested in for years, but never got around to buying it. And now it seems I never will. Putting aside the persistent issues of licenses not being done in perpetuity, why wouldn't 2K give people like me some kind of advanced warning to get our panic purchases in before it was too late? I'm so bummed. I am confused by that, too. Developers yeah. and publishers often do that when they know licenses are expiring. My assumption on this is that they and this is kind of crazy, but think about it. The game came out in 2012. So and it came out in the summer of 2012. So we're in this weird limbo where 11 and a half years later. Your license runs out. I don't think so. What I think is that the license ran out a while ago. Someone figured it out, brought it to someone's attention. You're like, oh, shit. And we are actually aren't under terms and we don't have the license for this like or we, and we might not have had it for a long time and they took it down because i i know I, I sound conspiratorial all the time but it's like oh yeah our 11 and a half year um license is done now so yeah. uh, and we're gonna just take it down out of nowhere it's like no obviously something someone didn't cross the t's and dot the i's also from the game was long in development so the licenses might have been from a really a different era before they anticipated certain things and there's so many things that could have gone wrong but part of me out rants but i want to be like dude you had 11 and a half years to buy the game that part of me wants to say that like literally you should have played it so long ago but at the same time yeah why not give you warning so that's why i think that there was no warning to give now i've said before and i know this from my reporting that take two looked at this game as kind of disappointing in the beginning but then had this really long tail of low burn sales like where games fall off a cliff they don't yeah. sell shit after a while and spec ops the line would always sell a little bit because people always talked about how good it was. And my theory on this is that they'll re-release it. And this yeah. game is ripe for a remaster. Right? Like, and really, if you want to get crazy with it, you could remake it. But I don't even want that. You know, like, this is a game that deserves all the bells and whistles. The 60 frames, the 4K, the, the, the beautiful textures, the redone sound. It deserves all the attention. It is such a wonderful an important game and it is a bummer that it is no longer with us so what do you guys think of this chris yeah i think it, i mean it, obviously i think it sucks i think you're probably onto something though with with uh about the license probably expiring a while I, I just don't see why they wouldn't let everybody know because this is, this is a game that's had such a glowing reputation for so long even if it didn't like spike immediately i remember i remember actually playing the um <laughs> i remember playing the the there was a multiplayer beta for it right i remember that that i that i played and i remember because i was like super interested in it and then i played it and i was like mm, <laughs> i don't know if I, I don't know if I, I really care about this and then the story apparently like the story was fucking crazy it was like it was actually somewhat similar to doom 2016 actually now i think about it because doom 2016 had a similar thing where everybody played the multiplayer and they were like right. this is gonna suck and then That's it came right. out and, and then it came out and it was fucking great but yeah, I, I don't know, man. It's it's it sucks. I do think you're probably right about that because there would be no reason not to capitalize on how glowing this game's reputation has gotten over the over the last however many years, the, the last eleven and a half years. If they said, "Hey, this is going to be your your last chance to get Spec Ops: The Line," I'm sure they would have sold a fuck ton of it, even if it would even if it would be at like five dollars or whatever price point that, that game would be at right now on digital storefronts or whatever. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a bummer. Uh, hopefully they do. See that this is like a really important game. Like, I, I feel like this is a historical game, quite frankly, like I, I think it's like it's, I think it's one of those that really kind of deserves to be um, brought forward in a way that 
I'm kind of shocked that it hasn't yet. Me too. Um, so yeah, hopefully they see that. Hopefully they see the the fervor about this. And you know, my my the thing about it though is like, wouldn't they have renewed that license if they? Eh, maybe I don't know. Maybe no. Not. I mean, it, it's not up to them necessarily. The price could be too That's, high, or the license just can simply they can just be like, there is no license to renew. You know, like we, it just the timing just indicates to me like someone got in touch with them and like you guys are not. You guys are in trouble if you don't get this game down yeah, for some yeah. obscure reason. That's my theory. Uh, Dustin, yeah, you have yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah. So I just looked at a curiosity on eBay, the sold listings for the game. I just went with Xbox 360 because I assume in that era, that's where it sold the most. Yesterday, you could buy this game for approximately 18 to $20 for a used copy. Go ahead and get it, dude. That's worth it. It's worth that. No, way no, more than not that. anymore. Oh, not anymore, dude. OK, recent sold copies. $70, 70, 80, 75, 100 for a premium edition, uh, $80 for a premium edition. So get going. Yeah. So the, the write-in asks about, you know, is this, uh, you know, the, the digital versus physical debate that rages on the real war console wars. Fuck it. Physical versus digital. This is where I'm coming. I'm like, yeah, this is why I think options for both. I'm always an an advocate for both because until they re-release it, if you want to play this now, maybe you're listening to sacred symbols and you weren't into video games when this came out. Maybe you did. I've never heard of this game, but now you heard Colin and Chris glow about this being one of the most important games. How do you, how do you play it? You don't, yeah. or and you just, or you just hope that they re-release it. At least there is an option if you want to spend eighty dollars to play it on Xbox three hundred and sixty. You can go do that. Mm. But if we're if we're long gaming in the future where there's potentially digital only, then that doesn't exist. I just I just, I just think these music licenses are so silly. Right. I don't fucking understand the logic behind it even remotely. Why is it that Why is it that Fortunate Son can be in a movie from the fucking seventies? forever and it's not a problem because i think it's a perpetual license i mean i I think it's just that simple like no one made perpetual licenses for this stuff back then and and that's the hope that now that those games do have perpetual licenses right but 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 you have to but chris i i do that not to defend them because it is fucking annoying but think about it right like there's no reason to make a perpetual license for a, a physical product that will be manufactured and then never printed again because they were just were i don't think it's crazy to think but they were just like the digital version is just not relevant, right? Like right. it's a, it's going to be uh, at that era. It's like a steam version that they didn't give a shit about. They wanted to sell. I guess. I, I just guess, think no one thought about it. Like, it's just crazy, but, but it's true. I think it's that simple. You know, but wouldn't that also just apply to VHSs and movies and, and other things like that at the same time? Like nobody thought that you'd be able to stream, you know, fucking, uh, uh, oh my God, what's the movie with fortune son in it? Like apocalypse now right like nobody thought that nothing no, no one thought it's like oh we're gonna have to create a perpetual license in case this goes into some cloud version like we're gonna be we're gonna be printing this on dvds we're gonna be you know putting this on vhs or whatever you know what i i just i guess i just don't understand what the difference would be well i think if i'm understanding it properly it's that when those ga- when those films went to streaming there were deals made and that a lot of things fell through or got through intact because the deals were made for thousands of entities at one time right so Hmm. so i think that that's it's literally how that happened as opposed to the games where there's these more favorite word bespoke contracts signed in just a different era because like they would argue it's like well dvds like we printed you know 500,000 dvds and we never printed them again and those are the ones that were sold and the license covers that and perpetuity it covers nothing else you know um i just find it i find it strange too but i think we're going to run into these problems fewer and fewer times and i I also think that i would love to know more about what happened it's just the timing is just weird so it there's something definitely went went on but to your point dustin i mean if you're interested in this game i if i were a betting man i would say that this game's coming back out in some form in some time in the future like are are they really not going to spell sell spec ops the line they just got to go in and make some edits but they really should have long taken the opportunity to have this thing really recrafted in some special way and as i said in my sample chapter that no one outside harper collins ever saw but the spec ops name was just horrible like people have to understand spec ops was a series of games the line was the last one and it was different than all the other ones spec ops was this weird 
I don't know, fucking strange game. They were not third person shooters like we came to understand them per se. Like the cover based shooting and all of that comes later from like the more tactical roots of the series. So calling it Spec Ops The Line was a major disservice to the game. It's important. Yeah. It's important to note that. And that's what it, I, and I said at the time and uh, at the time, Walt agreed with me. And Walt Williams, by the way, is writing Wolverine for people that don't know. Uh, but he's written a bunch of stuff since then. He worked on Bioshock and all the, on all the other things. But I was like, you should have just called it the line. And he's like, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he works on uh damn. He, damn. That's that's a crazy credit. Bioshock and Spec Ops. Yeah, he was the yeah. um he was a producer on Bioshock and he worked. He was like a close like he was a he was like uh, Ken Levine talked a little bit about this with him. I think with me, like he was like kind of Ken Levine's I don't want to say bag man, but like he was at his beck and call. Like you're going to do right. these screenshots. You're going to do this. You're going to do these audio logs and all this stuff and made him like a co- total perfectionist, like nut job, you know, just like Ken is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. That's, Ken that's so while. that's just such a wild double whammy of credits to have. That's 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 a really enviable uh, two credits to have. But yeah, no, I, I, I remember at the time being like, what does this have to do with spec ops? Right. Because spec not, ops had like even, that, that, that vibe. It was a tactical game. Yeah. yeah, but like even playing it, I was just like, I, I, I don't I don't know much about Spec Ops, but I, I was familiar with it because I think a, I think a friend of mine who lived in my building had one of those games and I would go down uh, down to their apartment on the on the mezzanine level and play it with play with them. It's like I didn't really understand it much, but like I remember playing Spec Ops the line and being like, this has this doesn't this doesn't need to be Spec Ops at all. It's a little bit like Prey, really, when you think about it. Uh, the the prey 2017 where it's like what does this have to this isn't prey at all it's great but this has nothing to do with prey right and that probably didn't help it <laughs> no i don't think it did either and spe- yeah it's important to know like a lot of the spec op games i'm looking now like they're bad they're not good yeah 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 they're like not, one of them the spec ops <laughs> stealth patrol got a two on it at a 10 on the egm you know yeah three out of ten at not, ign it's like okay guys they're not wonderful that's for certain. All right. Spec Ops, we'll see you soon. I believe we'll see you again. Spec we Ops better. Online. It's a crime. Sorry, they would be crazy not to take advantage of the, the, the special nature of that game and how everyone knows it. Well, I mean, to be fair, this is the same. <laughs> we still haven't gotten GTA 4. So, and that's a way bigger, confusing, confusingly absent game. Yeah, same publisher. So. so. Yeah. All right. This is just one of those stories, those weird stories I just wanted to talk about. So do you guys know anything about this Bloodborne cart game? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in 2022, there was a developer, Lilith Walther, who made this Bloodborne cart PS1 kind of gag game. And she's been working on it ever since. And then as the game got closer to release, Sony apparently contacted her and and basically i don't know if they threatened her or whatever asked her to just kind of rebrand it and kind of get rid of some things that indicate that it's a bloodborne game now i just wanted to, wanted to say this i think it's cool that people do whatever they want but why do people do this stuff did she really think that this game was going to be allowed to come out and like just be available and use i'm not i'm not trying to be like protect the company i just don't know what you think they're going to do yeah, it's the, it's the same. Remember when we talked about this with Metro again recently, the Metroid 2 remake where the person worked on it for years and then they were going to release it. And Nintendo's like, you can't do that. And it's like, dude, what did you think you were just going to release a Metroid game? Well, I, what? It's just so strange. Yeah. I'm confused by people's deep think, work done into things that they don't own. It's just strange. Like, make your own thing. I, if I, 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 Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if I, I can't I can only speculate. I, I don't know what this person is necessarily thinking, but. I can imagine being in the headspace of like, let's make this thing that is based on this thing. And it's and it's really fucking cool. And let's make it so good that maybe we can like pitch it in some way. You know what I mean? Like, because at that point, like so much work is already done. Like, why not? I granted Bloodborne is like people would be really fucking furious if the, the only thing they got out of Bloodborne after after 10 years was <laughs> a PS1 style Bloodborne cart racer. But I don't know. 
that that's the only rationale that I could even remotely imagine working or that I could only even ima- that I could imagine being convinced that could potentially because otherwise it's just fan art. You know what I mean? Um, which is fine. But like it's it's another thing if you intend to sell it. It seems like a waste of time to me or even just really. I don't know if she was w- w- going to sell it. I think even just releasing it for free. It's just. I don't know. I, I just feel like you're wait. You have obviously deep talent. You're Wait, pl- but, playing around with something you you can't do anything with. Well, the, the, I mean that's that's a lot of practice, then, isn't it? Right, working on something like that. I mean, definitely. I, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not diminishing it as a personal project. I just don't know what people. I, what I'm saying is just the back end. Like, what do you expect is going to happen is when it, you do this? Yeah. Is it illegal to release it for free? Yeah, I think so. Because you're still using the the IP. Otherwise, you could just release free whatever you wanted. Yeah. You know? I, can I release I free guess. episodes of Seinfeld or free? Oh, yeah, that's a bad example. Can I can I release free bootleg episodes of South Park? Yeah, why not? I because well, I think that that's a, an infringement on their on their copyright. Is it? Is it? If if they're not making money on it and they're just doing it for no reason, just to just to have. I, I, I that, think this I is know, the that, same thing that makes it technically illegal for people to sell pictures of Batman, even though they don't get in trouble for it. Like that's not legal. You know, it's not legal I, for you to paint. I don't think it's legal for you to yes. like paint Batman with Batman iconography, go to Comic-Con and sell it. Like, I don't think that that's straight up legal. I, you have to license it, but they just don't right. go after people for that stuff. So there's like this very weird delineation, I think. Go ahead. Right. I, and I, yeah. I think yeah. it's important to note that the game is still coming out, uh, but it's going through a rebranding. And I think that's what it comes down to is that Sony looks at this and they probably could shut it down completely and say, you can't release this. You're using our characters that we own you're using the name but it sounds like sony's saying hey you can't even if it's free you can't release something with bloodborne in the name because that's can it could confuse people right yeah. in the market is this an official bloodborne product it has bloodborne in the name so the fact that they're not shutting it down completely and saying no you can't release this is i think good uh because it is a fun fan yeah. project and i again i like you Colin, i don't want to defend the corporation but i understand them saying like we got a protect- picture of that guy the fat guy with the knife you know yeah that? exactly that's us awesome. yeah <laughs> I, I can understand <laughs> you know they don't they don't want to confuse people thinking bloodborne yeah. card is a real product but they're okay with it existing so like nintendo when they released that metroid game which he was smart that he didn't I think that it just came out like maybe there was people that knew that it was in development, but then it was released and then quickly taken down. This developer could have been more secretive and then just released Bloodborne cart and then Sony would have come in after and maybe totally shut it down. But so I I understand what they're doing. Uh, Yeah, they'll probably just name it like, uh, I don't know, Blood Moon cart or something something bloodborne related so they don't have to use the name directly yeah i i I don't know i I understand like i get you have to protect your copyright and you have to protect your ip but i don't know to to me it's like if you put something out there for free i just don't i just don't really see how that's really doing anything it's kind of like somebody who dresses it it's like dressing as spider-man for halloween to me it's like is that is that fan art it's like is it a pro- is it a problem to w- I, I I don't know it, it just doesn't it doesn't register to me like if I were at the head of a company in charge of like an IP like I, I just don't think this would even really I, I I fail to see why I would why I would even care really outside of the outside of the yeah obviously don't call it Bloodborne Cart and don't put it on the PSN and don't charge for it because you can't make money on a th- something that we own but for free it's like i don't know to me it's like those it's like a cover of a song to me where it's like whatever but i that's true but i also think it's illegal to cover songs <laughs> like no, te- <laughs> technically like no it, it, i think it is right no it's it's not technically I'm illegal there are you, you no, can't no, yeah I, you i'm saying like if I, if like yeah i'm sorry go ahead chris i, I didn't mean to interrupt you no, no, no. So what I mean is like if, if you want to put it out on Spotify or something like there's a revenue share system, basically, that you would you would basically agree to share revenue with the the But you don't have to get their permission at all to do it. You know, like you could just do it. And then like if, if the if the system recognizes you, it'll automatically like just link it to the, like, OK, so there's a cover of this. And then there will be like a revenue share inherently built into it. 
or you could just do it for free and it's not a problem. Right, right. That's right. what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's like people play sh- like I've been to concerts or like uh, small shows where bands will cover a song live and it's very clearly a cover. It's not their song. It's very clearly like Journey or something. And it's not a problem. Like Journey's not going to come after them for that. Well, no, no. I, I mean? I, yeah. No, well, that's the point I was making. And I wanted to be clear about it. I'm being technical. Like right, when, right, when right, my right. band, when I was a kid, played Pearl Jam songs, I didn't expect Pearl Jam was going to bang our door down. But if we tried to, if two things, if we became a big band and played Pearl Jam, a Pearl Jam song live, or if we recorded a Pearl Jam cover, I think both of those things would have to be cleared by them. Technically speaking, uh, like I don't think because like, like, yeah. uh, I think you get Ramon would know way, way more about this than I do, but I, I'm pretty sure a lot of like churn comes from the performance of songs like bands don't even perform certain songs live because of permissions and all sorts of weird back end shit having to do with it. And I know that when you do covers on albums, you obviously have to have the clearance of like think about Weird Al, you know, um, or something like that. I just well, well, Weird Al specifically, like it's parody, he asked for, well, yeah, that's parody. So that's protected. You don't have to you don't. he doesn't he asked for he famously asked for permission because he's just a nice guy, but he didn't have to. You don't need permission to do parody at all. Hmm. Like even even slightly. And that's like kind of like one step removed from cover. So it's like kind of I don't know, it's interesting. I, I just I guess what I'm saying is like I wish there was a system that was a little bit more like music where like if you did make something like Bloodborne Cart, you could just kind of enter an agreement where it's like, hey, I'm gonna I wanna put this out. Um can we work out a system where like I I don't know, you get like fifty percent of this. Cause that's kind of how it works. That's how it works with music. If I if I put out a cover of a song on Spotify or something, I'll have to upload it to Dist- DistroKid and it will basically link up to the original artist and then we'll split the revenue from that. Because I'm doing the work in in making this this version of this song, but it's your material. So like there's like a split there. And I wish I guess what I'm saying is like I wish there was like that kind of a there was some kind of precedent for that system to exist. So that way we could get these fan projects that are really cool, but also at the same time don't really compete with the core of what the actual IP is doing. Um, I know that's not the system that we have, but it would be, it would be, it would be cool. If we right. could have that. There would need to be some kind of like permission granted, I think, especially in a revenue sharing. Cause imagine if someone made like, Oh, we're making a blood and Bo- bloodborne fan game. Uh, we want to make 50% rip off of it. Uh, but all the characters are nude and have erections. Sony yeah, might be right. like, yo, uh, right, right, right. you would still have want- to, yeah, you would, they would still have to, uh, <laughs> approve it I, I guess i just wish that, that that door was open in the first place and granted this is more to do with stuff like this like bloodborne car not about you know metroid 2 remake you know that's that's just right that's just straight up <laughs> that's that doesn't make sense to me at all because that's something that they a would conceivably do and b that's even more of the original work not even done by the person making you know what i mean it's like that you're just basically rehashing an entire game and putting a new coat of paint on it, which is work for sure. But like, it's, it's not 50% work. Bloodborne cart, I think kind of is in this area where like Sony would never do this. It's done in a style that Sony would never do either. Like there's no way like Sony would willingly release like a PS one style game that looked that terrible intentionally with a game that's so serious and so beloved that has nothing to do with the original IP at all outside of just the name and characters and locales. And that has been like redesigned from the ground up as a kart racer. You know what I mean? That, that just strikes me inherently as like so much more original and so much more interesting and something that quite frankly, if I was Sony, I'd be like, this is kind of cool. Maybe put this on PS fucking plus premium since you've got no other goddamn, <laughs> there's no other uh, uh, amazing PS1 games that you're putting out. So like, I don't know. I just look at it as kind of like a wasted opportunity on, on a lot of fronts. Um, yeah. yeah. Jim Ryan would see it and say, who would want to play this? Yeah, who the fuck would want to play this bullshit? I fucking hate this. That's how Jim Ryan speaks. Yeah. <laughs> speaks like a New York mobster. <laughs> what the fuck is this bullshit? Um, all right. Two more pieces of news. This So there's been a lot of layoffs. I'm not going to go into all of them. It's sad. You, there's, a, there's a layoff tracker, as I told everyone, that you can go just if you Google games layoff tracker, it'll have all of the layoffs, 2022, 2023, 2024, all categorized, linked out to stories and all the rest. And you can see all the sad news as you want. But I thought this one was... An interesting one and as Embracer Group continues to collapse, just like your boy Colin said they would. Idos Montreal, the next target. So as we know, Idos Montreal founded in 2007 with the intent of kind of reviving Deus Ex, and they did. Um, they released Deus Ex 
Cuban Revolution on PS3 in 2011. And then they released that that game Thief, as you guys might remember, the kind of reboot of Thief in 2014. That was on PS3 and PS4. And then they did a couple more DSX, uh, Deus Ex games. They did Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which was actually pretty good. And then they they worked um, alongside Crystal Dynamics on Avengers before releasing Guardians of the Galaxy, which was ended up being their last game. They were making a new Deus Ex game and rumors were going around that they were laying people off. And thus they are. They released a statement on Twitter and it says the following quote. For the last 17 years, our teams at IDOS have worked on some of the most beloved brands in the industry, combining deep storytelling and innovative into, and, and, and innovation into unique games. We have created memorable multi-award awarded experiences that we are proud of. I'm sorry, I can't read. And we know our team members have put their heart and soul into all of them. The global economic context, the challenges of our industry, and the comprehensive restructuring announced by Embracer have finally impacted our studio. The difficult decision has been made to let 97 people go from development teams, administration, and support services. We are working to support all impacted personnel through this transition. These very talented, highly experienced people are entering the employment marketplace, and we want to find their next projects, blah, blah, blah. So no word on Deus Ex, but the, the word, I think Jason Trier was the first to report that they were making a Deus Ex game, and yeah. that that will be no more. Embracer group, I mean, first of all, Square Enix is probably like, you know, yeah. we got, we got, I can't believe we got anything for these guys. And I remember we said like, I think they sold everything for like $300 million or something. It's like, it was like not very much. And then now you look at it, it's like, yeah, these studios are fucked. And Embracer mm-hmm. Group, Embracer Group's a fucking clown show. And yeah. I, 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 so I buy some of their games. I mean, not really. I mean, I've, I've played a few of their games, I guess. I guess the most recent one would be like Dead Island 2. That's Embracer, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because they own Deep Silver. And this this is a, along with what happened at Activision already with Microsoft and kind of the culling of projects over there, it's like, this is what you asked for. Everyone loves this consolidation. This is fun. It's so fun. And now these companies can't afford to pay any of their bills. And remember, we said this at the time, and I thought this was pretty astute at the time, but it certainly came to pan out. That the problem with Embracer is that they are a double A brand and then they started fucking around with triple A games and they don't know how to do it. And it's very expensive. It's prohibitively expensive for many entities to do it. And when you're gobbling companies up like Crystal, no wonder Crystal Dynamics is working for Xbox and all these other things. What do you think they're going to they need to make money? You know, like it, it. they just were buying these things sight unseen, like no doubt about it. Gearbox, the same thing. There's already rumors that they want to spin Gearbox back out, which they probably should. And, and we'll see what happens to them. But it, this is just the beginning of this, man. It sucks. I'm going to have Jonathan Blow on the show soon to talk about the economic context, as it were, as said here in the yeah. IDOS Montreal tweet. And we'll get more into that. But yeah, RIP and peace to those that have um, been impacted. Yeah, it's all it's all really fucked up. I mean, I've also heard whispers that uh, I mean, I know a lot of QA departments are kind of starting to go away. Or that's like kind of like a lot of a, a big rumor um, that AI is it like they want a lot of publishers want <laughs> want QA to be done by AI. So uh, oh. there goes your entryway into the industry. Yep. For people, by the way. So that's cool. Very sick. Very awesome times we're heading in in on every front. Very sick. Very yeah, cool. It, yeah, it's, it's great, man. It's good shit. Uh, yeah, AI is the best. So yeah, so yeah, it's very awesome. Yeah, I. It's funny because QA probably could and uh, all the stuff could and would be most effectively done by by computers. But we have to ask ourselves what the human toll on that is. And at the very least, you would imagine that they would want to outsource this stuff to overseas first before the AI. I'm sure that's the interstitial spot. But these guys, these guys are just going to continue to oh, wring yeah. money out of everyone and and act with reckless abandon. And I'll just say again that though I think studios and projects sometimes implode because of the lack of talent and execution, these these various layoffs are are not the fault of the workers. And I don't want to ever blame layoffs on the fault of the workers per se, but I'm just saying this is all just bad prognostication and overextension. And then people pay the price. And yeah. it sucks. And Embracer had no business buying those studios. And if Crystal Dynamics wasn't in hawk already to other studios working on games for them, they would have the same cuts. So, and maybe they still will as well. So Embracer's fucked. Yeah. yeah but, they're gone. but that's been obvious for a while. Finally, I wanted to get into Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League drama. So as mm-hmm. people might know, if you pre-ordered the game and uh, it was basically pre-ordering the game special edition, I think gave uh, some sort of extended price that gives you early access to play it 72 hours early beginning um, 
I guess in late January, because by the time this publishes, the game will be out for everyone. So it doesn't really matter anymore. But the point is, is that when Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League entered its early access period, there was a critical bug that beat the game for people in terms of didn't show you the game being beaten, but it assumed you had beaten the game and fucked everything up. So they unplugged the game and fixed it. The downtime lasted only about half a day, but it kind of sucks when you consider the fact that people pre-ordered it for the early access. You're on the clock. You can't get that early access back. You can't obviously just push the date out or something like that. So to make it right, Rocksteady gave people $20 in $20 worth of in-game currency. That's equivalent to 2000 Luther coins in the game. A lot of people have a lot to say about this game. We got a lot of people writing in about it. James Walker wrote in and said, Greetings, Sacred Crew. I am writing today to ask your opinions on the Suicide Squad kill the Justice League controversy. I think we can all agree that the fact that they kill... Oh, so he's talking... I'm sorry, I have these these letters out of order. Before we even get into all of that, and we will get into that, what do we think about the game's launch? Did anyone play it? I don't think I see it here in, the, in our what we're playing, so none of us have any personal experience with it. I think it looks fucking kind of lame to me personally but i'm glad if people are enjoying it any thoughts here on the the, the game breaking like that it, it's <laughs> it's pretty crazy <laughs> it is wild it is crazy to me that like it, it, it was the first thing i said too it was like wow you 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 charge early access for this and then they can't use the early access because your, your game bugged out i i burst out laughing when i found out that that was true lost it Dustin, you, what, what were you going to say? Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt you too. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's kind of, it's somewhat not surprising. And I just, I would imagine that if you're launching a live service game and you have early access, think of how many early access or not early access, how many live service games come out and immediately day one, there's always some kind of issue for at least a, a period of time. Mm-hmm. And so... Now you're taking the risk. It's like not okay. You're selling someone a game that they might not be able to play on day one because there's something always fucked up with a live service game. Now you're going to charge them extra to be there for when it's going to fuck up. So it's good at least that they were able to fix it relatively quickly and they were able to give people some Lex Luthor bucks or whatever (laughs) to get some in-game items. But it is a it's not a great start for the rest of this drama we're going to talk about now getting back to james's story now that we have everyone on the record he says greeting sacred crew i'm writing today to ask your opinions on the suicide squad kill the justice league controversy now i'm going to spoil the game i guess but the spoiler is in the title of the game so i don't know how seriously i take that but i just wanted to point that out i think we can all agree says that the fact that they kill the justice league is a given and anyone talking about disrespecting a certain character has lost their minds however I think there is a lot to be said about the broken launch, the withholding of the review codes, the game launching at the end game for certain players, and the fact that it's only nine to ten hours long, according to Destin Legary. That's the biggest shock to me when I read that. I was like, what? I don't wish to be hyperbolic, but this may be one of the more spectacular failures of a story studio. Bioware and Anthem, Mass Effect Andromeda is the only one I can think of that comes close or surpasses this blunder. What do you think of all? Uh, what do you all think of this situation? Is there any redeeming game? Is Rocksteady redeemable or will WB shut them down before they have the chance? As always, Thank you for the amazing content. First of all, I think it remains to be seen how it all pans out. Seems like some people like it and we have to just pay attention to sales and trajectory, like the velocity of the game, I think is really important. We just don't have all the information yet. I did want Mm -hmm. to speak though, James, and I'm curious what you guys think of this to the, to the idea of them shutting press out. Um, Press has to walk this fine line of we're not, we don't, we're not owed anything, but And to me, I feel like this was a really vivid example of how desperate remaining mainstream media outlets are to getting access, which is the only thing that differentiates them from the people that do actually good work in this industry and that their input would have had no bearing on anything except for maybe finding out that the game was broken in the beginning, certainly. But I just there is this level of like, what about me? And I'm owed this and all this, even though if you kind of put this little thing in there saying, oh, I'm not necessarily owed this, you kind of are still speaking from that. And I know because I was in that situation in the past as press where you're like, why don't I have access to this? This is annoying. I can't do my job. But from the outside, it becomes pretty clear that you just played along with everyone else and that you're not that important. And Mm -hmm. your opinion is not that important. And you don't have a greater say than the people that are playing it right now. 
And I kind of liked seeing that pan out. I don't know exactly. Again, I'm no fan of WB. I really could give a shit less about that company, but you there they let they invite people in to play the game people are hard on the game which is their right to do and then you think you're just going to get access to it it's very similar to the hogwarts legacy thing which was also the same publisher where i think they just didn't give codes to some companies because it's like well we what do we have to protect the brand we're not really in this for any other reason the truth will come out as it were anyway so i just i don't know it was interesting to see that all play out i don't care about them holding things from the the press I, i care more about the broken launch and the fact that they made a game that's eight, nine or 10 hours long. I, I just don't even know what is the point or how that's possible and what they've been doing this whole time. Mm. This is what they've been making. It's just so it's so strange. Any thoughts on that, Dustin? Well, I think the 10 to 10 hours, the nine to 10 hours thing, I think of a game like Destiny, which the main campaign for Destiny one and two was also maybe nine to 10 hours. And if they're viewing this as a live service game, then that's kind of the introduction to the content if this truly is a live service game then they have tons of other stuff in the back end i would think that is going to be doled out to continue its live service efforts so nine to ten hours that doesn't really bother me uh for again if this is the type of game that they're that they're making as far as the press thing i think i agree with you mostly colin i do have to say, though, that I think that companies do get sneaky with it. And we see examples where we see press shut out uh, because they have something to hide. I think very vividly of when I got burned many years ago when Assassin's Creed Unity came out, because I remember I was excited because I was going to do a target had buy two get one free. I chose to get that as one of the games on launch. And I got home and I remember seeing the review scores that didn't come out until noon that day at noon on launch day. So the game was out, but they embargoed it. Now, this is a little different than shutting press out. But and I think that they necessarily can't play that game anymore because some press are like, no, we're not going to. Yeah, IGN refuses to abide by any coverage that would have the embargo after it's available. Right. So. There is an element to me where I see this and I'm like, well, WB knows this game isn't going to score well and that's going to affect their sales because they don't they would rather people somewhat blindly buy into it without that influence. And I think that sucks, too. So that being said, I don't think that undercuts what you're saying either. I think those both can can coexist. We just, you know, be a keep a, a critical eye on on both sides, because I think there is an element where. We'll see because the reviews aren't out until I would assume Friday. I mean, the early access is out, but I don't know when you're going to need to play the game like holistically in order to score it. I mean, that's this would have been a pain in the ass to review in in the pre in the pre-release environment anyway, because you would have had to have at least in my experience, like you would have had to have fucking play dates basically with like the servers. Like this is when the servers are going to be live. Here's who you're going to meet to play from other outlets and all the rest. It was always a pain in the ass. When I did Killzone Shadowfall, I had to go to fucking we played it in a like a tethered conference room at, at Sony's headquarters with like TVs and stuff. It was so annoying. I hated that shit. So, yeah. but I want to get into this. Well, let me, let me put a finer point on what I was saying before we get into this next inquiry and we'll throw it over to Chris, which is I'm not saying what PR at WB, because I want to, I want to be clear about this. I'm not saying what they're doing is right or wrong. They're being manipulative. That's what right. PR is. And right, right. the outlets you only see this on the outside when you can, when you realize you can operate normally without access, which when I realized that I was so relieved because I was like, Jesus Christ, it's, it is stressful. The embargoes and the correspondence and who likes you and who doesn't and who's going to give you this. And because as I've said before, in being a developer and a publisher of games, I damn well know that there is no limit on the codes you get. There is a literally a limit, but you can't possibly have given them all out. You just get thousands of codes when, when you release a game. It's just, it's just nonsense. So it's just a fucking political game. But my point to put a finer point on it is outlets choose to play this game until it burns them and then they complain about it, but they have no problem when it benefits them. When the access is good, they don't bitch. When the access is bad, they bitch, but the ge- it's all a game because they're only getting the access because they're going to say something good or the assumption is they're going to say something good that that people don't read more into this as saying like, well, you kind of want your cake and you want to eat it too, don't you? It's like this doesn't isn't really the way it works. You mm. you are being manipulated at all times. 
you just don't want to admit it when you're being manipulated in the way that benefits you. That's all. That, that's, that was my point. But Kai wrote in, said, hey, boys, now I'm going to spoil The Last of Us Part 2 in this. So I want to give everyone a warning of that. I'm going to spoil The Last of Us Part 2. So re- fast forward. People are furious at the way the Suicide Squad are brutally dispatching the DC heroes in the game called Kill the Justice League. This game looks really unappealing to me, but this seems like the last thing it needs to be criticized for. It reminds me of the same childlike reaction to Joel's death in The Last of Us Part Two. Unfortunately, I think it's just emblematic of the general immaturity and lack of media literacy that is so prevalent in online conversations. I don't know. I just think gamers need to grow up a little. If you want people to take the medium seriously, maybe it's time to stop whining about there being adult themes in the game. Am I being too harsh? We'd love to know what you think of this discourse. I speak as an outsider to comic books, generally speaking. My assumption, my operating assumption about this game was that the Justice League was going to be killed in the game. (laughs) Now, I don't know if that was necessarily always going to be fulfilled or not, but I assumed that people understood themselves that they were going to play as the bad guy. And I love the way you put it, Kai, because the reaction to Joel's death in The Last of Us Part Two was childlike. That is the perfect way to put it. Yeah. Oh, my God. One of the protagonists is dead. It's like, well, this is a real adult grounded video game, just like when at the end of Game of Thrones season one, you know what happens and and no one could believe it. If you didn't read the books, it's like, what? That's fucking insane. Like, what? Right. Like, it, it didn't even make fundamental sense until you just give them time. To get through the story <laughs> and people really do have a childlike response to oh they didn't win oh he didn't get away it's like sometimes life really is like live leak my friends and uh joel's death is a really a great example of that and the way people responded to that was embarrassing in my opinion so now i speak as an insider to that because i love the last of us but with dc i don't know i just chris were people really operating on the fact that batman wasn't going to get killed in this game because i just assumed that we knew this yeah I, I think a lot of people's criticism hinges on well you know rocksteady have made the choice to connect this to the arkham universe so this is so this is the batman that we play as in arkham you know asylum city and night and so to see him dispatched in this way is uh underwhelming and 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 disappointing and and i've seen people say like it's disrespectful it's like that's that's fucking stupid but i do i do agree that it's a little bit anticlimactic and kind of lame like i i do kind of i don't know i i understand what the criticism is but at the same time i think people are being massive babies about it i do think there was really i do think rocksteady probably could have dodged a major bullet just by making this its own separate game without any connection to the arkham universe because you wouldn't have this weird tether tying you down to previous story decisions and you could have had a, a new world to flesh out all your own and you wouldn't have had these criticism levied at you at, or at least not as as validly but I, I i don't know man i i saw people i saw so many people being like this is so disrespectful to kevin conroy and, and like uh, he this is his last performance or whatever and it's like you what how little respect do you have to have for kevin conroy to assume that he would just agree to do this if he didn't understand what they were doing or didn't approve of what they were doing in some way like he's like famously like very specific about the batman roles he takes and he chose to do this one so like there there are people wearing i I don't like the people who are wearing kevin conroy's like who are puppeteering his body around being like oh i'm fighting for i'm oh man i'm fighting for the respect of this guy he agreed to do this also presumably he didn't know that it was going to be the last or one of the last roles he did right yeah oh yeah also nobody also turns out it, it isn't because he apparently he recorded uh, something for a, a Batman the Animated Series that thing that's apparently going to be released later. So it's not right. even his last role. They didn't know that he was going to die. It's not Rocksteady's fault. And then some people was like, well, well, they had uh, they had time to they had time from Kevin Conroy's death to to the release of the game to to change it. And it's like that that's also really fucking lame. Suicide Squad, the Justice League lives. Yeah, Suicide Squad. The Justice Suicide Killed Suicide Squad kills the Justice League, but uh, not Batman. Or, or, or Batman's gonna be treated like really, really nicely because we like Kevin Conroy. It reminds me of like, it reminds me of that Fast Fast and the Furious movie where where Paul Walker died and they had that fucking 
<laughs> they had that scene where he like drives away. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, and it's like, this is so, this is so clear. This is so, I, I, I'm very aware that I'm watching a, a ploy right now. Um, and so like, I don't know. I think it's lame to change your story or the, or to change your vision just because the untimely passing of an act. I think that's really fucking lame and really babyish and really childish. I don't, I don't really get it. There are so many criticisms that, that you can levy at the game that are so valid. The, the overstuffed UI, the noisy uh, design, the, the, in my opinion, kind of somewhat noticeable graphical downgrade from Suicide Squad to the Justice League to even Arkham Knight many, many years ago. Um, you know, the fact that it's written kind of underwhelmingly. Like it's it's just not very well written, quite frankly. Like I've watched a lot of the the cutscenes because I just had to know what the fuck. And also, again, this is one of those games where it's kind of hard to spoil because it's inherently spoiled. Um, so I just kind of wanted to know how they handled it, and I agree. Like it's not really handled amazingly. Like I think there are certain deaths that are really underwhelming, and they could have done with a little bit more spectacle. I also feel like, quite frankly, they're not disrespectful enough to the superheroes that they're killing. Like I'm, we're playing this Suicide Squad kill, uh, kill the Justice League game, and the way that they kill one of the Justice League, I, I won't spoil it. <laughs> just, just spoiling this game is so weird. But the way that they kill one of them is that they shoot him in the head off screen. And I'm like, dude, if you, if you're, if we're really, if we are really in this environment where we are the Suicide Squad and we are killing the Justice League. I want to see Green Lantern's head fucking exploded. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like I want to see, I want to see f- somebody rip Flash's legs off and beat him to death with them. Not only because that's hilarious, and I think that's totally in keeping with, you know, the nature of like what the Suicide Squad is. It's like it's like very dark and and it's very dark and 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 uh, gruesome, but also kind of like lighthearted and silly. I th- I just find the way they handle a lot of that stuff kind of lame and boring and bland. But like it's it's a far cry from like the most offensive thing in the world or like, oh, my God, they're so disrespectful to these superheroes. It's like, yeah, no shit. They're killing them. It's ar- it's arguably the only thing that the game is doing right is being disrespectful <laughs> to to the to the heroes. And there's and it bothers me because like of all the criticisms to have of this game, this is this is your criticism that that that. that the that batman dies i I just there's so many why is this a live service game why is this a game about characters whose gameplay doesn't match the characters at all like why is harley quinn swinging from a fucking grappling hook off off of a magic drone why is a why is joker a dlc character who flies around on a rocket powered umbrella it's all fucking nonsense you know it makes I, i don't know where I don't know how this really made it to this point. I, 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 but at the same time, I don't know if it's a trav. I don't know if it's a travesty, really, because I do think looking at it from a pure gameplay perspective, I feel like it could be fun. Like it looks like there's like a level of crackdown in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's actually a toss. Like that. This looks kind of. This looks kind of like. I don't know. Like I, I could see myself having fun playing this game. I just don't know why it had to be the Suicide Squad. I don't know why it had to be connected to the arkham universe in the way that it is i don't know why it had to be a live service i don't know why it had to have gear score because i would love to swim through the air and just beat up a bunch of people in a city like i don't know like it's it's fun fine for me (laughs) like i don't see a problem there it's really just a matter of like this gameplay style with this monetization style with this structure with this ip i just think all of it is like really really deeply mismatched and the least egregious thing about it is that superheroes are disrespected in it and if that's your main takeaway from it, then you should fucking grow up, quite frankly. Yeah, I would love a game. I would love a game where I, I got to play as Venom and I got to eat Spider-Man. Well, th- are you kidding? Well, <laughs> this is be awesome. This is what I'm saying. And maybe and I that's why I think that maybe I'm I'm targeting the wrong game specifically or the wrong fan base because it, it literally is superheroes and supervillains. Right. So like good versus evil. But. And I know that there are memes of being like, oh, everything bad happens and it's like like the road and stuff. And I'm not saying that either. What I want is unpredictability. I don't want to know what's going to happen. Right. I don't want to make yeah. assumptions in my fiction. What happens to Joel in The Last of Us Part Two is insane. Like, yeah. I remember, first of all, it spoiled for me anyway. So I, I, I remember when it, but seeing it, I was like, I remember explaining it on. It was just me and you at the time, Chris, saying something like yeah. it took my breath away. Like yeah, I was like, crazy. holy fuck, like they really did it. And then there's that scene with I don't want to spoil too much, but with Ellie where she's having flashbacks and I'm like, cry- I'm crying. You know, like this is what I want. Just and by the way, I want elation too. I want laughs and humor and all of that, but I want the unexpected. 
So when someone says, I want this, and this is what I was saying about superheroes. It's like, he kind of keep your shit away from me in some sense where I'm like, I don't need the predictable linearity of this. It's boring. You're boring. It's boring. I'm bored. You know, that lady, we love her so much. Yeah. And that's so I'm, I'm so confused by people that don't see people like people that support that kind of linear storytelling or predictable storytelling, in my opinion, are the ones that make fun of and saying like, oh, my God, it's so dark and everything's apocalyptic and stuff. And I'm just like, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. Like the possibilities can go are multidimensional. We just need to get away from this polar good versus evil with the predictability that other things can't possibly happen. And then when they do happen, you have to wonder, it's like, this is the shit you love. This is the evil. This is the other side of the coin that the superhero fights. You know, yeah, so I, saw, I, I just don't understand. I, saw, I, I don't, I don't yeah. know what they want personally, but that's, I don't know either. I, I did see a lot of people. I did see a lot of people. Like I, I, I was talking about it on Twitter. It's like, I, I kind of, where people were talking about, like, I don't know who would want to play this game anyway. I don't, I don't know why they would make this premise. I was like, I think the premise is actually great. I think the premise is pretty dope. Like, I, I wish we got more villain games, quite frankly. Like, I, I get why we don't, I suppose. But, like, I remember, I mean, I, it's a joke on the show sometimes when I bring up prototype. But, like, sincerely, like, there's something really freeing about just having that, that, that other side of the coin power fantasy. We already have, like, you know, the Batman games. We have Spider-Man. And so to get something that was essentially that but, like, really gruesome and brutal and evil... It's kind of cool. Like, I don't know. There's something really novel about that and really interesting about that. And having a Suicide Squad game about that is, is fucking cool. I just I, I just think people are angry about things surrounding the game that don't really have to do with the game that then get kind of projected onto it. There's a lot of problems with it. I don't want to I don't want people to assume like I'm running defense. There's like so many issues with this game that I I, I almost feel like I can't even carry all of them at once. Um, but I just think the things that people are choosing to focus on are just so strange because like, why not have a. <laughs> why not have a, a game where the justice league dies oh because we haven't gotten a justice league game yet proper it's like that's not really a good reason not to have that game i i, I don't know it's i find it just i find the discourse really really fucking tiresome already i have a few thoughts go ahead to add in sure. here uh first of all i'm not into you know you nerdy comic book bullshit uh world shit yeah. but uh no, here's you love the that thing. Yeah, one piece you know what are you talking about that's that's premiere content that's <laughs> So here's the thing. To my understanding, I don't know a lot about DC. In it. Seriously, I don't. The Isn't there like multiple worlds in this? Like, is there a possibility that this is a, a different? I know about this from the Chris Chan lore. Is that, that's what, the how he got is that what the multiverse worlds. is? The multiverse? Is that the thing? The, the I think Marvel emerged. and DC both have multiverse oh, okay. stuff. So I wonder if that's an element to this game, but I don't really I don't know. know. Yeah, I. Yeah, I have a hot take i don't know how people are going to feel about this but this is what i've realized about my own mind in some ways is that i understand this feeling of i've been with this character or this specific batman for so long we've we've gone on these three adventures done so many things and to see him go this way is disappointing and, and is upsetting kind of like you're saying chris i i get yeah, yeah. that I agree with that, by it, the way. Yeah, I think it, I think it's not shocking enough, quite frankly. I think it's really boring and, and lame how they did it. In my mind, when things like this happen, um, the fact that this isn't called, you know, Arkham, the fall of Batman or something, it's its own separate spinoff game. So I personally would just kind of choose to ignore it. <laughs> I, and I know that's going to be so unsatisfactory, but I think about here comes Star Wars. <laughs> where we have the original trilogy. I love them. They're not perfect, but I love them for what they are. Then we have the sequel trilogy, which I think started off a little boring, but good. And then went away that I really didn't like. And you know what? Those three Star Wars movies are just as good as they were before. Yeah. And I just choose to kind of ignore those other ones because they're kind of fan fiction. They're 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 written by a different group with a different idea of where the story goes. And I understand the investment. I try to put myself in the shoes. Like, for example, Colin, you brought up one piece. If something happened in one piece that made me so disgusted, how would I deal with that? What can, can, so, I, can I ask? Yeah. Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. And I'm not asking for specifics because I don't know anything about the story. and I don't want you to spoil it. But what could even happen that would be that? Where you would be like, so I can't things. fucking 
believe that it's like to me i just i don't go into fiction with that mentality really well i think that there's this idea of character betrayal right and that comes a lot in star wars people didn't like how luke skywalker was handled they felt it betrayed his original character uh and did make sense for you know for who he was and i get that so i could say like in one piece if a certain character did something that doesn't make sense to any of his prior actions and that applies to any story then that would be frustrating and i guess in in a way that that would feel like bad writing because sure there are going to be twists and turns for you bring up joel the death of joel makes complete sense and the reason for it happening makes complete sense right so yes there are people that are probably frustrated that that was the choice that was made but it is completely justified through the way they told the story you might not like that i guess but you can't argue that it's stupid whereas the luke skywalker situation I think you could argue that it was really dumb, but yeah. that's a whole can of worms that we don't have to open here again on sacred symbols. So I don't know to, to me with this suicide squad game, I see this and I can relate to the feeling of that Batman going out in a way that doesn't feel good, but I just don't really care because I don't care about this game. But again, that's totally me thing. Maybe you were really invested and you wanted to see the next chapter and so I understand that. I'm not trying to tell you to just not feel away, but yeah. I, yeah. I agree with you, Chris, completely. I know you tweeted this, too, that there are so many other things about this game. And again, the title is called Kill the Justice League. Yeah. What, I, yeah. What like I'm, I'm genuinely <laughs> I, I really mean this. I'm, I'm really disappointed with how. Toned like I, I wanted them to be even more disrespectful. Dude, Batman gets <laughs> they sawed were. in half on a table saw a lot. Dude, go, dude, go overboard with it. There's a, there's a comic called uh, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe where like Deadpool just goes around killing like he kills Spider Man and all and, like everybody, and mm-hmm. it's it's ridiculous. And granted, like they have some in universe, uh, re- it's like oh well, these are different versions of these characters, so it's not your fit. But like who, at, at a certain point, like if you're playing a different, if you're playing a different disc. That to me is a what that to me like basically is like a different world anyway. Like if I really let, oh hey, uh, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League is like a really poor handling of Batman. Therefore, like oh my god, it ruins Arkham Knight. Why? I don't understand that mindset. If I had that mindset, I would like there would be nothing today that I liked at all, at all, because I couldn't play Halo anymore because <laughs> four and five ruined the the, tr- the trilogy. Apparently, you know, if I'm supposed to believe that. If I'm supposed to believe that future things retroactively destroy it, like you can you you view something that uses old material in a really irresponsible way or just uses it in an unsatisfactory way and find it disappointing. I totally understand that. That makes perfect sense to me. But to act like it retroactively ruins something that was great already, like I just I don't buy into that at all. Like I feel like that's a really dumb mentality to have, not only for you to have as an as an interpersonal person, like to, as a fan of the media that you consume, but just as a general way of just absorbing information at all because whether you like it or not if something is successful someone's going to find a way to fuck it up (laughs) you know there's always going to be some new chapter in something that doesn't meet expectations there's always going to be some new thing oh uh 12 years later there's going to be a new version and you can feel disappointed by that for sure but i just feel like the people who let it retroactively ruin great shit i i I can't get behind that and I, i i think you do yourself a disservice when you do that um, I just think <laughs> maybe this gets into the next inquiry we have here. Yeah. By the way, so I'll get into this, what I was going to say, and, and I'll, I'll include this person, but Dustin, we should definitely put in the tags for this that we spoiled The Last of Us as well. Yeah. 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 The real Deli wrote in, said, hey, see, with a small side of ad boys. I don't know what that means. Any thoughts on the rampant spoiling going around for Suicide Squad? I understand some people aren't happy with certain aspects of the game, but why does everyone feel the need to spoil the shit out of the game just because they don't like creative choices made? Thanks for all you do. I'm sensitive to you, what you're saying, because I'm becoming increasingly sensitive, more sensitive, kind of on this fucking seesaw in my life of, of spoilers, where I, we get so many complaints about spoilers. And we actually get a lot of compliments kind of contemporary to our, our content for not getting crazy with it. Like Gene apparently is a rampant spoiler of things. Actually, he definitely right. is because I've had him edited before, but we're trying to rein that all in. I know Brad is trying to calibrate summon sign to kind of incorporate spoilers at the appropriate time. So I generally agree that 
we should try to keep the spoilers to a minimum and let people enjoy things. However, to Chris's point, and this is what I was going to say, but I wanted to make sure we included this letter was the to Suicide Squad kill the Justice League name suggests at the very least it could happen or that's the intention. So that's where it's like it doesn't say it's it's not called Suicide Squad. We're definitely going to kill the Justice League in this game. It's just suggesting that that's a possibility. And that's why I was so surprised by it, because it wasn't some more nebulous thing where like you could imagine maybe they get away or maybe that they flip the script or whatever, but that there was no there was no inclination that that was the reality. So that was why I was confused about it. It's not even so much the spoiler thing as much as it was just. Yeah, I don't know. I, We've got over this. We're know. going in circles at this point. But yeah, it's it's hard for me to feel. I don't know. I don't I'm really look, I'm really sensitive to spoilers. Like I really I really care about letting people experience things on their own. Like I, re, I really don't. Sweeney's notoriously bad <laughs> at at spoil. Like we've had to bleep out multiple multiple spoilers from him on episodes of the snark tank. So I get it. But at the same time, as somebody who's very, very sensitive to this stuff, who's very, very sensitive to spoilers, I feel I, I literally I feel nothing about spoiling this game. And I, I don't I don't think I'm wrong. I just think it's just the nature of like what this game is just kind of lends itself well to just this feeling of like, well, I mean. I don't know. Do you feel that, too? Like, I, I just don't feel nearly as bad about spoiling a game like called Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League as I do about spoiling something like, I don't know, Metal Gear Solid 2 or, or The Last of Us 2 or, or something like that. That's inherently a lot more nebulous. I, I don't know. I, I don't feel the same inherent drive to stay away from that that i usually do for other games maybe i'm i could be like completely wrong i could be miscalibrated but like i just feel like the game spoils itself uh well the, there's specific th the nature of things i won't spoil right i'm not gonna tell you how or why or, or in at what point in the game things happen but i mean i don't know am i am i am i wrong like i, I don't know well this feels I, like a weird game I think that maybe what uh, the real deli here is is talking about is just that shortly after the game released in early access, there was immediately showing tweets of major scenes from the game where, again, this this titular spoiler of killing the Justice League is then put out on everyone's timelines and almost yeah. we weaponized in a way to be like, look, oh, they did this shit. And this again relates back to The Last of Us Part 2, where we talk about how Colin and I, when we were trying to rein in one bad actor who saw the leaks and then was so offended by what he saw of these leaks that then made it his mission that everyone should know about this. Everyone on Last Stand's Patreon should know about it. And I don't give a fuck if you want to find out on your own. And that's wrong. Right. Right. So, yeah. So it's one sense... I, I agree with you, Chris. In one sense, it's like, yeah, we can talk about the fact that they kill the Justice League in the game. It's in the title. But to go in and before the game comes out to the broader public, immediately tr start putting this on Twitter. And it, it's one of those things where there is some self-responsibility on Twitter, where if you don't want to see leaks for or spoilers for any game, then you should go in and mute keywords. But at the same time, it, it's a give and take. Like, I, 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 you know I, I, mean? I guess. I, I know what you're saying, but I guess yeah. to me, it's to me that the way I feel about it is like the spoil. I, I won't spoil the last of us part two again, because I know the people are probably like skipping around. Uh, I'm just going to put might, in the but, in the time in the timestamp spoilers for Suicide Squad and last of us part right, two. Right. You but, can but choose just, to listen to this segment or you cannot. Right. But just in case people are skipping around or, or whatever, and, and maybe they're not super paying attention. The spoiler in the last of us part two, like the big one. That is something that I, was a not expected at all, and b it can be spoiled just very, very easily accidentally by reading it. You know what I mean? Like you can read like, "Oh my god, that happens," and that's more of a spoiler than how. You know what I mean? Whereas, like in this game, what happens isn't the spoiler. How is the spoiler? And so, mm. to me, I feel like I feel like he, a video that says, "Here's how Batman dies." In Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League. That's not really a spoiler because you know that that's going to happen just based on the intrinsic title of the game. It's a spoiler if you watch it. And that you kind of have complete control over. 
Hmm. Do you know what I, I don't know if that's, I don't even know if that's necessarily a good argument, but it's definitely how I feel about it, where it's like, I, I definitely chose to spoil that game for me, uh, just because like, I just don't really care that much. Right. That's how I felt but, when I read all the Wolverine leaks. I know the entire right, game. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 so I read it, but like, yeah. but I, I could have very easily avoided that. And if, and if a spoiler would have made its way across my timeline, just in word form, it wouldn't have been a spoiler because it, because it would have been, a, it would have been simply a given. You, you know, I, I don't know. Right. I, I guess that there's just an argument that even though the title is Kill the Justice League, we don't know exactly how that pans out. And maybe you right. don't want to buy the early access, but you are very excited. I would agree that some level of respect should be given. But I yeah. guess at the same time, I would never expect that either. For example, uh, certain games are like when Attack on Titan the manga was out, but the anime wasn't. So for three years, I put every Attack on Titan name or character name, different titles, all kinds of stuff in my media words on Twitter. And I didn't see a peep about it. And I was unspoiled. But because yeah. I just don't expect people to 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 to, to hold that, you know, like people just yeah, yeah. blatantly post that stuff everywhere. But I think there is that element of like the mechanized uh spoiler used because you're upset as well yeah yeah you're right I, yeah that's that's a fair point i think um i don't know man it's it's hard for me to take this game seriously though with the, with this stuff in, in in some sense because i don't know if you saw but like the, they and this isn't like a spoiler or anything but they they showed like the joker in the game and it's a completely mm-hmm. different joker from mark hamill it's like apparently it's like he's from another universe or whatever and it's like well then who fucking cares if these justice league people die because can they right. just get new ones? I, like, I, I don't know. Like, comic, comic books have had this problem for fucking ever. <laughs> and it's why, it's why it's really difficult for me to really care that much about it. It's like, oh, yeah, he died. But, like, you know, he's, he's coming back. In this really version, think- he died. But not yeah, in this in version. The, yeah, like, no, no yes, one's ever yeah. permanently. Yeah, that, that is kind no of the, fa- really the fatal flaw. I mean, maybe, maybe the, the thing people like about it, too, is, is that nothing's ever permanent. But an interesting postscript about The Last of Us Part Two spoilers. And I, don't, I don't know if you remember this, Dustin and Chris is that when that guy was, I don't remember his name. I'd have to go back and look, but there was a guy, as you were noting that spoiled the shit out of the last of us. Right. And yeah. we had to, um, we didn't have the appropriate tools that were like able to do anything about it. Remember mm-hmm. this? And a lot of Patreon, like pretty urgently was trying to solve problems like on the fly that came from that specific use case of people. Cause you, you, you didn't have to be a patron or whatever. So, but ultimately, and I have to go back to look exactly what happened, but it was something like I talked to them and was like, can you figure out who this person is? Like, and wasn't it, wasn't that what it I was? Think they kept making new accounts, right? They were paying to make new accounts, right? Like just funny. Cause they were paying us more money, but we couldn't IP ban them. We right. had no control. Right. And then we did figure like, there was something where I, I gotta, I gotta think about it, but it was something like, I threatened him saying like, listen, dude, like, and I'm not really sure. I remember talking to our lawyer about this or their lawyers about this, where it's like, what is the legality of doing this? Because it does seem like there's some, certainly he's breaking the terms of service, which is its own thing, but that's not necessarily illegal. But it seems like almost like harassment. There's got to be something about this. So I remember saying to him, like, listen, dude, like we, you use your credit cards. We know who you are. And I'm going to come after you if you keep doing this. Like it was basically that, like, I'm going to come after you. No, it was hurting and, our and, business. Yeah, people like, were leaving the Patreon right. and leaving exit service surveys saying, right. "I'll be back," but right now there's a dude going nuts, and I can't. I don't want to see that. Right, and this you was, know? by the way, this is it's worth knowing. This happened for like months, and yeah. and uh, uh, and I so I was like, I'm gonna go after you legally, of course, and like, and then he was like profusely apologetic and all that, and I just let it go. So I'm like, I'm gonna if you keep doing this, this is insane. This is insane. Like you're crazy. And we have a, we have a few crazy listeners and people over time, but that you, everyone's going to attract that, of course. Anyway, we've been on this topic for a long time, so let's move on. Let's get into the games we're playing, and then we'll get into the state of play. Um, Chris, let's start with you. It says you're playing Skyrim Survival Mode. Yeah, yeah, I jumped into it. Uh, I ha- I've talked about having this itch for a while, and uh, I just decided to jump into it. It also gave me an excuse. Because it's uh, it's a game I'm playing on PS5 to test out streaming uh, on the Steam Deck, which uh, Dustin pointed me to some 
very chalky for deck, dude. Yeah, Chiaki for Dex, some, some some useful information on how to do that. So that's been really fucking cool. Just because uh, my initial thing was like, oh, I could just stream it from my PC. I do have Skyrim on PC, but like I started my survival thing on PS5 and I was already kind of into it. It was like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to restart. Uh, so figuring that out was really cool. So I've been doing that. I've been playing it on Steam Deck and on PS5. I find this. It's a weirdly engrossing way to play Skyrim. <laughs> I feel like. There was really no world where I went back and played Skyrim again in, in like the normal way, because I just feel like, you know, I've done this already. But like this, this addition of like, oh, you have to make sure that you're warm when it gets too cold or, or like you have to make sure that you're uh, you're not overheating or you have to make sure that when you eat food, it's cooked. Otherwise, it gets you sick and, and you have to make sure you're well, make sure you're well fed and you have to make sure that like, oh, you know, you can't you can't fast travel and you can't. Uh, you can't level up unless you have a bed to sleep in. Just these these weird limiting factors are are uh, getting me like really into the game in a way that I haven't really been into in a very very long time. So that's been it's been really nice because it, it I kind of forgot how how much of a vibe Skyrim actually is. <laughs> just that music, that night sky. That morning sky, just like how everything looks, everything looks suitably like everything looks pretty enough to be like, oh, this is nice. But, it, it you know, it's still got that. It's still very it's clearly an old game, so it doesn't <laughs> doesn't look amazing, but it, it looks so suitably nice where it's like, ah, I'm, I'm in this I'm in this world. The no fast travel thing is really nice because at first I thought it was going to be like really inconvenient, but it, it really just kind of ground you in in this trek. Um, where there's just no there's no loading screens, basically, even on PS5, like when you load into a town, it's so instant compared to how it used to be on the PS3 and Xbox 360 that it's it might as well not even be there in the first place. So I'm, I'm just finding like a really I'm finding a really, really nice experience on Skyrim uh, survival mode. But another thing that I didn't that I didn't write in the write up because I wanted it to be a little bit of a, a little bit of a surprise, I picked myself up. Dude, oh. an, an, an analog, an analog pocket, and I've been yes. playing. Game, yeah, gold. I've, I've been playing Pokemon Gold on it. Just, just. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. oh, that I'm sound. Still, no, it's it's good. Let it play. It's good, but uh, You're, we're uh, gonna get copyright uh, struck. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so I've been I've been fucking around with that too, and it's been uh, it's been a trip, man. I, I I gotta when I get when I when I come home for um when I come up to New York for the show in uh, in March, I'm gonna. I'm going to stop by my folks uh, place for a little bit, spend time with them and, and probably grab some of my old cartridges because that's where all my that's where all my Game Boy and, and Game Boy Advance stuff is. I have a few games here. I have uh, Legacy of Goku 1 and 2 and X-Men Battle Network or not X-Men Battle, Mega Man Battle Network uh, 5, I think. Mm -hmm. I think I can't remember exactly the number, but but I want to go home and, and grab all the uh, all the rest of my cartridges now that I have a really cool way to to play them. Um, but yeah, so I'm Chris, I'll, that. Uh, cool. I'll send you a link. I'll have to find out after the show. It's super easy to install different cores so you can put on Super Nintendo, Genesis, NES. Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah, I would love, I would love to do that. It's awesome. I loaded up, I was really curious the one day, so I downloaded a bunch of movie licensed games of that era that are just terrible, but so interesting. Uh, like Home Improvement. For Super Nintendo. Oh, yeah. You, I was just checking fighting, it out. Where you're, yeah. the, where you're fighting the Velociraptors with the chainsaw. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Bad, but it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. But so that's that's really all I've been mucking around with. It's, it's you know, just casual. Nothing, nothing too bad. I honestly, honestly, sincerely, I think. I think I might just be too curious about all of this discourse happening that. I might jump into Suicide Squad. Mm. Just because I feel like I want to know. I want to know for myself, like, what the hell this game is. Yeah, do it. We'll let us know next week. Yeah. Adam Xavier Velasquez wrote in, says, Good day, Colin. Just wanted to ask how you are enjoying Grand Blue Fantasy Reeling so far. With the news that this game's main story is only 20 hours in length and the rest is filled with side quests and endgame content, do you fancy the style of approach for JRPGs or do you prefer the traditional JRPG format with a much longer story to tell? Thanks for all that you do, and I'll be seeing you in the Zegagrand Skydome. I think that's how you say it, because I'm skipping all the dialogue in the game because it's so boring. Dustin, I'm curious what um, I'm curious what you think uh, about Grand Blue Fantasy Relink as you are also playing it. Yeah, uh, not bad. 
It's not bad. It's uh, it's good. The the combat is really the fun part of this game that where it really shines. Uh, you can there's a bunch of different characters to play. There's probably I actually don't know how many there are total. At least more than a dozen different characters you can choose to play out play as, which is pretty cool. But uh, I understand why they released that anime in advance because there is a little context to what's going on but not very much it's very much a game in the grand blue fantasy series or whatever because i know there's the phone game and there's the fighting games but it's not necessarily a good starting point if you really care about the story but that's where colin comes in (laughs) what you said about the dialogue being boring is that i've been trying to figure out that if i did know all of these characters if i if that would make me care more and i don't know if that's the case because i just uh it's a little too tropey i think is what it comes down to the the level of trope yeah the level of trope is just too high and i can't stand this fucking dragon guy oh my god he sucks he sucks he totally sucks he's super annoying so it's like Vern or something, isn't it? As a name or some some stupid shit like that. Yeah, E-Y-R-N. I think that's what he's I mean. like the uh, the in, in Genshin Impact. One of the reasons I never really could get into that. There's a character called Paimon, which is like this little floating fairy person. I don't know if it's a boy or a girl, but whatever. That's so annoying. I, I can't I hate these tropey, annoying characters that float around. So it's fine. And I got to say the thing that is pushing me through right now is that I am really enjoying the combat. I'm enjoying, there's lots of different ways to level up, get new abilities, uh, different weapons and stuff like that. I'm really enjoying that aspect of it. And the fact that it is only 20 hours in length, I think I saw my percentage was already at half from starting on Monday. Yeah. I'm 50% so, through as well. According to PSN. That's funny. Yeah. So it's, it's nice. That's kind of nice for me because if it was, even 30 hours, I'd be like, I don't know if this this gameplay is going to get me through that length. You know, I think this other stuff pu- is pulling it down a little too much that I don't know if I want to go much further, but it's short enough that I'm cool with it. And I'm really curious about the multiplayer stuff. I know Brad and I were going to play some of the missions at some point. But we haven't done that yet, but it's not amazing. I would say I think the reviews put it at a 79 currently seems high to and me. i that seems oh so you, you you like it a little less i was gonna say like if i know we hate scores here so i'm i'm being hypocritical but if i was scoring it currently be like a 7.5 yeah that's I, I would say 7 7.5 i mean at the most yeah yeah it's um well there it's it's a strange game i think for multiple levels now yeah i I knew that there was something called Grand Blue Fantasy that this comes from, but I guess I didn't realize how important it was to know everything about Grand Blue Fantasy to to get. I've never encountered a game. I was asking Mike at a rack her brain as another JRPG fan, and I ask you to do it as well. Dustin and others out there can do it, too. In Japanese role playing games, can you think of an of a game that begins with the entire party already with you? Like a game, a party based game, like not like old Final Fantasy class based games or anything like that. I'm talking about like where you don't you meet new characters in the game, but you have everyone and they've already been together for years. Mm -hmm. I don't remember playing a game like that. It it feels. As as opposed to, you know, obviously like X, there are 13, two or something. That's what I'm talking about. you You know what I mean? Where it's like role playing games are about one or two characters in the beginning and then you kind of learn more about the world and you gather your characters and you have stories with them. But I'm being. And this is a me problem because I'm not a grand blue fantasy guy. Obviously, it's like I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Yeah, like I really have no idea. Now, there's an extensive lore system and I was reading some of it and I got the general idea. I do like the world. Basically, the world is like a an archipelago of floating islands, which is really cool. And the air, the airships, there's like airship naval combat and it's pretty cool. The world's pretty cool. It reminds me a little bit. It's very bright. And it reminds me of the old 360 RPG, JRPG, Eternal Sonata in terms of its Mm. visuals. Like Eternal Sonata looked like Tales and this game looks like Tales, but they were actually like their own kind of game. But it's like the vivid color palettes and everything that they share. However, I think playing this game back to back with Tales of Arise has really been detrimental to Grand Blue Fantasy because the combat 
I find the combat fun, but it's pretty straightforward. Like, yeah, I don't think much separates this game from a Musou in a lot of different ways. What, there are parts of the game where you have 20 characters with very low health just running at you. And it's like, this is fucking Dynasty Warriors. I mean, the, 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 this is not, you know, Bayonetta or God of War or any of those other kind of action RPG types. This is button mashy, mega button mashy. And that's cool. But I don't find the game particularly difficult. And I was, I was saying back on Grand Blue Fantasy, so I was reading a little bit about it and the game itself, Grand Blue Fantasy, is not even playable in the West. So it's an oh. it's an iOS and web browser game that came out in 2014 and it's an, it's still going. It's an MMO. And then we have the fantasy. We have the Grand Blue Fantasy fighting game from Arc System Works. And there's apparently an anime that I'm that's probably accessible. They came out in like 2017, 2018. And I think that like to really get the most out of this game, you're probably going to need to familiarize yourself with some of that stuff. But I just have no interest in doing that. So I'm playing it just to play it. There's nothing else to really play right now. It's fun enough. I like I'm engaged with the side quests and it's cute and I like the upgrades and all of that, but it's not great. And I think the biggest question I have about it is what the fuck took so long? Because this game was in development for ever. This game was announced in the summer of 2016. And at the time, people might remember that Platinum was developing it. Now, the game was dated at that time at TGS for 2018. We are in 2024. I don't look at this game and have any idea what they were doing. To, like, what, what's so dynamic? It had to be reset. Yeah, probably. Know? But let's say they reset it in 2019, 2020. I still don't see That's a true. four or five year game here. It's yeah. a hub world, but there's no in-game maps. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. It's Especially actually, later, it's actually, it, gets it drives more me fucking insane. Yeah. And like, you can't even look at a map when you're, when you're going through the game, but it's a hub world. And I think there's a second one eventually. I haven't uh, unlocked it yet. And then you just go do quests. But the game is very brisk and I don't mind that, but I'm still, st- I'm, I'm trying to wonder like, where did all the time go? What is the point of this? It, it, it's, it's just not, I don't think it's for me. I'm going to continue to play it. I'd like to just beat it and get it out of the way, but hell sure. divers will be next and there's nothing to play in between now and then. So that's fine. I just, I don't know that I, really recommend it i mean in terms of combat i just it looks like tails but it's not like it is decidedly not it's much more real-time and action oriented with really no menu interaction which is cool but again do you feel me on this dustin that it's like a musso sometimes because it feels like one like there there are there's like this this there are a few scenes where you just see all the red bars of all the enemies coming at you and they're all just fodder and i'm like okay this is really just like one step away from samurai warriors or fucking dragon quest heroes or something to be perfectly honest with you. And I frankly think dragon quest heroes is a much better game than this. So if you're going to, yeah. you know, so I think that I definitely feel that to some degree when you are in the more, uh, I, w- I wouldn't call them open world, but the more level based segments, the linear segments where you're going through different, you know, levels and stuff, but there is a big emphasis on boss battles too, where, uh, you know, you gotta be careful about different dodging, different attacks, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. My big question is when you play the harder online stuff, how does your makeup of characters, how important is that? It's like, okay, we want to have this person who's in the back kind of making sure everyone stays healed up. They're the healer. We have one person being more tank. They're kind of tr- drawing the aggro of the boss. And we have spell a spell caster that's kind of more long range damage. I don't know if it's that in depth. It seems like it could have some of that quality, but the only time I played the multiplayer was during the demo. The other thing, Colin, I'll say you mentioned about playing a JRPG where your entire crew is already there. And this game kind of reminds me of playing. If, if you played one piece odyssey and you never watched one piece because it is a story that is, part of the lore kind of but it's not really canon but it was made by the creator your crew is there and they'll kind of talk about how they got there but you don't have any context for how the characters know each other unless you've watched the anime right exactly like i actually went into the beginning of the game being like oh okay like we're gonna go back in time you know like Mm -hmm. they're they're celebrating their victory and whatever and and then it just never happened and i was like okay so i guess this is where, where where we are now 
it's yeah. i don't know I, I don't want to be too hard on it it's fine it's right. just i don't i don't know that i would i don't know who i would recommend it to it, it it it's it's interesting it wants to be monster hunter in some way or it feels like freedom wars or like um what would be another example what was that game soul soul sacrifice like just mm. games where you're in like a, a hub and then going out and it seems a little more, more dynamic because you can have multiple players, multiple characters in these classes and stuff. But combat and I'm playing on normal difficulty, so I'm sure it gets much harder if you play it on the harder difficulties. But at a standard difficulty, it's not hard. You can there's no consequences for dying, really. I like y- you just get revived. It seems like for no just if you just wait or you can go revive someone quicker. I don't know. I don't really get it, but yeah. And then it says here you're playing Silent Hill, the short message. I'd like to hear about this as well. I heard from Push Square that it's pretty bad. Oh, it's yeah. it's bad. Yeah, it's not very good. I actually it's not that long. I was playing it last night. Uh, the Dukes were recording after the state of play, so they were coming in a little late. So I was just kind of waiting around and I thought, well, this is supposed to be short. And I think I played it for about an hour and a half. I'm probably nearly done with it. But when they were finished, I thought, well, there is a bit of a sunk cost here. Maybe I should finish this later. And then I was thinking about it and I thought I really didn't like this. So why would I do that? (laughs) I don't know what the point of this game is. I don't know. So I guess for context, this is the free Silent Hill game they released at the state of play. We'll talk about the other, you know, Silent Hill 2 later. They released this for free yesterday. It is about two hours long it's in first person and i think what they were trying to go for is to make it somewhat of a pt like silent hill game the other thing i read is that they wanted to make a silent hill game that was appealing more to modern audiences and younger people because a lot of the themes it deals with is uh like social media bullying online bullying people being bullied in school you so there's a big emphasis too on it reminds me of i'm trying i don't want to make sure i don't get into spoilers i'll just talk about this it's at the very beginning in silent hill before you start the game it gives you an entire screen about suicide prevention and how the game deals with suicide which you see that in the trailer from the state of play And they give you like the suicide hotline at the beginning. And it does this multiple times while you're playing the game. It will stop and show the same page before you proceed. It's very odd. Yeah, it's so weird. Like why ruin the experience with that too? You know, beat beat yourself. It's like we said about Doki Doki Literature Club. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's, It's like that. Only imagine before anything dramatic happened in that game, it showed it again and again. That's I think it happens that's ironic. three times that's ironic. in the hour and a half I played. It's ironic, too, because it's the kind of thing that would make you want to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this game is also weird, too, in that it doesn't run very well. There are points where it looks really nice, but the frame rate is all over the place. I'm pretty sure the frame rate was maybe at one point, 12 frames per second, maybe less. Nice. And something about it when I was playing it, this doesn't happen to me very often. I was getting motion sick from playing this game at a few points. And there really is very little combat. There's not supposed to be. But the main gameplay is there's parts where you have to run away from a monster and you have no way to defend yourself. So you have to do certain loops around the map in order to get where you're going. So the monster doesn't you don't have a head on collision with it. It's just not very good. And the writing uh, people have touched on this. It's just not very interesting either and this comes back to the original point where i don't know what the point of this free two-hour game is i don't is it supposed to get people reacquainted with silent hill because if so that doesn't it's probably going to put a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth like it did mine but i'm just confused by it and i know i didn't finish it but i don't can't even recommend it it's free and i i think your time is better spent somewhere else than this game just because it's not uh not very good i i saw gene was tweeting about it and i texted him i was like man this game's shit and he's like yeah it's uh it's pretty bad so not a good sign for konami's revival they're Mm -hmm. they're zero and two so far with bringing this ip back so 
Yeah, it's uh, I can't recommend it. I don't know. Are you guys going to even no, I'm not check, gonna it, check out? it out. I'm not going to check it out. The, not even. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, the, I, the, I saw some things in the trailer that like looked visually interesting, but I also kind of felt completely satisfied by that. You know, it's like, oh. oh, that was a cool that was a cool visual. Uh, I don't need to play it, though. Like, it was cool enough just to see it. I got to tell you guys one more detail that's really stuck out to me, too. So if I remember, if I realize this correctly, it's very confusing. The the game that you're playing, it takes place in a town that's in Germany. So like you see books in that are in German. Everyone's speaking English. But then there's these live action sequences where you see uh, an Asian girl. She's either Japanese or Korean because I know they have different teams working on this, but it's dub. She's speaking in another language and it's dubbed in English. So there's like, the, I'm like, was she speak? Is supposed to be speaking German or is she speaking? You know, wh- what is going on here <laughs> with this? Why is this dubbed? It's so weird. So, yeah, just skip this. Don't play it. Skip it. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised yeah. that it has no trophies either. I, I thought that they could have at least got. I wouldn't play it even for that. I don't care, but you think it would have a little little trophy list. Uh, did you did it have any branding on who made it? Because I found out who made it and they don't actually it's nowhere in the trailer, but I do know. Um, did you did it say it anywhere in the game? I I don't remember. It might have come up at the beginning, but well, so I'm I thought it was Bloober Team because it looks like layers of fear in some way or whatever layer mm. of fear where it's just one of those like kind of walking simulators or whatever. But it's actually Hexadrive, which is the Jap- it did say that it's the Japanese team that did. um They did Parasite Eve three. I don't know if you guys remember that game on, on the third birthday on PSP, but they ported a bunch of stuff for Square Enix and Nintendo and do, just do contract work, basically. And on the PlayStation blog, we, I was going to go over this later, but since we're talking about it now, the short because the short message is out and we don't really need to get into it. But it did say, quote, the game started as something like an experimental project, an opportunity for us to try out different things, see what worked and what didn't, and grow and polish our horror game expertise. We also had a lot of people who were relatively new in their career, but still loved Silent Hill and who really wanted to be involved in making a horror game. So we use this as a way for our team to build hands on experience, too. Um, and as you say, it incorporate contemporary problems, communicating online, phones, the psychological horror of all of that. So thank you for playing it. Saved people a lot of time, probably, even though it's free. Yep. And finally, for me, I have one more thing to say. Wiley Olmstead wrote in and said, hey, sacred boys, this one is for Colin. I have to give your, you a gaming skill compliment. You said last week you were around 80% completion on Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown in about 12 hours. That shows real mastery of the Metroidvania genre. I am almost at 20 hours and at 60 something percent. Kudos. I imagine you have beat it by now. What are your final thoughts? Keep on keeping on. Well, thank you. I don't know if I played it necessarily too fast, but I do have some final thoughts on it. I platinumed it. It's my 155 fifth, my 155th platinum. And it's good. It's it's beautiful. It's fun. I think there's a lot of good character design in it. And I forgot to bring this up last week, though. And this is an important thing is that the game is pretty broken. I don't know why I didn't bring this up. And I don't know if you guys or who played it. You played it, right? Who Someone played it. Dustin, did you play it? Mm. Neither of you played it. Um, I don't know. I was talking to someone who played it. I don't know who, who it must have been. Oh, Dagan. Dagan's playing. It. And yeah. I was saying that it's pretty busted up in certain places. There was a side quest. So there's a specific side quest. This isn't really a spoiler. There are nine side quests in the game. And there's a side quest where you speak to a guy and there's like a crescent moon. It's actually not an Islamic crescent moon, but just a, just like a, a, a ethereal crescent moon. And it kind of shows where he goes and where you have to go. And so there's this one, the, the beginning of the mission, the game will just, and this is a, a thing that people have reproduced, including me over and over again, is that the game will just lock up when you get this quest and accept it. And the way to make it not lock up is to turn your controller off and then turn your controller back on and it works like weird shit like that in the game. Hmm. And there were times where the game's hitboxes just disappeared. I was in the middle of fighting a boss and the hitboxes are just gone. And when I restarted, it happened again and I restarted and it happened again. And I had to shut the game off, turn the PS five off, restart the PS five, restart the game to make it stop doing it. Um, there are just weird things that are broken about it. And I'm sorry I didn't bring that up earlier because I should have. It's not really preclusive if you're willing to kind of jump through the hoops to know to go on PSN profiles or power picks and you'll get like the tip on how to fix it. But but it is pretty busted up. The other thing I want to say about the UI is it does a really good job. The map's pretty extensive and it does a really good job of showing you some of what you're missing, but not all of what you're missing. And an annoying part of it for me, this is very old school, but I was missing soma pedals which are like health things for your health bar and i was missing ore to upgrade my weapons both of which i needed for the platinum but i didn't know what i was missing 
So I had to go around the game with a guide and just go to every space place where those two things were to figure out what I was missing and what I wasn't. And that was annoying because for a game that does a really nice job of chronicling and showing you where you're supposed to go and what you might be missing. It's just like, why did you stop so short? You're showing me where this secret thing is, but you're not comp- counting this thing. You're making this mysterious, but this, oh, oh, you know, not opaque at all. I don't really understand the philosophy behind that design. So that was a, a problem for me. Uh, James Ketchum wrote in and said, hello, gents. Insider Gaming just released a deep dive report on recent and upcoming Ubisoft titles. Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown has only hit a sales number of 300,000 units so far. Despite high critical reception, that is pretty low. Does this mean there isn't much room for smaller in-between titles or did it just get lost in the hype of higher profile titles dropping soon? Or has the Metroidvania genre become super niche? What does this mean for Silk Song? As always, thanks for the being the best podcast family around. I think 300,000 units is great. I don't know what their expectation was. It's a $40 Metroidvania game that they barely promoted coming out in the beginning of January. Anyone yeah. who's complaining, I, I'm maybe they're internally saying like that's not sufficient, but I would imagine that this game, I think I read the Insider Gaming Report and I think they said they made $15 million gross on it. I would imagine that costs less than that to make this game. I would hope so. So I don't really see that as a huge problem. It all, that, that stuff also had um, Avatar, Frontiers of Pandora at $2 million. So not too bad, not great. So yeah, shout out to Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown. I think it's a fun Metroidvania game. I think there it would be trivial, as I said last week, to name better Metroidvania games. I think the some of the scores on the game are a little ridiculous. Like, again, people saying like, this is an early game of the year contender. I'm like, maybe in a fucking another universe, this is an early game. If you, if, if, dude, if Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown is in the game of the year conversation at the end of this year, we are fucked. Uh, <laughs> just no, no doubt about it. I mean, it's, it's being a little too hard on the game, but it has no business being in the conversation for game of the year. It's not, it's not that revolutionary. Make a fucking proper 2D Metroidvania game and maybe I'll think about it differently. All right, it's time to get into the news. We're finally here. Only took three hours. Let's see. State of play. Now I have extensive notes here. I was originally going to write this out, but then I was like, well, I actually just have um, the run of show here on, my, on this note, and then I have some things to expand upon. So I figured we would just take everything as it came in the state of play, but I wanted to begin with a little bit of a, a thought here. Michael Studer wrote in, said, hey, Sacred Crew, that state of play was something at first blush with Herman coming out and saying there were some exciting new announcements got me excited only to be deflated by seeing information we largely already had. A few release dates were nice, but I can't help but feel the same way I did before the state of play. Where are the games? Don't get me wrong. Death Stranding 2 looks awesome, but to see 2025 is just another dagger through the heart. That is 2024. Nothing shown was bad or looked awful, but nothing during the entire state of play said anything about possible future plans Sony has. All that was needed was someone to say we have more to reveal at a summer games fest or a tease beyond the new IP from Kojima in 2030 on the quick side. The best new game shown was probably the Metroid Metro VR game, which is super cool. Hell, they even remade PT, but worse with the new free Silent Hill game. Maybe I'm way out of pocket on this, but I feel like I'm wondering what is Sony bringing out this back half of the year at this point. I'm out of my mind to think that this was a C plus Judas and Death Stranding 2 look awesome, but nothing big new game wise and mediocre looking Silent Hill 2 remake with no date has me feeling lukewarm when the dust settles. Now I'll turn things over to the SS crew to hear your thoughts. Thanks for the massive amount you do and offer. Thank you, Michael, for writing uh, for writing in. What do you guys want? <laughs> like, we'll get into the first party stuff, but how how wasn't this a great showcase? Yeah, I felt like, like yeah. let's look at it's not a showcase. So by state of play standards, this is an A. Right. Right? Maybe state a of play. For state yeah, of play, state of play, so right. this yeah. a, or, and no less than an A minus. And I've had unlike and this is what we were saying at the top of the show, Dustin, is unlike when we've had to do this in the past, they usually go on Thursdays. So we have to do a pickup and I don't have much time to marinate. And I've had time to marinate like a day. So I'm feeling pretty good about what they showed. We'll get into the first party dearth of games. Someone wrote in about that, but I'm curious. Let's let's begin here. How do we feel? Dustin, let's go to you first. How do we how do we feel Sony did? And what what is your overall look at things after that 40 minutes we had of the state of play? Yeah, I, I think you're right about having the right expectations for what a state of play is. We've talked about how sometimes for better or for worse, a state of play is fulfilling marketing obligations. So it would make sense that they're kind of detailing boom, boom, boom. Here are the things in your near future, right? And some of those are pretty fucking awesome specifically stellar blade we'll get into 
that breakdown was way more than I expected from this type of game. So that was really exciting. And there were, even though it was a game we knew about, I didn't expect to see Judas at all. In fact, yeah. we saw that first trailer. Was that, was it last year or? The, or v, yeah, it was last V. It was VGA 2022. Okay. Or the so Game Awards 2022. I guess I just expected that, man, we're not going to see that game again for a long time. And it has been so it's been about a year, give or take. Right. And so, yeah, that was awesome. And dude, the Death Stranding trailer, very in depth. Uh, it, like, mm -hmm. I think that we got to get out of this mindset that only new is good. Only new, only only new stuff. It's like there's and first party, only first party, is good. only first party and only new. It's like, no. And again, having the right expectations for what the context of what they're presenting. They didn't call it a showcase. It's a state of play. And again, yeah. that comes back to marketing obligations and some new stuff. And I think it delivered well on both. Yeah, well said. Where are you on this, Chris? Yeah, I, I feel largely the same. Like, I, I'm, I'm usually pretty down on state of plays. They're, they don't normally really do much for me. Um, and I think if you're grading this as a showcase, I think I think if you're grading the, if you're grading this as a PlayStation showcase, a C plus to a B minus, I think is probably appropriate. You know what I mean? Because it's not really all that new stuff. You don't really get a, a good idea of what's really there in the near future. I agree with that. But as far as a PlayStation, as, as far as a state of play where I'm just looking for a brisk showcase to show me things that I'm interested in. I feel like this is the most interested. I feel like this. This state of play showed me the most things that I was interested in compared to any other state of play that I can remember in recent memory. Personally, like almost everything with the exception of maybe one, maybe two things were something that I was like, oh, man, I'm actually kind of genuinely interested in that. Even the VR stuff. I was looking at like, oh. I want to play these. <laughs> weird that doesn't normally happen so to me i don't know man this is a this is a great state to play i think it's easily the best one that i can remember i don't i don't really remember feeling this high off of a state of play before it's possible that the, that the last time that happened is many many years ago now but in my memory this is this is top this is top stuff there's a lot of great stuff here granted i do agree that there's some stuff that was there like judas judas in my opinion I mean, I'm, I'm really excited for Judas, but at the same time, I don't know if they showed really enough to get like, I wish there was more. Oh, my God. You know? I'm through the roof for that game. It's so interesting that you feel that way. I'm like, well, I'm excited about it. I just don't know. I just don't know what I got out of that trailer necessarily that I didn't get from the teaser that we already got like a year ago. So it feel, I, I guess the progress on that feels slow. Like I was I was disappointed in, or even just like a date, you know what I mean? Or like not a date, but like a, a general time frame. It just said wish list now, which was not really that sufficient for me. But like at the same time, I'm still interested in Judas. It was cool to see more of Judas. So it's it's more about like it, it's less about it not being satisfactory and more about like the stuff that I wanted to see more about. I didn't get that much of. But everything that we saw was still pretty. I mean, with the exception of one thing that I'm sure we'll, we'll get into. <laughs> everything was pretty solid. Um, I don't know. I un I understand maybe the Until Dawn thing is kind of disappointing for people who are like, where's Bloodborne? But like, I don't know, man. I, I think they did a really good job. I think it was a really solid show, uh, a really solid state of play. The fact that they got me on board with the VR stuff is very that that's not easy to do for me. So I don't know, man. I felt really good about it. All right. So, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll conclude and we'll, we'll get into uh, our thoughts going game by game here. We'll go to Detective Andy Sipowitz. It's good to hear from you again. I haven't heard from you in 20 years or so since NYPD Blue. Good day, Sacred Scholars. After watching the PlayStation Showcase, I am getting concerned about notable first party studios refusing to talk. Still nothing from Sucker Punch, Bend or Blue Point Games. Do you think there's a chance that Insomniac goes again with Venom before we actually have these other studios release a game this generation? If they do, how is it possible for them to go four times before other studios go once? Well, it's all about size, but Detective, I just I don't want you guys to worry too much. We're getting caught. This is what I was saying after the showcase. Like we're getting caught in an arbitrary space that doesn't differentiate between. Or that does that does try to differentiate arbitrarily between first, second and third party when really it should it should be reduced down first and foremost if you're excited about the games themselves, even if they're all exclusive, if they're not exclusive, even if they're second party or first party, even if Sony published them or someone else published them. I just I think that's a trap. and. It's it's weird because we literally have no idea what anyone's doing with the exception of Insomniac, which we have an extensive view now into their into their world. But I thought we might see Concord here 
But it became pretty qu- clear pretty quickly that there was going to be no first party presence here. But there was PlayStation Studios presence. There are what three PlayStation exclusive games shown? Four, five, something like that. We'll go through mm-hmm. and count as we go. Some of them are timed as well. And some of them were big indies that were coming too. So I just think that this was generally a very strong showing. Remember too, for people that are curious that on February 6th, there'll be a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth centric state of play that I will not be watching, but that I'm sure many of you out there will want to see. All right, let's get into this one by one. They begin with Helldivers 2. We did predict that when they would go again, they would have a chance to get this game promoted one more time. We know it's coming February 8th to PS5 and to PC. They teased a little bit of like mechs coming post-launch and some post-launch support. We kind of are locked in on one way or the other on this game, I think. We'll, we're going to find out really soon. Any any last thoughts on Helldivers before we move into the, hmm. the bigger stuff? I don't think I have anything new to say about it other than excited to check it out on PC to play with my friends. In fact, yeah. we uh, I was streaming with Brad. We were saying, Chris, we should do a little LSM Streamy yeah. together, me, you, Brad, and I think Ben's gonna get it too. I don't know if anyone else is, but I'm totally. It might be yeah. fun. Yeah, absolutely. He'll do his part. All right. <laughs> Herman Holst comes out, shouting everything out. Shouts out PS Plus. Shouts out PSVR two. Shouts out Portal. And we get right into the second game, which is Stellar Blade. This mm-hmm. is interesting. So I'm trying to figure out what is different about this game than. Until Dawn or Rise of the Ronin. These are all second party games. But for some, I don't know if you guys noticed, Stellar Blade has like an SCE publisher tag when it starts, like the old school. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Instead, of it, instead of it saying PlayStation Studios, it says Sony Computer Entertainment Presents, which is like the old school tag. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to figure out what is different between all these games that some of them are like more ex dev associated PlayStation Studio games that are branded that way. This one isn't because we saw Helldivers 2 right beforehand branded like that. And then later on, we see games um, like Rise of the Ronin brand and Until Dawn branded like that. So I just thought that was interesting. But this game looks fucking awesome. Yeah. I don't know why they sh- waited so long to show it. Is there some sort of weird thing about it? I don't know. Wesley Allison wrote in and said, hey, CDC, Stellar Blade is coming out at the end of April and it looks very promising. I assume Dustin is all over this. Colin, does this draw you in at all? Combat looks amazing, but I think it might be fly too close to Souls like for you. I didn't get a Souls like vibe from this game at all. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't get that vibe whatsoever. I get an I get a more Ninja Gaiden, yeah, um, Bayonetta, Devil May Cry vibe from it with you know deep RPG systems. It looks like so. It's Shift Up, South Korean studio comes out April 26th. 2024. So our instincts were right, right? We talked about a few weeks ago that PlayStation blog post with the gaps in it that were indicating when the time things came out. I said it looked like May. I was pretty close. So shout out to yeah. Colin Moriarty. PlayStation 5. Now, I'm curious what we, we think about this. Chris, let's go to you first on this. I see a lot of, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I see a lot of Final Fantasy 7 remake in this game in some strange way. Not in, ter- in terms of its combat, but maybe a little more presentationally. Like Fallout, mm-hmm. Rage, Borderlands, even Final Fantasy 13, and Dustin, Danganronpa music. I don't know if you picked up on that. Like deeply mm-hmm. Danganronpa music, deeply. I watched the whole six minutes again. It's so interesting. I can't wait for this fucking game. What do you think, Chris? I'm I'm st- <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked about it. It looks exactly like um, it re- it reminds me. It feels like like a modern day version of of some of those like those action games that we would get in the the 360 ps3 generation that were like it almost reminds me and i don't mean necessarily stylistically or or like specifically but like i got like this feeling of like oh vanquish and 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 Mm -hmm. and like bayonetta and like Mm -hmm. it's just this just like just like a balls to the wall like that generation action game and i'm i'm yeah i'm 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 super into it it looks so ridiculous i'm in i'm totally it it looks great for people that are curious out there, again, April 26th, pre-orders begin February 7th, um, and it's $70, and it will go higher depending on special editions as well. Yeah. Just to give a little bit of context, people might remember that this game was first revealed as Project Eve back in 2019, and it was originally multi-platform. It was actually explicitly announced for PS4 and Xbox One, and then it re-emerged at the PlayStation Showcase in fall 2021 as Stellar Blade, and it was in the state of play in 2022 as well. 
action RPG, third person, fast and fluid. Dustin, I'm really eager to hear what you think of this because I was blown away by this game. Like I, I, I think this game looks fucking great. Like it really, really does. And I'm looking at the chart here of all the, this is like definitely the star of the show for me, I think maybe until Kojima, certainly until Kojima. I think that would be the only thing that would, that would rival it. So I was just blown away, man. And, and six minutes, they really showed that game off and I don't need to see it another second. I don't want to see, it. I'm not going to see another second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the original trailers kind of had me set up to expecting a very linear, devil may cry like experience but then they really made an effort to show the world and show the side quests and how the different characters in this world interact with the main character and uh just a much bigger scope than i expected and man the combat so flashy so stylistic again you mentioned bayonetta clearly some of that in there as well But I think the other thing that this game really reminded me a lot of is potentially near Automata Mm. in that, you know, having that type of combat, very stylized and being a, you know, an action combat game uh, that has these open world elements to it as well. And note that we've brought up or not we you and Chris have brought up three platinum games, you know, platinum. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, just because Bayonetta. near automata and vanquish it's yeah. very yeah. platinum it it, yeah. it has like a platinum feel to it for sure oh, the thing that i was wondering with how much attention sony is giving this game is i was looking up i don't know if you know anything else colin is is this a potential situation where sony really likes what they're seeing from this game they know they got something good and they might want to buy shift up. If yeah, I would, I would imagine out. shift up is like one of the only logical purchases at this point that they would be able to make or not be able to, but would make. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what the deal is about foreign companies owning South Korean entities. I assume it's not really a problem. They're Japanese, um, you know, Sony, obviously. So they'd be close to home. And yeah, I would see that being a distinct possibility for sure. Yeah, I was happy to see that the release date in April too, not that far away. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm incredibly excited for this game. So many different elements. And I thought it was cool. You know, the the main character has multiple different outfits shown through. All, that's, you know, I'm sure you I like thought, that. Yeah. Uh, oh, I did like that. That was yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. See the, you know, the different look characteristics of all these different outfits. Let's be clear. Mm. <laughs> they know what they're doing. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. from oh, like yeah. shot three. It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They the know game. what they're doing. Go ahead. They know Go what on. they're doing. Yeah. I'm whatever. I'm totally fine. I like it. Why not? You know, I don't care. It looks it looks awesome. It looks awesome. I don't I wrote some things about it. It it seemed that at six minutes, it was the longest game was showcased. I think even longer than Death Stranding 2. I'd have to go look at that. And um, for people that are curious what it's about. So I went I went and read the press release. The protagonist name is Eve, quote, a warrior who descends from an off world colony to defeat the Naitibas, humanity's enemy that suddenly emerged on Earth. The Naitibas, I don't know how to say that, appear to be attacking from the human race at the will of a higher entity composed of Alpha and an Elder, but no one knows about their origin, end quote. Other characters include an Earth-born character named Adam, so Adam and Eve, and Lily, which is that younger girl or that young-looking girl that upgrades your weapons. The Mm. setting is a city called Zion, which is a human city, quote, connected to a semi-open world region called the Wasteland and the Great Desert, which harbor many secrets, end quote. The point of the game is to acquire so-called hypercells, quote, to turn Zion back to its original glory, end quote. Um, and I just biblical, wrote a couple other. I'm sorry. No, this is some biblical themes there. Yeah, definitely. Ad, Adam, Eve, and Lily. That's kind of interesting. So, really clean UI. I love the dotted enemy. Um, you know, like how they have the enemy bars, but they're just dots, like three dots on top of each other. Let's just little things like that really look beautiful. I am stoked. Yeah, to oh, play yeah. Stellar Blade. Shout out to Stellar Blade. All right. What do we have next? Sonic. Yeah. Sonic Cross Shadow Generations comes autumn 2024, fall 2024 to PS4 and PS5. It makes Shadow playable in the Sonic team developed 2011 PS3 game Sonic Generations. I wrote in the notes here, way to bring the entire mood down. <laughs> but I guess they had to get this out there. This was rumored to be coming. Any interest in this? I never actually played Sonic Generations. So I have Sonic Heroes was the last Sonic game I played a long time ago. Any interest? Uh, missed opportunity to not include Sonichu. I think that would have been a lot more interesting. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
Yeah. But... Very, very brave of them to name it Sonic X Shadow. Um, mm. I think they're going to find very quickly that that's not a fantastic search term. Oh, my. Oh, boy. Well, fair enough. <laughs> All right. So that's number three. Number four was MiHoYo's Zenless Zone Zero. I was very curious, Dustin, what you thought of this. This game has been announced for a while, but it's only it was only announced for PC and phones. And this is the first console reveal. It's coming later this year, though, at a specific unknown date. It's described as, quote, a brand new urban fantasy action RPG in which contemporary civilization has been destroyed by a supernatural disaster known as the Hollows. New Eridu, the last urban civilization that survived the apocalypse, it sounds just like Stellar Blade, managed to thrive by acquiring the technology to extract valuable resources out of the hollows. However, there are perilous monsters roaming within the hollows, and only a special kind of people who contain resistance to hollow corruption called agents are able to go inside. Players in the game will take on the role of a proxy, a professional who can guide agents in, the, in their exploration of the hollows. Any interest in, in to you with this, Dustin? I got to be honest, when I saw this initially, I thought it was that other new game they released last year. Uh, Honkai Honkai Star, Rail? Star Rail. Yeah, and man, they're really just cranking these games out now. And yeah, the setting is different in all of them. But I just when I see this now, I think, man, they've kind of just figured out a formula for uh, stylish anime girls and they just put them in different settings with different gameplay. It feels a little cookie cutter to me but i i have i tried both genshin impact and honkai star rail never could really get into them so i assume that will be the same for this but i'm sure this game is just gonna sell uh not sell copies but sell microtransactions out the ass so i'm sure sony's very happy to be partnered with it yeah it's a big deal to have everyone like i think that's a low-key big exclusive to, to get yeah. hold of yeah and uh let's see any more information here about this combat blends accessibility with depth quote the game's action mechanics are designed to be intuitive allowing players new to action games to easily grasp the basics while also offering layers of strategic death for more experienced gamers end quote important to note this is a gotcha yeah yeah yeah, yeah. all right this is obviously not something you're gonna play right chris <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> okay Oh, that leaves us to number five, Foam Stars. Any that's uh, imminent on PS Plus. Any final thoughts on this game? They did release season one details for the support of it. They did reiterate that it's coming to PS Plus, so you don't have to buy it if you have a PS Plus subscription. I'm certainly not going to play it, but it looks fine. I, I'm I am curious to see if anyone if it picks up or not. I doubt it will, but yeah, yeah. I will download it. I will check it out. Uh, I'm not super interested in it like uh, i'm not counting down the days till it's out but if it's free on playstation plus i i like splatoon a lot so why not give it a shot so i'll definitely have something to say about it on the show when the time comes okay number six was dave the diver this game came micah played it extensively to switch and to pc in 2023 from developer mint rocket it's coming to ps4 and ps5 this april although it hasn't been specifically dated yet and they also announced godzilla related dlc which is strange coming in may i think i will check this out micah recommended it to me she said i would probably like it so i will check out david the diver when it comes out any thoughts on that I love uh, the Godzilla thing, man. I, I saw Godzilla minus one and loved it. So I'm in yeah. that mindset that Godzilla rules. So <laughs> when I saw that, I've already been interested in checking out this game at some point, but so many other stuff. I didn't want to start it and not be able to really play it. But I think I'll just wait until it's available with that Godzilla stuff so I can just play that when it's available because it it looked really fun and cute. And that's really funny to me with it being <laughs> Godzilla. So. Yeah. Do you I, make uh, him sushi? Because that's the whole goal, right? Is that you go out and you go in the ocean and you get stuff for your sushi restaurant. Right. So that's how I understand it. I'm hoping that you get to serve Godzilla at your what sushi do you, what restaurant. Do you mean? Oh, like, like you, you kill him. And you serve him. Yeah. Kill the kill the Godzilla. That's the action. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> you kill Godzilla. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I I don't know, man. Like I. I <sighs> I, I Dave the Diver is a game that I have on my radar for various reasons because I, I do think it's like one of those rare games. It's like it is cute and I, I do like the idea of it. I also just like the look of it a lot. 
And then I see something like, oh, Godzilla's coming to Dave the Diver, and I immediately I feel deflated. Not because I don't oh. like Godzilla, but just because I feel like we're in this territory now where it's like <sighs> Jimmy Neutron coming to Horizon Forbidden West. And I'm like, I don't Yeah, it doesn't really make know. any sense. I just don't know what the fuck is going on now where like everything's supposed to everything is supposed to be everything everything goes with everything. It, it's just kind of, I don't know. I don't know enough about Dave the Diver, though, to know whether or not that's even remotely, uh, like, stylistically or tonally, like, fucked. Like, I, I just don't, I don't know. So maybe maybe they find a way to make it work. I'm sure it'll be fun. I'm sure it'll be, like, a little novelty. But, like, it reminded me that we're living in this weird kind of um, crossover culture where nothing is really surprising anymore. Because I saw it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. Why not? Why not have Godzilla in this? And why not have fucking... Martin Luther King in Fortnite or whatever. Like I don't know. I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what we're gonna be. I don't. I don't know what ne- what is next at this point. Maybe Didn't that was. Maybe that, that was his dream. Was to go. Wasn't into there a thing where you could watch clips of yeah, so, Martin Luther so, King? So, oh, that's so, right. That's right. So in on, Fortnite. Yeah, yeah. On Martin Luther King. <laughs> we day, reported on that. Yeah. On Martin Luther King Day, I think they had like a, a they had his speeches broadcast in Fortnite, but then they they had in the emotes enabled, and there there were people like doing whip emojis, and so they had to. <laughs> It's that's really right. Fucking, yeah, that's it's, so it's, awful. Oh my it's god, re- it's heinous, but it's also maybe you de- can't maybe, do anything uh, nice for video game players. No, 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 you definitely, you definitely can't. Also, don't just don't don't put civil rights speeches in Fortnite. Maybe. Yeah, that's Wild the idea. meta the metaverse of all metaverses. So Martin Luther King is in there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> oh god, <sighs> and maybe he'll be released one day. Okay, number seven is v rising now i've seen this name before but i didn't know anything about it and i went and looked it up are you guys familiar with this game at all i knew it was in early access on pc but that's about it so it comes from a studio in sweden called stunlock and level infinite which is tencent is publishing it and they own actually a majority share of this team stunlock they've never released a console game before this they released pc and and phone MOBAs. Uh, their big game is called Battle Right, actually. But this game, V Rising, in early access on PC has sold more than 3 million copies and can be played alone or with someone or versus someone else. So it's described like this in the press release, quote, become the ruler of the night in V Rising, a solo or co-op vampire experience that combines the best of survival and action RPGs. In the signature survival style, you will climb your way from the bottom of the food chain all the way to the top through grit, cleverness, and force of will, unquote. So the point is basically that you're continuously drinking blood as you get stronger and stronger and you drink blood of those that you want to absorb their skills. So like uh, quote, drink warrior blood to become more durable and deflect hits, drink rogue blood to increase your mobility and adopt hit and run tactics. There are six different distinct worlds in the game and there's a day night cycle and you have to kind of avoid the daylight and create a castle that you kind of exist in and then protect from enemies as well. So it seems like a very interesting and dynamic game. It might be a little too complicated for me. But I wanted to note all that. Dustin, are you interested in V Rising? When I saw it initially at this uh, state of play, I was like, man, this looks like Diablo in a lot of ways with its viewpoint and the way that the combat works. But I feel like combining Diablo with a survival game initially doesn't make sense. But when I see this play out, I'm like, you know, making your own little castle, that might be kind of fun. Maybe get some. You have like your vampire servants that protect it and you can kind of build out the different rooms and stuff like that. And I like the the blood, you know, drinking specific blood is what fuels the RPG mechanics. It sounds kind of cool. So maybe I'm going to have to check and see what the the state of this is on PC. So then I could just check it out sooner because yeah. I think that would be the type of game that I would want to. I, I play Diablo on PC and other crafting games. So, yeah, maybe I'll just check it out there. Yeah, it definitely. I remember still, like when it came up, I was like, this looks kind of cool. And then I looked more into the gameplay. and I was like, oh, this looks more like Diablo. Like, I don't know, maybe. But then I thought about like, dude, survival, like survival game mechanics and vampires, I feel like makes a lot of sense. And I'm kind of surprised. I don't know. That's like a really good idea. I don't know if this is necessarily the format that I would want to experience it in. I don't know if I don't know if necessarily an isometric Diablo style RPG is is the, the way that I would want to experience that. But that's a I don't know. That's a weird marriage of um iconography and and genres that i feel like would work really really well together and i'm kind of shocked that i haven't really seen much of it all right next up number eight would be silent hill the short message we already talked about that so that's out now and you can enjoy that if you want so we'll get right into silent hill 2 which is number nine 
And obviously Silent Hill 2 remake of a PlayStation 2 game that came out just weeks after 9-11 early in the PS2's life cycle. It's being made by Bloober Team and there's no confirmation in what year it's even coming out, if it's going to come out later this year or perhaps next year. So this seems to be from what I've been seeing the most controversial of the games shown. And Bradley Brave wrote in said, hey, CDC, thoughts on Silent Hill 2? I'm seeing a lot of people talking about how bad the trailer looks, but I personally think it looks sick. Is this anti-Konami and Bloober bias or am I missing something? Side note, have any of you checked out Short Message yet or are planning on it? Already talked about that badly, Brave, but let's get into Silent Hill 2. Chris, is, is, it, ba- is it as bad as people are making it out to be? <sighs> there are parts of it that I think are significantly worse than they should be. But I do. Th- I don't think any. I don't think anything that's wrong with it isn't something that could be a couldn't be addressed. I guess my my main takeaway from it is that it sounds really budget, like and it didn't look particularly gr- like triple A. Like I, I don't know that I don't know if you guys found this problem too. But when he was firing the guns, it sounded fucking laughable. Oh like, no, I didn't notice gun- that. When those gunshots went off, it sounded like. It sounded like someone's like snapping their finger. Like, I couldn't be- I could not believe how bad the, the sound effects were. But I don't know. I, I really want. I'm really rooting for Silent Hill because I feel like they just don't get a break. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like they had like their one real shot with Kojima squashed by Konami. And then they they just and that was after a long history of of kind of paltry. Like, what was ho- was Homecoming? The one on PS3 that was just kind of like, yeah. I, so I, I want this to be good and there are aspects of it that I'm like I don't think it's a bad thing that it looks because I saw some people complaining about like well why are they focusing on why why is there a combat trailer like why are they focusing on the combat it's like well I mean that the, combat in Silent Hill isn't it was like notoriously terrible not necessarily that it had to be improved but I think it I think it does make sense for them to want to highlight maybe how that's changed in a way that might be a little bit more approachable or a little bit more like contemporary. I don't think that's really a problem. I just think the visuals and the sound design just look a little bit too. I don't know. It feels like very, very early alpha almost. And that's a little concerning because I don't know how much is going to change. Like the original Silent Hill looks really fucking grimy and dirty. And I feel like this game looks like really clean in comparison. Um, so there might be some art design that's lost in translation, but I don't know. I, I'm I'm hopeful, but it's easily like of the stuff that I'm interested in that was shown at the state of play. This is easily the most disappointed I was with something. What do you think? Yeah, awesome. I, I feel like the writing has been on the walls and this has just confirmed even more that the skepticism around Bloober team making this game was warranted. And uh, man, I, I'm on the PlayStation YouTube channel and I'm just looking at the comments and it's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Konami, for making this indie game. Uh, I feel like Konami looked at Resident Evil remakes and said, we could do that for less. And yeah, uh, yeah. I can see that. I mean, when I see the him with the bat or whatever it is hitting the monsters, it just doesn't. It's one of those things where I'm not smart enough to I don't know a ton about game animation. I can't tell you why it looks bad, but it does not look good for sure. And Chris, you mentioned the gun sounds too, that I just, uh, yeah, I I think I kind of agree too, that I don't, so I've not fully played. I checked out a little bit of Silent Hill two last year when I got it on PlayStation two and I, I ended up getting away from it, but I know for sure it's not a game about combat really. So yeah, and yeah, it's true that there's probably a lot to improve on from the combat, but making that making the combat reveal trailer at the very least speaks to yeah. a misunderstanding about what people want. Yeah, from this yeah, game. I think that's I think that's valid. It, it does no favors for this game that you can look at Dead Space remake and Resident Evil 4 remake and just compare the two and just see how vastly different every level of quality is. Um. And like I said, like, I don't know, it could be, I don't know how early this is necessarily. Like, I I do think, I do think what we saw isn't something that couldn't be made into something that's great. You know what I mean? Like, it it looked like it's, it just needs a lot of tweaking and, and maybe some, I don't know, some, maybe, I don't know if it's ray tracing or, or, or or some HDR or, 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 or whatever, but like something about it is 
So it looks it looks rough. And I do think the sentiment about it is worse because the short message is also terrible. Like, I don't and think that helps it at all. that streaming game or whatever. Yeah. that. Yeah. So, like, I think it's uh, there's they the haven't really was that, was, that was called the awakening, awakening or uh, they th- they haven't done enough to really earn enough goodwill for people to treat this charitably, you know, um, I don't know. It, it, it looks rough. And if yeah. I had, if I were if I were a betting man, I don't think we're going to get a level uh, Resident Evil Four or uh, Dead Space remake level of quality out of this. Um, and that's disappointing. Uh, I personally don't think it looks that bad. Like I I just think it looks maybe last gen, but it doesn't. Right. Yeah, it doesn't look very modern, which is a little surprising. But maybe not from def- considering they're probably making it pretty cheap. And this gets into my whole concern with Konami is just. Why are you doing it like this? You don't have to do it like this. Find really good partners. Why is it so there are people there are there are studios that would fall all over themselves to make Silent Hill or yeah. Castlevania or Contra or whatever. It's like you don't have to go find these bootleg ass operations that aren't capable of do of exceeding or meeting or exceeding triple a standard of in this case a third person horror game so i just i just don't understand what what the purpose of of konami refusing to spend money and if you're not going to come back properly then just don't come back right yeah it's too competitive like Like, what are you doing you know (laughs) frankly speaking they're just not a good steward for the things that they own not at all that's why i think that's why I think one of the few things that Sony could do that would make sense would be to extract those IP, you know, like the new Ko- Kojima game, the Fizzant or whatever, which we'll talk about later, should be a Metal Gear game. By yeah. all rights, that should just be a Metal Gear game. And yeah. you should just do the right thing and license it. You don't have to sell it. But but license it out. Yeah. Here's a little interesting statistic about the potential of this game. Is. With the exception of Death Stranding 2, it has by far the most views of any trailer from Fizzant. No, no. Um, Silent Hill 2. Oh, oh Death yeah, Stranding yeah, yeah. 2 has 851,000 views as of now. This is less than a day. Silent Hill 2 is 626,000, and then it falls all the way down to the, the low 300s for the next video. So, like, they have a captive audience that wants this to be good and wants to buy this and wants to play this. And I don't, you're, you, I think you're too hopeful to say, like, there's, there's something there. They wouldn't show this if they were going to do anything major to it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, yeah, you're right. It's it's probably too much hope, but I do I, think yeah. What's what the what, point I, what I really what I really mean to say is, there's nothing about it that couldn't be made better in the hands of a team that cared, or in the Certainly. hands of a publisher that cared. You know what I mean? Like that's a completely suitable like alpha build. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, I I don't know. And it's, it's split I'm, down I'm the middle on thumbs up and thumbs down. I, I'll be very curious to see how this. Uh, I I feel like this game might come out this fall, and I think that they just don't know yet if it will or not. I mean, they seem to not really want to put, I mean, look at Stellar Blade. They put a date on it three months from now. So maybe that's their whole MO moving forward, which I'm fine with if that's the way they're going to be consistent. But let's get into the good stuff here. I'm sick of speaking of Silent Hill 2. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Konami, you fucking dummies. <laughs> Judas is next. Number 10. Yes. This is from Ghost Story and Take Two. This game looks fucking amazing. Now, let's underline and note. I'm deeply biased. Right. I'm friends with Ken Levine. I'm a Bioshock fan through the roof. And frankly, and I just want to put this out there and I don't know anything. I don't. So I don't want anyone to misinterpret me. Are we sure this isn't a Bioshock game? Like, are we very sure that this isn't <laughs> a Bioshock game? It's called, I, I believe it's going to be called Judas. I don't think there's going to be any Bioshock, but are we sure it's not in the same world? The the art and the character design, it's fucking awesome. I mean, what, yeah. when they show the gameplay of them just busting around, I'm like, this is Bioshock. And frankly, mm-hmm. it's time. If we're not going to get it from Cloud Chamber or whatever leak I, I sent out about the Antarctic Bioshock that's real, but maybe will never happen because we've had reporting on it since then that they, they basically have put a pin in it. But who knows? I just feel like I'm not 100% convinced this isn't a Bioshock game. Hmm. And I won't be until I play it and beat it and understand the entire story. Do we think, well, let's, we get to pull up from any thread we want. Dustin, let's go to you first. Judas. 
What do we think? Yeah, it looks amazing. I uh, it's I. <laughs> I like that we got to see gameplay and I think that there I saw some sentiment people that well this is just another Bioshock game. I'm like, yeah. Oh damn. Good. <laughs> because those <laughs> games it. are awesome. So I know uh the the thing that this trailer in particular that uh, not that I wasn't interested in the story before, but this made me even more like what going on this beginning part where it shows all the screens and she's addressing the side there's something going on with ai with uh you know the the command prompt stuff on the side i'm thinking about it i'm just so intrigued and i think that i can relate to what chris was saying earlier in that this trailer it i don't i guess i was already so excited i don't know if it moved the needle for me in that it just made me yearn more and it almost felt frustrating where i was like okay here comes a release window if they're right. showing it again now, then they, they, they're they building towards something. Maybe we're going to see 2025, early 2025 or something on a release date. But we didn't get that. So I'm not sure. I just wish I knew the timeline so I could get some of my expectations in check. Am I going to be waiting another two years for this game or is it sooner than we think? I mean, the wish list is out. I don't know what the precedent is for being able to wish list a game on PS5 and what that means for how long it's going to take to release, but something's going on that they are pushing this game because in that interview that you did with Ken, I think he said that he, they wanted to push that out. So developers could talk there. The people on the team could say, Hey, this is what I'm working on because how painful it is when you are years and years and years in development. And anytime someone asks you anything, you just say, I can't talk about it. And I can understand that that would be really frustrating. You dumped years of your life. And you have to keep a secret forever. But this move here definitely feels like, what are we doing here? Is this soon or or, or not? And how soon? Mm -hmm. I think it's soon. I think it's not maybe this year, but within the next little while. It will be over. It is over 10 years since Infinite came out. Wow. It did get DLC. And I saw some people responding to this. And I'll be interested to hear what you have to say about the game, Chris, is just uh. People being like, so Ken Levine uh, shut down Irrational and got rid of all those people to make Bioshock. And I'm like, yeah, you dumb assholes. He made a, a lean team that is affordably making a triple A game with a very lean studio. It is the model for the way mm -hmm. games are going to be made in the future if it's successful. And that people are like, oh, you just could it's just Bioshock. It's like, yeah, it's just Bioshock. <laughs> it's just bioshock yeah it's yeah like it's very... I, I i i just i'm like oh no that's it's just uh another one of the best games ever what are you talking yeah oh no yeah, yeah. I, I don't know like i i do think i get what to, because the initial narrative i don't know if this is necessarily from ken directly or, or like i remember this being the sentiment at the time was that oh we're, we're gonna focus on making smaller games was kind of like the the idea and then for it to take like 10 years and then it's it's Bioshock again. It's like I, I kind of get that level where it's like, OK, well, it's not necessarily accurate. But at the same time, like, am I am I disappointed by that? No, <laughs> now, I have a Bioshock tattoo. I love Bioshock. Um, I loved Bioshock Infinite. I understand that some sentiment around that game has changed over time and people just uh, it's like, oh, but it wasn't as good as like I, I fucking loved it. I loved it. Burial at Sea as well. I'm just super into Bioshock. I like Ken Levine as, as a creative guy. Um, and so I'm basically on board with anything he does. I think the trailer looked great. I'm excited about it. It was nice to see gameplay that was a little bit more um, complete where you could get a little bit more context of what's going on. I love the art style. I love the animation. I love the style of, of what's of what's on stage here. I guess for me, you know, the last time we saw it, it was so mysterious and there wasn't really a lot known about it. And it was kind of cryptic. And in this one. After over a year later, it's very similar. And I guess seeing it, I was surprised to see Judas there at all. Like when Judas, when the Judas thing came up, I was like, oh, shit, what the fuck? I was excited because I thought I was going to get more information, not necessarily about like what the game's about, but at the very least, like like Dustin said, when I could expect it, because I was like, oh, surely if they're if they're talking about it now, it's been a year over. It's been over a year since they've talked about it. Uh, I'm going to know today then. Like when this is when this is planned for and to not get that was a little deflating. 
I wouldn't say it was a disappointing trailer. It's great. Like I just the, some of that combat looked sick. There's like this dash that that this dash backwards that one mm-hmm. th- that the player does in like one shot, and I'm like, this is this is fucking cool. Whatever whatever whatever's going on here. Um, I love I the guess I'm just, I love the char- the character design is just so good. Yeah. yeah, it's beautiful. Like I I love the not I love the stylized animation and and, and just the stylized character design of of Bioshock and. And just and this game as well. It just looks I'm I'm stoked. I'm in day one for this. I just want to know. I just you know, I just I'm excited. I can't help it. Can't wait to hear my audio logs. So Colin, yeah. do you mind? I want to read the PlayStation blog. I don't know if you saw this where that Ken wrote. And I'm trying to remember where it was that he talked about how he wanted to build like new ways to tell stories right narrative narrative, narrative legos, legos. Right? that comes from narrative GDC. legos right okay That's so here's, GDC what, speech. here's what he says he says characters have always been the driving force in every game we've ever made whether fighting beneath the ocean to assassinate andrew ryan or escaping a city in the sky with elizabeth these personalities have always been the heart of our stories but what if you could choose between who to befriend and who to stab in the back with judas we wanted to craft an experience where these decisions and how the story unfolds is up to you because you, as Judas, are the driver of every event in a story with a new cast of characters to get to know and change in ways you haven't experienced before in our games. In Judas, we give you a whole new way to explore the corridors of the Mayflower, a spacefaring city whose citizens are trained to spy on one another and tear each other apart from the slightest offense, where machines control every aspect of business, art and government. The ship's leaders tried to turn you into something you're not, a model citizen, and you sparked a devastating revolution to tear it all down. Do you want to fix what you broke or leave it all to burn? That's a decision only you can make. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, I had the I had some of that written here. I'm glad you got to it just to get people some of the plot out there, specifically because um, we always said where would Bioshock take place next, and it was space was an obvious place for it to go, and. You had your underwater, you had your, you had your sky. So I'm very, very excited about this. I would predict 2025. I don't have any inside information on, on timing. Do I want to be one of the people on the audio logs in the game? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> <clears throat> one of the crazy people you meet. All right. The next two games, we'll take them both 11 and 12 at the same time. They're PSVR 2 games. So Metro Awakening mm-hmm. VR from vertigo vertigo is very good studio that does arizona sunshine so 4a is not involved in this i don't think which is interesting and then the other game we saw was from urban wolf games a D style hack and slash game called legendary tales this is this game comes out imminently on february 8th psvr2 metro game comes out later this year these both look pretty good. Now, I yeah. feel like I'm just full of shit in the sense that I, I'm like, oh, this will be the one that makes me play it. This will be the one that makes me play it. But these games do look pretty awesome. And um, I'm, so I'm, yeah. I'm a, very sure our friends on PSVR Without Parole and others are very excited for the upcoming titles. Did these, uh, did these strike you guys, these PSVR 2 titles? Yeah. yeah. yeah, for, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. No, for me, like, yeah, totally. Like, first of all, I, I know that there was some sentiment online about being disappointed like oh it's a new metro game but like oh it's vr and i i I do understand that that makes perfect sense especially because the metro series is just so highly regarded like everybody really like i still i really still i think this year i really have to get down to finishing exodus it's really it's really bothering me that that's been sitting in my in my backlog for as long as it has but at the same time while i understand that sentiment um i feel like metro and vr makes perfect sense like that is such a great that is that is like a perfect merit. Everything from like the taking the mask off and like all these like tactile things to like checking your watch to like rubbing the you know the the what is it the uh like cleaning your vision like that like it, it there's already kind of a simulated VR feel to Metro when you're playing it as a normal video game. So like I feel like in VR I feel like it'd be awesome. I feel like it's a match made in heaven. Quite frankly, I'm I'm really stoked about it and that. What, what was the what was the D and D one called? It was like it's yeah, tales legendary or, tales. Legendary yeah, tales. legendary tales. I was so I love physics based VR. I loved Boneworks, and the second I saw him throw a skeleton onto a table, grab it by the throat, and punching it in the head, yeah. I was like, this is, this is this is like I was like I've totally I, like I will I, I the, Metro, admittedly, 
a little intimidating. You know, I haven't really sure. finished a Metro yeah. game before. So, like, that's a game that, like, I'm sure, like, I'll probably play and I, I might bitch out at. But, like, I'm absolutely playing this the second it comes out. Whatever the, the Legendary Tales. It looks ridiculous. I can I can grab a <laughs> skeleton by the neck and it, punch it does, him in the head. That I love specific it. scene did make me laugh. I And I did do the by God thing when I saw yeah. it. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, it's just so. it's 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 too good. It reminds me of Boneworks where you could, like, beat people up and shove them in a locker and then lock them in with, like, a crowbar. It's like there's something... I love interactive a VR, I think, should exist to really transport you into a virtual world where, where if you think of something, it should work, you know, and uh, Boneworks is really the only game that I've played. And Half-Life Alex is a lot more AAA, but a lot less, a lot less interactive where I, I felt like, oh, if oh, this is a good idea. Can I do that? Can I throw this skeleton into into a table and break it in half? Oh, I can. And it works. That's cool. Like there's something that simulated reality aspect of VR, I think, is always going to be where it shines. Um, you can have your little like, you know, um, obviously Beat Saber is great. And, you know, Pistol Whip is cool. It's like fun little arcade games and, you know, rhythm games. I, I get it. But that I think is where my my niche in VR is. It's, it's these it's these physics sandboxes that let you do all this stuff. So like that's a game that I'm really into. And Metro, I think, makes perfect sense. So two for two for me on the, on the VR stuff, which is just not really. Again, it's just not a common thing for me to feel when I see VR games at a state of play, let alone anywhere else. So I'm props to them for doing that. It's, it's very, it's a very rare. We're in rarefied air where I'm interested in two VR games at once. Yeah, it, we'll see when push comes to shove if I get into it at all. Anything left to say on this, Dustin? Yeah. So as far as Metro, uh, I have to echo what you said, Chris, just because that's immediately what I thought is that. Metro is such an immersive game. You talked about the mask coming on on and off, cleaning it like all of those things are going to lend perfectly, hopefully to to VR, just being in that immersive environment. But for better or for worse, in that this game is going to make me shit my pants, most likely when I play it, because just thinking about, man, the OLED screen on the PSVR 2, how dark it's going to feel. It's uh, it's pretty exciting. I'm pretty interested I will say that I think that they should have shown Legendary Tales first and then the Metro game because I do agree, <laughs> it was yeah. immediately felt a little like, oh, what's this? Because clearly they're two very different games going for a different thing. But there was clearly a downgrade in visual presentation where you're like, what is this? Oh, and then you realize how cool it looks. The thing that looking at the PlayStation blog, this Legendary Tales game, the there's multiplayer in it. And that sounds really fun to me where <laughs> yeah, it's practically going to be like, like not a comedy game, but there's going to be so many hilarious moments where you're, you know, grabbing a skeleton and, and throwing at your friend and he's slashing, you know, there's just it feels like a recipe for those crazy stories where it's like, dude, we were yeah. playing this game and we were fighting these skeletons and then he threw a bomb and it blew up. You know what I mean? That yeah. kind of aspect. So do the sounds, combat uh, in it. The combat cool. in it looked really fucking cool too. Like, like a, he had like a shield and he like parried like a fireball back. Yeah, and I'm like, this is fucking sick. This looks awesome. Like, I, yeah, I'm, I'm totally, yeah, I'm actually these. Honestly, I, I was, I was more interested in these than I was in some of the traditional games that we were shown, which is just you know, again, high praise for the for both of those teams making cool shit. I saw him raise Mjolnir at the end, and mm. that to me was like, that's fucking so sick <laughs> all right yeah give me mjolnir in vr hell yeah yeah and in the playstation blog it's running at a native 90 fps so it doesn't use reprojection which for the the vr nerds that's a, a big deal it's going to be very smooth and crispy so good, this good. one isn't too far away right what would we say the release date february was? 8th february right? 8th yeah oh sick. Have it as february nice. 8th. yeah the other game the metro game undated 2024 undated okay and these are obviously on I think people were confused. It's like, I don't think PSVR gets almost any exclusive games anymore unless Sony is funding them. So, because the yeah. uh, the user base is so small. Small, S-M-O-L. All right. Number 13 would be Dragon's Dogma 2 coming March 22nd. Keep this 30 frames away from me. I'm not playing this. Dustin, Dragon's Dogma 2. People are very stoked about it. Again, coming from Capcom very soon. Are you interested? I am interested, but as you say, the 30 FPS on console, uh, this is going to be a PC game if I do end up playing it. I will say in terms of the 30 FPS stuff, at least when I was looking at this game, I thought at least it 
justifies. It looked really beautiful, the different animations, the different abilities and stuff. It looks amazing. So I kind of understand the 30 FPS aspect from that angle, though, for an action combat game like this. At this point, I I really would rather not play a game like that in 30 FPS. So definitely more on the PC front for me. I just I haven't figured out yet because I'm getting mixed responses that I started playing the first one on Steam Deck and I'm I kind of like it and kind of don't. And that's not closing me off from playing the sequel, but I just don't know how important it is that I play the first one before the second one. So feel free to let me know your opinion on it. Do I have to play the original or do I just need to play enough to get it? I don't know. Dragon's Dogma 2, are you interested in this, Chris? I am, but I, uh, to somewhat echo what he's what Dustin was talking about, like I, I feel like a bit of a poser. Like I feel like I have to play. I, I, I feel weirdly compelled like to play the first one. I have it. It's installed. I just haven't really had the time to really sink. I, I haven't even had like a, a long stretch of time to really sit and play a game really so like and and that's a game that i feel like i would want that with um skyrim survival mode is like really easy for me because i I, you know i've I've played this already i could i could put in like 20 minutes get some progress and and do that but like with a new experience like this i want to be locked in and i don't really have that time right now so i don't know it's definitely on my list because i do think it's i do think it's going to be one of these big games that people really should play but if i do play it it's going to be on pc I, i can't do 30 frames like no 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 chance. Uh, it's good on Steam Deck, Chris. I was uh, it's not a locked 90 frames, but with the OLED, since you can do 90 frames, a lot of the times it is. And it's pretty dang cool. Uh, yeah. To play it at that high frame rate on a handheld. Maybe yeah, I'll get to I it. I haven't I haven't installed, but uh, on my Steam Deck, I just I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, play it on PS5 Pro when that comes. Oh. But a game that comes out the same day. So Dragon's Dogma 2, March 22nd, Rise of the Ronin. March 22nd. This is a second party game with PlayStation Studios branding. So again, the differentiation between this Stellar Blade Helldivers and Untold Dawn, I'm, I'm a little confused, but Rise of the Ronin, uh, Team Ninja, Koei Tecmo. So here's the question. Not a Soulsborne? After all? I mean, I looked at it. I, I got to be honest with you, and I don't want to, I don't... Y- I don't usually like just shrug off games as this easily, but when I heard about this game and saw who was making it and all that, I'm like, I'm not playing this game. And then like, like just in my mind, I'm like, it's not for me. Like I'm not going to, it's just not for me. I, I have no interest in it at all. And then I saw it and I'm like, I don't think this is what it seems. And I did read some of the stuff they have to say about it. They're kind of vague about it, but I don't know. Am I crazy? Dustin, this doesn't look like a Soulsborne game to me at all. I mean, uh, it, it's way too quick and there's like it's so vertical and I don't know it doesn't it doesn't have like the prerequisite heaviness and like heft and graft of of a Bloodborne or something from my my more layman perspective so I'm actually much more open minded about this game now especially knowing March 22nd Dragon's Dogma I'm not going to be playing that so I should be open at this time and maybe I will check this out but I'm wondering what you think Yeah, I certainly was really impressed by the verticality and the the fluidness of of moving around and the glider looks super fun in terms of it being a souls like the the thing that I'm wondering is that uh, there's so many elements that people define what a souls like is some people just if a game is hard, they'll call it a, a souls like but I wonder if it will have this element of you need to be careful no matter what even a basic mob enemy if you're not careful or paying attention can kill you and i I didn't get that vibe from it from that's a that's a great way of putting it and i personally didn't get it looks like ghost of tsushima i mean yeah yeah a lot yeah i don't know i mean that's one of those things we're gonna have to wait and find out i know a lot of people have been comparing it to sekiro but i think that's purely in terms of some of its aesthetic and the fact that it does have an emphasis on blocking. But my main concern is that this will follow in line with the other Koei Tecmo games of the last few years with Neo and Neo 2. And I think Stranger of Paradise also had this where it's just loot, constant loot, constantly getting new stuff, constantly upgrading stuff. And I like that in games, but I just remember the chore in playing Neo that it's like, man, I picked up 12 swords 
I got to figure out which one and then sell the rest of them. And I have to do this every time I stop just was so annoying to me. So I'm hoping that even though there are multiple weapons, it's not constantly a loot based game where I'm just getting new stuff and all these different different things. It's that's annoying to me. That would potentially kill it for me. But I'm really curious mostly about the open world aspect. And as I mentioned, the the verticality to some degree as well looks really cool. It almost kind of reminded me of Spider-Man where it has the different points that you can kind of grapple onto and then glide off of. To your point, Sinatra at the opera wrote in, said, what's up, itty bitty, t- itty bitty slitty committee. Nice. After seeing the state of play trailer for Rise of the Ronin, I can say I'm definitely intrigued. This is due in no small part to its heavy and some may say shameless inspiration drawn from Sekiro. Shadows died twice, like you said. My favorite game of the last five years. After Lives of P was such a successful homage to Bloodborne, I have high hopes that Rise of the Ronin will be a similarly successful Sekiro facsimile. Colin, as much as you hate the myriad Soulsborne likes, I feel like we should take a second to give it up to From Software for creating three similar yet distinctive game styles, Souls, Bloodborne, and Sekiro in a mere decade that have inspired so many developer attempts, some not so successful, to capture the same magic that have enchanted the likes of myself and Dustin. What's it, what do you say? I, I like your letter, but I just, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm confused, right? Because I just don't, I went to the PlayStation blog post. Let me give you an example. I went to the PlayStation blog post and it says fighting like a Ronin. A variety of weapons are available for battling your enemies. In addition to Team Ninja's signature sh- sword play, you can wield Japanese spears and ranged firearms, including foreign pistols. So what signature sword play? What does that mean? Ninja Gaiden or Neo or Wo Long or Stranger of Paradise? Like, I don't even really know what they're talking about. I, I'm, I need I need more specificity because I'm kind of not knowing if this is for me or not like and and people seem to see see such an obvious Sekiro thing and I'm like I don't see it at all so yeah I, I, but I didn't really play see it, it so. and th- there's a grapple hook in it but that's about that's about it really like I, I don't and and aside from the aesthetics I like I, I get it this to me I don't know this struck me infinitely more like a Ghost of Tsushima inspired game than than really anything else like everything from you know falling I mean granted the glider is unique to Rise of the Ronin, Ghost of Tsushima doesn't have a glider or anything like that, but like falling off the glider onto a horse. Yeah, that's like just that, right. Changing, changing the stances mid combat. Like it, it just struck me as it, it strikes me more influenced by Ghost of Tsushima than any of the Soulsborne games. I, I think I think I don't know. I, I, I don't really see. Granted, I have very limited experience with Soulsborne's in, in comparison to, you know, Dustin, especially. But like I just didn't really get that much of a vibe from it watching the gameplay. Now, it could be that the game plays like that. You really don't really have any idea until you play it. But, you know, when you when you see Lies of P, even just in motion, you know, like, oh, you know, that's a that's a that's, you know, from software. That's a from software style game just by looking at it, by the way, the character moves around and the way it dodges. This gave me more of like a Ghost of Tsushima Assassin's Mm -hmm. Creed feel where like it feels a little bit more casual which is why that signature sword play line is a little confusing because if it's their signature sword play that would kind of indicate a lot more of a hardcore experience but the vibes from the video that the video that we're seeing is is it just looks a lot more casual than i feel like they're right how do you meld all that together that's my confusion too because that was the big thing to me uh, Chris that sent me off too is that the the whore like the flying to the hook shot to the horse I'm like so that happens in a game where I'm gonna get killed by like the most basic enemy it doesn't even make it it just doesn't even really vibe in some sense like it feels inherently ungrounded which was kind of what was exciting about it I don't know I don't I don't know how to read it I don't know I think the Sekiro comparison comes from what I'm looking at the trailer and I'm just ba- making assumptions based on the UI is that Sekiro is all about blocking and attacking to lower your enemy's health when they have lower health their poise meter is easier to break and then you can break their poise and get a ton of damage in that's what it seems like this is doing here so it's going to be a game about the dance between you and whoever you're fighting to make sure that you're blocking at the right times trying to attack to lower the poise to eventually do crazy damage in terms of their signature style would imagine that a lot of it comes down to the different sword stances which again isn't unique to them exclusively but that's yeah because that's something that Sekiro doesn't have at all there's no sword stances at all and there's no changing weapons or anything like that but it does have that I, I guess in some ways you could put it like how 
rhythmic is the flow of combat going to be? How much are you going to be reading your enemy, making sure you're blocking, doing the precise parries in order to tire them down in order, in order to do that big damage? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I just get I, I don't know. looking at it. I get more of a casual read. Like, I, it just feels like more of an action based open world like I, I the the video is full of this the, the player just executing these <laughs> these these uh standard mobs and i get that that's to show the flashiness of it but it it does read to me like more of like an assassin's creed style um even if it's not explicitly like oh it's, i'm not saying it's going to be exactly like that but i feel like it maybe in boss battles it'll be really difficult but like i just don't imagine that traversing the it's not going to be Elden Ring difficult when you're just moving throughout the throughout the map, and oh, a single mob can kill you if they just get a right strike on you. I, I don't. I think it will be. I'm not seeing that. Or maybe. I, I, I mean, it, it very well could be. It just doesn't. The videos that they're showing of the game don't feel that way. Sure, I would agree with you, as uh, Chris. Just from my perspective, it seems like it it is more casual. But I don't know if it's not. Then I'm not going to play it. If it is, if it's more Ghost of Tsushima than Neo or Sekiro or something, then I'll I'll play it. But if it's if we find out or if there, there's a demo and they're like, this is a hardcore bash your fucking face through a wall game. I'm like, all right, I'm not going to play it like I originally thought. But I guess what uh, I'm saying is from the trailer we saw and from the footage we saw, I was like, oh, this actually opened my mind to it because I just. For my own personal taste, it kind of written it off. So yeah. all right, rise I'm of the Ronin. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I'm de- well, I, was, I was saying I'm definitely going to play it regardless. I think it's got a grappling hook. Indeed. March 22nd. Same day as Dragon's Dog. My people have choices to make. Yeah. All right, number 15, the rumored Until Dawn PS5 and PC version 2024 done by Ballistic Moon. So Ballistic Moon is a is a British studio that's made up of people that used to work at Cygnosis and Supermassive and certain other studios. And I'm pretty sure. So you, I don't know if you guys remember leaks. There was leaks that indicating that um, Ballistic Moon was working on a project called Project Bates. And I think this is it. I think we were assuming that it was going to be something something new, but I think this is the game. And I'm wondering what you guys think of this, because I find it fairly interesting that they've gone out of their way to do a lot more to it than I assumed they would. Adam Welby wrote in about this in Greetings, Sacred Swifties. The state of play was arguably one of the best they've ever had, and there was a follow up to one of the games on the PlayStation blog I'd love to talk about until dawn. As a plat holder for the original, I absolutely adore the game. And from what I'm reading, this seems to be much closer to a technical remake than a remaster. Overhauled animations, new explorable sections in the lore, new camera angles, new music from legendary horror composer Mark Corvin, whose work includes The Witch and The Lighthouse, and all of it made by hand in Unreal 5. This is far from an AI-generated upscale cash grab. And I can't wait to head to that cabin in the woods again with Mr. Robot and Hayden Panettiere. While I'm sure this game's announcement will be met with some pessimism, the Y crowd, it has been nearly nine years since the game came out. No doubt there is a whole new player base to check it out. And many who have been too young when it first came out or never got around to it. Do you guys agree that there is value in putting this out now? And we'll be checking it out when it re- releases later this year. Thanks. And I can't wait to see you fellas in New York. My personal opinion on this, Dustin, is that we've we, we had rumors of it. The film was announced a few weeks ago. This seemed to make sense. It's like, OK, they want to get something out to take advantage of it. But it does seem to be a remake in some substantial ways from many of the people that did the original game. And it's important to note there's rumors. Actually, I was just reading the, um, the rumor, the gaming rumor Reddit today. And there are, there's speculation that like, and, and I've said this before that something happened. Like, it seems like something happened with Supermassive and Sony where maybe they were shopping. Ga- it, it, the, the speculation is that they were shopping things around and kind of like Sony wasn't interested in kind of playing their game anymore. And I found it interesting that they've basically just taken this IP, taken the original game, no mention of Supermassive anywhere, and has and have given it to a new team to work on. I just think that the unfortunate thing is that I think we were all hoping Ballistic Moon was going to be making something new, and now that's clearly not the case. So what do you think? Yeah, you, the term uh, you say, is it a remake? In the PlayStation blog, they use the term rebuilt in unreal engine five and it definitely looks very impressive and i think that this does have a lot to do with the movie we talked about this when the leak came out but they even in the playstation blog post the the last part they're like stay tuned for more info on the upcoming adaptation of until dawn and this comes back to our favorite word the synergy having the product ready to go when people see the movie 
have it on, have it ready to go. And the other thing, too, that I wonder if this is a case where Sony wants to eventually make Until Dawn 2 and they are kind of trying this out and and seeing how it goes. And that would be way more interesting to me right now uh, rather than an Until Dawn remake. But I'm kind of... (laughs) I'm kind of mixed on this. I think the work that they're doing looks really good. The enhancements I can, I can see it's not just a a cheap remaster, but at the same time, I so much of that until Dawn experience comes down to the first time I played it. It was a really memorable, like memorable playthrough where at the time, I think uh, this was when like right after I got married and I, I didn't, I wasn't able to buy it. So we got it from Redbox. And we rented it for two days and Holly and I played the whole thing in two or three sittings. It was super memorable. Like I can remember who lived, who died, what exactly happened. And I just don't know if it would be the same if I played it again. I'm kind of okay with my canon experience, but I know a lot of people like the write in mentions it's one of their favorite games. And so being able to experience again, I'm sure is going to be pretty exciting for a lot of those people. Any thoughts here, Chris, that you want to share until Dawn intrigued by it? I actually don't really remember the story very well anymore. It's so long ago. You know, like you said, nine years ago, I, I haven't played it since the year it came out. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it looks better than I was expecting. Um, they've done a lot more to it than I anticipated. So that's nice. Um, I wouldn't say it for me moved the needle much. Like I'm, I'm kind of fine. Like Dustin, where like, I don't know. I, I don't know if what what there is left for me to get out of until dawn really this is definitely i feel like more for people who are hardcore about until dawn and want like a newer version of it to go through again or people who again haven't played the original because it has been so long since that game's been really in the spotlight in any in any way shape or form so this is a good option for those people i think it'll sell pretty well or at least at least appreciably i think it's a solid idea to get it out for movie synergy reasons but you know i i can't say it's necessarily something that i'm you know, over the moon about it. And I'll probably, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not really playing it over the ballistic moon about Ooh. it. Mm. That I do think is kind of a, a, that is a little disappointing. Like oh, the, totally. the, the fact that the fact that they're, Oh, this is what they've been doing. It's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It's definitely a bummer. I'm not thrilled about it, but that's okay. I mean, I'll play it when it comes out. We'll see what it is. And keep an open mind about it, I guess. And I'm certainly open minded about the film just based on the performance of PlayStation production so far. So until dawn 2024 PS5 and PC from Ballistic Moon, second party, super massive, totally out of the loop. This is presumably the project Bates that was leaked. And we're back to square one. All right. Finally, 16 and 17. We'll start with 16. Death Stranding 2 now Mm -hmm. titled as rumored on the beach. 2025. Ember's Arcade wrote in, said, hey, gentlemen, Death Stranding 2's newest trailer was an obscure, verbose, and as hilarious as I expected it to be. While it seems that the gameplay will not vary much from the first title, there was some reference to Sam choosing the stick this time around. Perhaps we can expect some more action, which leads to my question. Is more action what you'd want from it to sequel to Death Stranding? Personally, I would be happy with a game entirely built around dragging boxes around. I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's funny, Ember, because I had the same thought when I was playing it that it seemed more action oriented. In fact, I pretty we'd have to go back and listen to the, the, the Death Stranding spoiler cast from 2019, but I'm pretty sure I didn't fight almost anything in the game the entire time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really even understand or like the game, the gunplay when in, in the times you would be able to fuck around with it. So I played the game very, very um, peacefully and passively, which I enjoyed. I'm curious what we think about this, Chris. Let's go to you first. Death Stranding 2 on the beach. Are you excited? Oh, dude, I'm, I'm over. I'm so, I'm so unreasonably stoked for this. I don't know what I was expecting necessarily, uh, because the last trailer that we got for Death Stranding, I felt like was a lot more grounded than this. It was a lot or, or a lot less. Um, I don't know. They did. They showed some new story ideas and some new stuff, but it was all very like, OK, so that's that's death stranding okay cool here we got troy baker joker with a lightning electric guitar you've got a stop motion puppet i I, i'm i'm so i'm so into whatever the hell this is it is so not what i was expecting at all it it was i under no circumstances was i expecting a stop motion puppet to be a part of Death Stranding too. So when so when Ember's Arcade to be like, oh yeah, it was it was exactly as 
crazy as I thought it would be. It's like, this is way crazier than I thought it would be. It was like infinitely more like than I thought it would be. I was actually kind of surprised to see that, um, you know, all of these weird elements are in, are in this game, but then like, we're getting, we're getting deserts, we're getting new terrain, we're getting, you know, presumably the whole world, uh, or you know, it looks like Europe, maybe, or Europe and Africa, or something. Or I don't know. Europe Middle and Africa. I, they said something about Mexico. I think in the trailer. I think. Well, like they said something. Be- they want. They want. I read it as saying they want to do what we, they already had done for Mexico. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe I, I. I don't know, but there's that's how I'm, I read it anyway. The idea of taking the the core of Death Stranding and and you know, you know, really, you know, the the gameplay loop of paying attention to where you're walking and then adding that with different types of terrain as opposed to just like, hey, rocks, grass, marsh. And now you have deserts. Now you have all these different all these different things in addition to potent, uh, potentially more fleshed out gunplay, a, a wild story that I can't even fucking begin to I can't even begin to just like in my head, figure out why any of any of what we're seeing is justified at all. I, I don't, I don't, I don't under fucking stand, but I'm so in, it was so crazy. Uh, I, 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 I don't even know what to say about it really. Cause we, we still, it's still very cryptic despite, even though we've seen so much of this game at this point, I still feel like I have no idea what the fuck I'm in store for. And I love that feeling. I love that. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm over the moon about it. Dustin, should we have connected? Should we have connected? Because you said, uh, I didn't know what I was expecting. You weren't expecting a puppet Alan Wake to be no. uh, <laughs> in the game and Troy Baker with a, a guitar. What I love about the specific weird parts about this game is like, let's say last week we got a leak where someone described this trailer to us. We would say this sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like Troy Baker's character will have a uh, a lame Joker face and he'll pull out his guitar and it'll shoot lightning bolts. And like, you know, everything about it on paper is sounds so dumb. And in a way, it kind of is dumb, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's that that I don't know. Maybe we we are too deep in on the, the Kojima hype. And I'm sure that some people feel that way, but I don't. <laughs> care because i just i love weird stuff and i love how it's like man i haven't seen anything like this and i wouldn't have expected there's things that i would expect from a new death stranding 2 trailer a lot of that was there you know you get the weird you know the weird throat shot of of bb and but there's a but this time there's a ship that flies out of his mouth and that's cool but the story element that intrigued me the most was this the story about bb or or lou and and what happened there's the conversation yeah. where uh norman reedus is uh, sam says that lou's dead but that may not be the case based on his response and i loved that relationship between sam and bb or lou you find out um that's one of the the most beautiful threads of that story and so when when Sam says that that BB is dead, I I audibly gasped. I was like, no, like I I love I loved seeing him them them grow close and and the ending of Death Stranding particularly, and so having that be a plot there, I was like, man, I gotta know what happens to that little baby. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, it's it's just so interesting. I, I know. I know that what you're saying, like how like, oh, you know, people are going to be like, oh, maybe you get you guys are probably just too deep into the Kojima hype train and uh, hype train. And maybe that's true. I do think there is like a level of kind of not a self-fulfilling prophecy, but like a level of like because Kojima has proved himself so many times to be like a really exceptional designer. I think because he's commanded that he's allowed to get away with a lot of pitches that maybe other people would have that wouldn't necessarily get the green light to do. So I don't want to make it out to be like, oh, Kojima is like a one in a million person. I'm sure that there's probably a lot of people who would have come up with the ideas that were this insane or or this out of pocket and and just don't have the industry credibility or, or clout to really justify the asking price of making those things reality. Like, I do think that's real. But at the same time, what we're getting here is just so fucking interesting and objectively cool and just so strange that we're not getting it really anywhere else. And whether that's truly like holistically unique to Kojima or not, it's unique to the industry. And I think, um, 
that really kind of just speaks to me more than anything. It's just like I I I was not expecting that that puppet really fucking threw me for a loop, man. What about like, the gloves? The, the glove mask also. Oh, the glove mask oh. that, that moves and when it lights the cigar, it's like there's so much style here that I I don't know. I'm I can't help but swoon when I see it. Like I I, I get it. And this is coming from somebody like, and by the way, like I, I was getting ready. I was so prepared to make fun of the original Death Stranding. I've told this story a million times, but like I was really looking forward to making fun of that game because I thought it looked ridiculous and dumb. And I ended up, you know, totally understanding it and, and loving it. And um, just this level of uniqueness and strangeness. And you, you can almost imagine yourself in the meeting room where they're talking about like, yeah, and I want I want this to happen. And. If it was anybody else but Kojima saying that, they'd be like, "What are you? Are you you're fucking crazy." It's it's amazing that this trailer is so full of weird stuff that we haven't even mentioned the fact. At the beginning of the trailer, you have George Miller, the director of Mad Max and Babe, cutting yeah. open a weird ink sack that has a person in it. Yeah. Like we haven't even touched on that, you know, because no. there's just so much shit it's, in this. It's so interesting because. There isn't there that funny meme or it's like a screenshot of a guy, one of his people from a documentary where the guy was being asked, like one of the Kojima guys was being like, he was basically saying, like, I thought Hideo was kidding about this, but he was actually serious. And so we did like, that's like basically the mentality is like everything is seems like it's not, he's not serious until he is dead serious. And I agree with you, Chris, that <laughs> sink or swim, like having someone that's just like, we're going to execute on my ideas at the highest level and then we'll see what happens. And like, there is no there is no consideration for anything else. I think is very interesting and yeah. we'll get into it more with Sony in the next game, but I give Sony credit for doing that. Cause I don't think it's, I don't think it, I don't think that stranding was obvious I, to your point. I, I would imagine that when they greenlit that game, they're like, hmm. I think really they wanted Kojima. I mean, I think they probably signed Kojima without even really knowing what was going right. to happen because he was available and they wanted to have that coup. I will say this. And I don't know if you guys picked up on this too, when you were watching it, I got this vibe before they showed gameplay, like real gameplay of the game of, of, of basically it being the same game. When he walks onto that ship, I said to Micah, I was like, oh, shit, like they're going to do it on the water where you're making like deliveries in the ocean or something. And I thought that that, w- that would be pretty boring, probably. But that was where my mind, I have to admit, originally went. I thought they were I thought they were going to show a fundamentally different game for a minute where it's like, oh, you are now floating about from place to place or whatever instead of walking and that's the fundamental change of the game but indeed they really didn't change it fundamentally at all they changed the setting instead of this the mode of game which i think works and that's probably pretty obvious and linear for them to get that going i will say that it's gorgeous i watched it again because the streams are never good looking you have to go and watch it at least for me i don't know if you guys ever have streams and they're like running well but they always look like shit for me so i went and watch the the high res trailer but i'm like this is incredible this game looks inc- i can't believe how good this game looks and yeah. this is the difference between making a game for ps5 and as opposed to porting a game like death stranding was to ps5 and it's yeah that that uh that shot of him where like the moon is taking up the entire mm-hmm. sky it was probably like I love that shit. I guess. So, actually, I was like, oh, man. So much. That's that's actually like part of why I, I don't, I'm just I'm a space fucking I'm a space nerd. You know, like I love yeah, that shit too. specifically. It's why I like it's why I like even the boring parts of Starfield, because just like meandering on this wasteland with this fucking amazing sky. It's just like I, I, I do like that. And to see it in Death Stranding, a game all about walking. <laughs> it's just I don't know, man. I, I that shot specifically stuck out to me. And the one where he's like at the top of the dune in the desert and it's all red and it's fucking gorgeous and it's strange and it's interesting and it feels unpredictable. And if I don't know, man, I I'm so, so fucking, I'm so much more excited for this game than I thought I could ever really be. Even as somebody who loved the first game, because I was, I think I've told this, I've, I've said this before on the show too, but it was like, I was totally fine with this being a one-off game yeah, because I wasn't sure what else they could really do with it. Um, and I'm st- and to be fair, I still don't really know. Uh, I don't know how much the gameplay is going to be expanded. It looks like there's going to be a higher emphasis on combat. They even highlighted that in the trailer. There's a shot of him shooting um, some enemy. Yeah, that was the original um, letter we got. Actually, was like, will, will it go more action oriented? And it seems like that is the case. I'm OK with that. Like, I mean, I, I do think there's only so much you can do with just the premise of like moving around. But and, it w- you know, 
I did like the idea that you didn't have to resort to combat in the original Death Stranding. It would be nice if you could do that again, but it would be nice that if you did have to, that those mechanics were a little bit more fleshed out and a little bit more um, intuitive or, or, they, or they felt a little better. Um, so I, I'm fine with more action as as long as what was special about the original game is is enhanced as well, uh, given its fair t- treatment. Um, and it looks like it is. It just, it looks, it looks great. Um, this was the the the, the standout thing of the show for me personally outside of stellar blade stellar blade is second on my list i think just because i was surprised by how good it looked um for a game that i wasn't quite sure about but it ju- it just kind of blew me away i just was not anticipating even a fraction of what we got out of this trailer what about the what about the cat the cat too yeah that fucking yeah. that weird that weird <laughs> s- s- ven- like that symbiote looking cat that smoking symbiotes an, uh, yeah it's 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 weird. I, I do love also, I, I know Kojima mentioned this on online shortly after the trailer came out, but I do, I love the fact that that puppet moves at, at a different frame rate. I, I, I love that so much. It's truly weird. Does. Yeah, it's good. I, shit. I don't know what the fuck the justification for that is. I don't know how they're going to make that make sense. And I'm totally fine if it doesn't, quite frankly, because it's just such a cool thing to see. I'm in. I'm in for Death Stranding. Yeah. Shout out, Kojima. There's more, though. Do you have anything else you want to say about Death Stranding, Dustin? No, nope, we'll get I'm into good, the next man. one. I'm excited. <clears throat> Metroid is better in 2D. That's uh, I don't know about that. He writes in. Says because Metroid Prime, I got to give you put a little respect on Metroid Prime, you know? Yeah. What do you guys think of Kojima's new IP movie game? Sounds like a fusion of Metal Gear and Quantum Break, or maybe you can think of it as Metal Gear Solid 4, but with live action cutscenes. I think so. This they didn't say it at the time, but they're, they're calling this project Fizzint. P-H-Y-S-I-N-T. And it is unclear to me what specifically it will be, although I read it a lot more linearly, which is this way. Sony, so Kojima is doing a game, like a movie game style thing with Microsoft. I think what they're trying to leverage here, especially with that shot, like that drone shot and stuff that they did, which was pretty cool, was we are an entertainment company. And Sony owns Columbia Pictures and TriStar and all these random things that became Sony Pictures and they own CBS, what, what was CBS Records. They have massive music and movie imprints. And I think that that is specifically what they're talking about. So I don't know that it's going to be like Quantum Break where it was interstitial. I don't think it's going to be like a movie style game. I think what they're saying is we're making a game and we're going to make movies and we're going to do these other things. And and really from the embryo of the idea, take advantage of the cro- cross media potential for the very first time with any of our products, like from the word go. And I think that that's what they're saying. So I think people are reading into it too much, in my opinion. Like, I think you're going to get a game. Yeah. And I think it's what's pretty interesting about this game is what platform it'll come to. Calvin Kirstein wrote in, said, hey, fellas, I was reading an article on Push Square that was asking this question. Could Fizzent be the first announced PS6 game? It would make sense considering Kojima-san said production of the game wouldn't properly begin until after the release of Death Stranding 2 next year. All signs seem to point to a PS6 release around 2027, 2028, only adding more credence to this possibly being a next generation title. Curious to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks and keep up the great work. In my opinion, Calvin, I think you're being very bullish with those timing. I would think... 2030 maybe something like that for the new game because it has to be you know think about death stranding being built from what it's been being built from a game that already exists and it's already taking five years and let's say that it was really only four because of COVID or something i still think you have to give them more time to get this thing off the ground but i do think it's a playstation 6 game so dustin what uh what do you think of all of this project fizzant sony getting involved and really solidifying second party this sounds like something that will basically consume kojima so i think they've pretty much nailed him down and it's already pretty clear that xbox is doing a much smaller project like interactive interactive project with him it seems like this might even be a response to that again flexing the cross media potential sony doesn't have to go outside anywhere to get all of his dreams to come true and this was of course kojima's this was his thing from the beginning like they're they're finally almost delivering to him what he's always wanted and so I think this is from all around pretty clever idea. And of course, the fundamental idea is that it's going to be a, an, an action espionage game like Metal Gear. So share with me your thoughts. 
Yeah, it's definitely the homecoming. Not that uh, Death Stranding was disappointing at all, but it was definitely a, a sharp turn from a Metal Gear game, even though there's a lot of Metal Gear DNA in Death Stranding, of course. But that is the big question is what what does the cross media mean? And I wonder if it's kind of a combination of everything where you mentioned movies and TV that could work into it, but also just this idea where if there is live action stuff that it's all kind of, they can use the full force of not just PlayStation, but uh, Sony in general. In fact, I think it was Herman Holst talked about like using the full, like Sony's technology really all the way. So I think it's interesting. It's very ambitious. And I guess I do have some light concerns in that, I wonder how well Kojima style translates to film and TV because I, I just think about something like Death Stranding and they are doing a Death Stranding movie, of course. And I, we wonder at the time is that you see these crazy and somewhat silly ideas and you accept them when they're on, when they're rendered in a game, but does something kind of go a little too far when you see it in real life where it's no longer fun but becomes cheesy right so i wonder if there might be taking a bit of a risk with that is is kojima gonna push too far out of his is his zone really and i don't maybe you know there's also a possibility where that's totally not the case where his 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 games practically are already in so many ways movies in a lot of ways with the way that there's the actors and the heavy on cutscenes and stuff like that. So maybe it'll be OK. But clearly, as you said, Sony wants to lock him in and it makes sense that Sony would be the company and not and I'm not saying PlayStation specifically, but Sony in general has all of this different these mm-hmm. arms. Right. Exactly. That and do. that's that's the whole point I was making was they can fulfill his dreams. Like they literally can just do it and they have locked him down. I mean, it sounds like they have basically gotten Kojima's attention. And I think this is good for Sony. However, there's another side of it. Chris H wrote in and said, hello, my secret, my favorite SS boys. I, am I the only one starting to get a little tired of Kojima's shtick? Chris says, while I won't deny the overt style dripping from the Death Stranding 2 trailer, I'm getting kind of bored of him just appearing on streams and vague announcing his next project with nothing more than a genre and his name attached. Let's not forget when he showed up at the Game Awards just to announce his podcast. No other creator would get away with this. And I'm annoyed that we all kind of accept it as classic Kojima banter. I get the industry loves auteur style creators like him, but he's becoming more of a meme at this point than a true visionary. What do you guys think? Thanks and can't wait to see you at the inevitable London live show. I just don't know how you can look at the Death Stranding 2 trailer and think that. But um, Chris, what do you think about this? Uh, the, the new game? So we, are we seeing too much Kojima? Are you excited? Is it a PS6 game? I mean, there's so many different yeah. threads you can pull from. Yeah, man, I, I don't even know where to begin. I, I, I think uh, I, as far as the question is concerned and as far as like, you know, uh, is he, you know, the, the idea that no one would get away with it. I think that's right, but I, I don't even I don't even think it should be. I think there's probably a lot of really creative people who probably should be given this kind of leash that don't really get to. And I, I mentioned it earlier, but I think the reason Kojima has that is just because he's been so uniquely influential and so and so proven uh, in this industry that I just think people allow him to do it because he's proven himself. But there's no doubt a lot of people probably who would benefit greatly from being given that freedom. And there's probably there's a lot of people who probably can't handle it as well. But I, I wouldn't necessarily think that I wouldn't necessarily say that, like, oh, just because he goes out and announces something and doesn't have much to show for it for a while. I don't think that. I don't think that that matters because everything that he's delivered is just has either been something that was just great or at the very least a massive deal. Like even Metal Gear Solid 4, which is a game that I just don't care for at all. That was a big game that a lot of people really, really fucking loved. And it was a big deal. It was the first PS3 game of true consequence. <clears throat> yeah. And so, you know, whether you like it or not, like even even Death Stranding to a lesser extent, I'm sure. But like nobody expected that game to be as I did not. I did not expect that game to be as good as it was, or as interesting as it was, or as visionary as it was. I, 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 I think Death Stranding one is probably one of the boldest video games ever made in AAA. Like it's, it's 
the bet taken on that game is insane that you would sell and spend a lot of money developing a game where all you did was deliver packages from place to place and we're going to make the act of walking itself a gameplay system that's unheard of that's insane and i think most people even if they had that idea and it was a good idea as it clearly is when when really given the love and ten- tender love and care that it needs no one would have gotten away with that without the level of credit credibility that he has and so i don't know i, I think it's a little silly to say that he's not a visionary I, I i think it's just that's just silly but as far as this fizzant thing is concerned i think it's too it's realistically it's, it is too early for me to care like I, I can't i'm excited about the, at the prospect of him going back to uh espionage action but my life's gonna look so different <laughs> by the I time know, this game I comes know. out that i can't even I, I i can't really muster up the same excitement that i can for something like death stranding <laughs> which is compa- comparably imminent and we've seen a lot more of it yeah you know what just I mean? next year. We, so mm-hmm. so to me i'm just like yeah i'm 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 willing to give kojima the benefit of the doubt at this point because he's proven me wrong so many times and he's just made some of the most interesting games that I've ever played in my entire life. So I, I think at this point, he's earned the benefit of the doubt in in the sense of like, yeah, if he shows something that isn't really all that interesting in the moment, like a screen capture of some woman screaming in, in, a, in a facial capture booth. I didn't care about that at all when it was on the Xbox showcase. But I'm definitely going to check out whatever the fuck that is when it's out. You can bet your ass I'm doing that. Right on. Yeah, I, I agree with you on... We have to go through a whole Kojima hype cycle yeah. before we even get to Fizzit, right? And right. it is fascinating to think it is certainly a PlayStation 6 game. There's just no doubt about it. My hope is that it's not doesn't, you know, bu- isn't built fundamentally on PS5. I think that'd be such a stupid mistake. Although who knows what would be right and wrong at this point with anything with the future machines. I just, I don't know. I think this is a, a coup for Sony. I think Kojima is one of the most seriously taken gaming creators ever and even though he doesn't sell at the very height that you'd want your best games to sell he doesn't sell like death stranding didn't move like horizon did i no. actually think in some ways death stranding is more important like having him associated with your platform is meaningful and i think they were pr- i'm sure this deal was made before they the, the xbox stuff was announced or whatever but it's just that, that probably doesn't sit, sit well with sony but I think Kojima is wise to be ag- as agnostic as possible because I can only imagine how many people are trying to knock his door down and the amount of his attention being stripped away by people just trying to get his his eye for two seconds is probably extraordinary. So I would let I would let everything play out if I were him, too. And the amount of money that he's going to make off this is extraordinary, although. I don't think I've ever heard him talk about money once. I don't know that he really cares about that <laughs> yeah i'm sure he's like very comfortable and i'm sure he likes that but I, I don't think that that's really why he's in it all right one last thing quantum radish wrote in it's a postscript he says hey sacred crew i'll ask a question i'm sure is on many of our minds after the show where is the first party don't get me wrong that state of play was great but we still don't know what is coming from the likes of bend blue point or sucker punch i was overjoyed to see judas and death Stranding 2 but i was a little disappointed by the absence of first party studios i'm curious about your thoughts and when do you think Sony will finally break their silence on what their teams are working on? Thanks for the great content every week. Here's my opinion on this, and, and this is becoming pretty solidly obvious in my opinion, but I'll leave that to every individual. Sony only owns a finite amount of teams, 20, really. And games take so long to make that they just don't go as often anymore. And this is kind of what I was trying to say during the PlayStation Showcase last year, although it got heavily distorted, was who really gives a shit who's making the games as long as the games are good and they're on our platform that we want to play on not exclusive because i really don't care about that either i just i'm on ps5 i want the games to come to ps5 we're getting the game sony's investing in them and i feel like it almost feeds into their marketing but it's it, it is true that it's only a difference to us that most people as we say before and many times in the past don't really care that yeah it doesn't, it, whether it's coming from Kojima and he's outside or Kojima and he's inside, it's still coming from Kojima. Like we're still getting these games. So I'm curious about first party too, but I, and I think we're going to see more first party games. I, I it, Concord is coming out this year. Yeah. So we're going to see it at some point. And I imagine we see fair games this year, not maybe release, but we'll see gameplay. And then we'll probably see a few other new things like Bend. 
who knows, but it doesn't sound to me like they're, they're going to be ready to go. And we know that Sucker Punch is doing Ghost of Tsushima. Like, do you really need to see it to know? They're, they're, yeah. I'm, I'm going to fucking blow your mind. They're doing a Ghost <laughs> of Tsushima sequel up there. And it's going to look like a more beautiful Ghost of Tsushima. And it's going to be great. Blue Point, who the fuck knows? So yeah, I'm excited and interesting, interested to see these two, but we have to remember that in this new ecosystem that becomes more and more demanding of time, money, and resources, that the first party output is going to look a lot more like the PS2 era than it did the PS3 era or the PS4 era, but certainly the PS3 era. And the PS2 era was the best selling era in PlayStation history. So it yeah. really goes to show you how much that mattered then, which was not very much. Yeah, and we're, that's we're my honest a... take. Like, it's just it just is what it is. Like, yeah, we'll get our Naughty Dog game. We'll get our Sucker Punch game. But Ghost of Tsushima, too, is almost less exciting than half the things we saw at the show in some sense, because we know that's coming. So uh, yeah. what, do you, what do you think, Chris? Well, I was going to say, like, I, I think we are in a position where even, you know, hosts of this show and listeners of the show are just in a position of just being a little bit more educated about this industry than most people who engage with the platform and, and engage with gaming in general are like I, I most of my friends the overwhelming majority of them play video games a lot and they're really into it. But they, I don't, I honestly, I don't know if they know the difference between first and second party or if they care. You know, I was, I was playing, I was in an Xbox live party the other day with some people, some friends, some friends, and then friends of, of theirs. And they were talking about power world. They were playing power world and they're under the impression that because it's exclusive to Xbox, that they, that Xbox made it. Like, that's a real. And they just assume that because it's there and it's exclusive and, you know, they don't really care. It doesn't make one it doesn't make a difference if it's exclusive or not. It's just there and they're playing it. So I think, you know, we are in a position where a lot of people who listen to the show just happen to know more about this stuff and care more about it more than the average consumer does. The average consumer could probably go three years without buying a first party game and still get a ton of value out of their out of their machine. And, you know, it's, it's important to realize that, too, as game development cycles grow longer and longer and more is expected of them that yeah they're they're not going to go as much it is frustrating like i agree that like i from our perspective like i would like to know more imminently what the future holds you know it's rare that we get a glimpse into they, we know everything about insomniac but that's it's not because they wanted us to so that's nice for us in some way but yeah man most people just don't care <laughs> they just want yeah. fun games to play on the platform that they own and that's really all that matters to the overwhelming majority of people a lot of the sentiment I've seen, which I, I think there's we should classify that Quantum Radish says that it's disappointing. If you're a fan of these studios specifically, the sure. games they make, it's OK to feel uh, you use the word disappointed, but just to wonder what's going on. You want to know you these are games you love, they're IPs you love. You want to know what's going on. I get that. So I'm not talking about you, Quantum Radish, but I've seen the, you know, some of the the anger from some of the the fanboys and stuff like that and it just reminds me of the meme or like the spongebob thing where patrick is like hey you ate all of our food now we're gonna starve and he's all fat and he has the chocolate on his lips and it's like yeah. hey there's no first party games now what are we gonna have to play and there's all of this stuff here it's like just just enjoy it you know there's it, the the platform uh, like wars about like games and who has what and stuff it's like look around look around at all of this awesome stuff and yeah. um again yeah not to not to say it's like being a fan of those the wondering what's going on is a different thing right but to, like the the anger around like sony's not saying anything that how could they do this they need to say so it's like dude just yeah i <laughs> look crazy. at all this stuff in front of you take a second take off the blinders Final Fantasy VII Remake comes out very I soon. I know not that's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but holy Sony didn't shit. make it. Sony didn't make it, so it's, <laughs> it's invalid. Dude, I, I really I can't imagine the perspective. Like I, I really can't get, I, I can't get to the headspace of somebody who's like, man, there just aren't enough games to play. <laughs> like that doesn't register to me as a, as possible. Like I, I look at my backlog every day, paralyzed. Totally. And yeah. I don't even have as much. I don't even have a fraction. Like I feel like there are many, many, many people who have more, way more games than I do. And I still look at my backlog like, holy fuck, god I mean, damn, there's make, so much. Make no mistake, like it's. I'm not trying to defend it. Like there aren't very many first party games. No, on no, the no, platform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and I'm looking at it. Even so, first and second party since the PS5 launched, right? 
So we have Demon Souls. That was second party at the time. Sackboy, second party. Miles Morales, first party. Then you have to go to MLB The Show 21, first party. Returnal, first party. But that was second party when it was, when it was, rev- when it was released. Rift Apart is first party. So we're in 2001. Then you go to 2022, Forbidden West. Gran Turismo 7, MLB The Show 22. These are a bunch of PlayStation re-released games. Then you get like the Last of Us Part 1, Uncharted Legacy of Thieves Collection, Call of the Mountain, Spider-Man 2. I mean, it, it's pretty, it's bleak when you look at it through that lens, but I, I think you're right, Chris. It's just too, what well, we're all saying, there's just too much to be too worried about this from this yeah. perspective. It's not, I really encourage people to think about it more like PlayStation 2. And if you weren't there, then just go read about it and you'll understand more. I think Sony realizes they can get less with more too and that they don't, it doesn't really matter. And so I understand the frustration. I just don't think we should get too caught up in it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's state of play. This is going to be a long episode. Yes. Sorry. Do we want to just skip the rest of the news? I don't know. Or should we go through it? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, at least number two, number two. Yeah. Number three. Well, I'll just go through it really. I'll just go through it all quick. Because I okay. think number one is important, too. This would have been the top story, actually, if not for um, State of Play. And it's not like a most glorious thing, but it's a Sony props thing. So let's let's just get into it. I'll go through this quickly and we'll get into the inquiries and end the show. Number one, in a seriously underreported piece of news, Sony and its PlayStation brand have turned their corporate eye towards the continent of Africa, which it expects to be the next great passion of growth, not only for Sony itself, but for its gaming imprint from both a player and a developer point of view. Word comes by way of two sources an official press release, and a CNBC article. So let's get into what these pieces have to say. For starters, Sony is connecting with a major African gaming company called Carry First. This is C-A-R-R-Y-1-S-T. Carry First described itself as a top games publisher on the continent, lists companies like Activision and Riot as existing partners, and focuses on both licensed products and games endemic to the African market. And it's important to note that this gaming is not done on console, but on mobile and PC via games like African Glam, Fashion and Drama, which apparently is huge the puzzle title Blast Champions, and even a licensed Spongebob title. They're also the local publishers of smash hit games from the West, like Call of Duty Mobile and Valorant. Seeing a growth opportunity, Sony has made a so-called strategic investment into Carry First via its innovation fund, which was launched with Africa in mind just last fall. So why is Sony doing this? Because according to Carry First's press release, there are more than 200 million active gamers in Africa, creating merely $1 billion in annual revenue. So the players in Africa are there, but they aren't quite ponying up the money yet. So it's time to turn their attention to consoles, as explained by Carry First CEO, quote, we are thrilled to join forces with Sony's innovation fund Africa. The relationship will help help carry Carry First. I'm sorry, will help Carry First to drive the future of gaming in Africa. At Carry First, we believe that the African console market is a massively underestimated opportunity. Our district, our distinct regional capabilities paired with Sony's expertise in gaming and entertainment creates a powerful combination. Together, we hope to bring the best games in the world to players across Africa, end quote. Now, turning to the CNBC article, it's noted that, quote, the deal is a strategic investment that will see the two companies partner on a range of commercial opportunities. For now, the two companies are in the exploratory stages of that partnership, end quote. CNBC further elaborates via Carry First, aforementioned CEO Cordell Robin Coker, noting that that countries like Nigeria, Morocco, and Algeria are prime candidates for console expansion via PlayStation, and that many players there simply simply buy overseas consoles and content not meant for the market, which they can take advantage of, quote, Our hope is that we can help Sony to expand their reach of PlayStation in the region and support them in a range of ways, including broader go-to-market strategies, as well as digital payments, end quote. PlayStation's move into Africa represents the third of, to date, explicit attempts to reach a new market. Its China Hero project, currently in multiple waves in, has been a massive success, with quite a few games exiting the market with Sony's money and know-how, such as Fist, Forge, and Shadow Torch, In Nightmare, and so on. And just last year, we discussed that Sony is now doing the same thing in India with its India Hero project. So don't be surprised when Sony starts more actively investing in African game development in the quarters to come. E. Fisher wrote in and said, hello, cast and crew. I saw quite an article on CNBC about Sony investing in the African games development industry. Sony has really been investing in these underserved game dev markets. I know it's a corporate strategy, but it's refreshing to see Sony helping build up a true worldwide studio brand. I was amped to see this. Yeah, the, the growth console gaming growth can. And this is for all of us, whether you play an Xbox or Switch or PlayStation. Console growth will only come from emerging markets. We are saturated. Yeah. Like in the West, we're saturated. It goes into the number of the, the 250 to 300 million people or always like around the world have been playing console games for 20 years. 
And so what they're basically saying, and I was reading a little bit more about this, is in North African countries, especially like Morocco, they just get shit from Europe and then use it. And what and it's kind of like it's what's happening in Russia actually right now, too, because like you can't legally even sell certain things in Russia. So Russia connects to the Turkish PSN and it's like so confusing. I think Sony sees all this stuff and like, why don't we just there? Like, why don't we just open and crack these guys open? You, you know, it's not on like, you know what a really popular Sega market was and is. And they like went way out of their way to Brazil. make it. So what do right. you say? Brazil, Brazil. Right. Yeah. And Brazil to this fucking day is diehard Sega and was throughout the 90s into the 2000s playing Master System and Genesis. I think Master System is the best selling system ever in Brazil. Like you go to these places and then they evolve. You know, Brazil was a more of a developing country, but it's pretty much getting in the first world country territory. And you want to be there when that happens. So I don't think there's much to say here, but I wanted to acknowledge that like yeah. as these countries become more affluent, Sony will be there on the ground floor as opposed to as opposed to breaching it then. And then you'll get access to their game devs too, which they haven't even really begun yet. But that's what's happening in China and, and India. And it's going to be super awesome to see an Indian game on PlayStation soon. And they're going to announce them, I think, in the coming months, the first round. So I'm excited about that. Congratulations to them. I like that forward thinking thing. And you're right, E. Fisher. It's totally corporatism. They want money. They're not stupid. But it's good for corporate. It's good for console gaming to breach as many of these places as possible to keep the money coming. And I thought it was interesting, by the way, there's there's 200 million people spending an average of five dollars a month. Or five, I'm sorry, yeah. five dollars a year in Africa on gaming. So you, they have a long way to go in because that's not necessarily only about a lack of money. There's affluent parts of Africa. It's about how you're trained to play games and the yeah. access to games you have. They don't. I was I don't know if you guys remember, I did a Sacred Symbols Plus episode with a guy in India a couple of years ago where they're like console gaming is really beginning to take off there because. There's finally the, the nexus of affluence and availability. So why not be in Africa? Shout out to them. I'll be keeping an eye on this and we'll report on it more. But number two, this is what you wanted to talk about, Dustin. And a sad but predictable piece of news. Vaunt the Japanese publisher Square Enix has revealed that it's shutting down its fully owned subsidiary Tokyo RPG Factory and absorbing its staff content and so on. As website Gamatsu notes, based on a Japanese announcement, quote, Tokyo RPG Factory will cease to exist as an individual entity, end quote. This, of course, is a true bummer for those who like the intent behind the team, even if the final products didn't always pan out as hoped. The purpose behind Tokyo RPG Factory, which at most only had a few dozen people working on its roster, was to allow Square Enix to pursue old school JRPGs that are lower budget, quicker to make and easier to get to market. Tokyo RPG's first uh, factory's first game, 2016's I Am Setsuna or Setsuna of Sacrifice and Snow in Japan, launched on Western PS4s that summer, though it skipped Vita, which it was originally on in Japan. It's probably best known it's probably its best known game and a true classic and it was followed up by two other projects in 2017 and 2019, both on PS4 in the form of Lost Sphere and Onanaki. They are being reported. They were reported to long be working on a fourth game, one that will obviously never, never get a hold of. All three games were directed by Atsushi Hashimoto and all three games were written by Hiroki and Inaba. It's unclear if these guys remain or still remain or remained or still remain involved with Square Enix post Onanaki, though Hashimoto's latest credit on Moby Games is for a game published outside of the family. Ian wrote in and said, hey, punkheads, I just wanted to offer a moment of silence for Tokyo RPG Factory. I am Setsuna is an all time favorite for me. It's cold and sorrowful soundtrack helped me get through a passing of my dad in 2017. I know Colin has strong feelings as well. I was wondering if any of you boys experienced their work. Onanaki is extremely fun action RPG in Lost Sphere working, uh, walking a similar line to I am Setsuna. Listeners, if you've never checked these games out, I highly recommend them. Rest in peace, Tokyo RPG Factory. Thanks for the memories. I was bummed to see this. I am Setsuna. But I never played. Well, I actually played all three of them, but I never beat Onanaki. And I think I'd never beat Lost Fear. I platinumed I Am Setsuna. What a fucking game that was. I mean, that's a really special, sad, somber game about a girl who's basically her quest is that she has to kill herself or like has to be sacrificed. And about people that don't want that to happen. And the music is so good. It's all piano. It's so sad, dude. I'll never forget it. Like how perfect it all was. The rain outside when I was in San Francisco, the just sitting in the living room, just absorbing it. So it is sad. It never came together, but I liked how Square Enix had this intent of just investing a little bit of money into making old school games that their entire idea was was sound. I just don't think it necessarily worked out. So Dustin, what do you have to say about this? 
Yeah, I Am Satsuna, that's a game I've always wanted to play, and I haven't. But I'm just sad that uh, an initiative like this didn't work out just because I think it was important. And I know that this is a big blow for fans of these newer uh, JRPG games. Hopefully at least the, the concept maybe in a, in a different form or, or whatever from square Enix still lives on, but uh, yeah, sad to see something like this happen. Okay. And number three, it's time for new PlayStation plus games specifically for the essential tier which therefore means these titles are available for all users with a subscription regardless of tier. The following three games will be available for anyone with an active PS Plus sub beginning February 6th, and you'll have until March 4th to claim them. Be sure to add them to your library in time, and you'll have access to them forevermore, so long as your sub is active. As we already know, the biggest game of the bunch is actually a rare day and date release for PS Plus Essential in the form of Square Enix's Splatoon-inspired multiplayer title Foam Stars. That will be available on both PS4 and PS5, and it will naturally be available for a la carte purchase as well. The second game is also on both PS4 and PS5 in the form of the 2022 sports action game Roller Drome from developer Roll7 and Take-Two own label Private Division. Finally, for PS5 only comes another 2022 release, the Soulsborne title Seal Rising from developer Spiders and publisher Nacon. Interestingly, this month does pack a fourth kind of sort of perk for PS Plus subs in the form of exclusive Fall Guys character packs exclusive for PS Plus that give you three costumes, Ratchet, Clank, and Aloy, as well as a ton of other in-game goods. And if you have PS Plus Premium, the highest of the three PS Plus tiers, you'll also gain access to a two hour Spider-Man 2 game trial beginning February 6th. So there's all that. Anything there for you guys? Foam Stars? Chris, you're going to be all over Foam Stars. Dustin, you're going to love it. (laughs) I'll give it a try. I don't like Splatoon, really. So I I don't know if I'm... I'll I'll give it a a try for free, but I I don't... I doubt I'm going to stick with it. Roller Drome's great. Really good. But... I don't know. This is kind of a weak. It's a weak one, in my opinion. So there's one final piece of news that I wanted to talk about before we get into the listener inquiries. I'm not exactly sure what's going on with this. But on so on the Hi-Fi Rush, Hi-Fi Rush is an Xbox and PC game from from Tango Gameworks and Bethesda's family, therefore owned by Xbox. There have been rumors, as we know, because we've talked about it over the last few weeks, that Games like Sea of Thieves from Rare, which was an Xbox One game originally, and then Hi-Fi Rush, which just came out last year on Game Pass, would be coming to Switch and or PlayStation. Now, over on the Games Leak and Rumors Reddit, there was a post about these files that were extracted from in-game t-shirt textures, I guess in game files on the Xbox Steam and Epic Games Store or something. I don't know. And these shirts seem to indicate the different platforms that they're going to come to or have been on. So there's like one that's clearly referencing Epic, one that's clearly referencing um, all these other things. And then so there was this thing floating around there. But then this is what I was looking at before. I was a little distracted because then someone's like, oh, this isn't true. This is a rumor. This was made up. And then someone posted no, it's real. Here are here's more proof that these are in there. So it indicates that we might have some sort of imminent Hi-Fi Rush related PlayStation announcement, but not in time for the show. And I don't know if it's true or not. It seems like it's in the air right now, but it seems like people are kind of arguing back and forth. I mean, it's pretty obvious that some games are going to be leaving the Xbox ecosystem. I just wanted to touch on that because that can end up being a big piece of news we didn't touch on because of the nature of the recording schedule. Dustin, did you see any of this stuff about Hi-Fi? Yeah, I saw in our staff Discord, Maddie. Well, first Brad posted about it, and then Maddie was like, "Awesome." We talked about like we can look prophetic because they said it was going to happen, and then the the news about it not being real. It's just kind of chaotic. But yeah, the three images are somewhat maybe what paint the picture in that the blue one says, "I'm here, baby," and has an outline of the main character. The red one, assumingly for Switch, says, "Rock out anywhere," being that it's portable. And then the green one says shadow dropped, which is when it was a uh, shadow dropped on Xbox. So right. who knows? I mean, it, yeah, so I think it's happening. It's happening. Yeah, these I, I think so, too. These screenshots are from the UE viewer from Epic Game Store. And they're these screenshots that so Wario 64 tweeted them out as like a subsequent tweet. And yeah, the rock out anywhere thing is obviously a switch reference and the shadow drop, like you said, Xbox. So the only one this one has to be PlayStation. And uh, guys. Here's the thing. 
Now, anytime an Xbox game is announced, I'm just going to say, I'll wait till it comes to PlayStation. And that's just the way it's going to have to be for now on. I'm sorry to hear mm-hmm. it. I'm sorry to say it. When do you guys think this will be announced? I was, I did say to you guys in the, um, in the, th- in our sacred symbols, iOS thread before the show, I was like, what do you think the percentage is that this would be here at the state of play? And I said, it's got to be very low percentage because you would assume. Yeah. This would be something you would poop out. I, I don't know if they can. They're going to get the, the fucking wrath of their audience on this. It's, it's going to be crazy. But can I say this real quick? We have to see how these games turn out or whatever. I have no interest in Sea of Thieves. But I might play this other game and you might want to consider just buying these games to send the message that you want more of them. I mean, like the the, the Jenga tower is kind of tottering. You know, at this point. So if you want Xbox games, you got to show up. Yeah. Right. In some sense. Not not just buy them if you don't want them, but if you are if you were like tangentially interested in Hi-Fi Rush, you should definitely buy it when it comes to PlayStation and Sea of Thieves. I don't know how that's going to do. Isn't Sea of Thieves is Sea of Thieves free to play? No. Well, I guess theoretically, it somewhat is because it's on Game Pass, but you can also buy it. Yeah, yeah, it's on Game Pass. Like I I bought it. I I still occasionally jump in. I think I I was just on Sea of Thieves last week. Actually, like, see, this is really it's, it, see, this is really good, but it's also like it's very dependent on having a group of people to play it, play it with. It's like there is there's basically no game without a group of people. So if that does come to PlayStation. I if you've got a group of people who are interested in playing it, I highly I really do highly recommend it. It, it actually reminds me a lot of I know this is outside of the PlayStation ecosystem as well, but I'm sure there there's some overlap between PC and, and PlayStation in, the, in our listeners, but it's very lethal company. <laughs> In the sense of just like it's very much a game for for pals to fuck around in and just wait for chaos to inevitably just subsume you. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush I love. So that's I mean, I don't know. I, I'm a pretty agnostic person. I'm happy to see these come to different platforms. I've long said I, I've been waiting for the Halo collection to come to PlayStation forever. I, I still I still think that would be a great idea, but whatever. We will see. It's going to be a meltdown situation, I think. I'll just play The Elder Scrolls 6 when it comes to PlayStation. <laughs> okay. Anything else to say here? I guess that's all the news. So let's get into the uh, listener inquiries. We can roll through these quick. The first one has to do a little bit with a piece of news, though, that I think we should discuss. Mayor Garbage Man wrote in. Hello, Mayor. Says, hey, CDC. Just this morning, Moore's Law is Dead just released a massive leak. He's reporting that AMD has gotten the contract for the Vita successor and the PS6. It's not confirmed yet that the Vita 2 will be will for sure be released, but it is being looked at and mocked up. Further details being that it's at least two years away and is on par with the PS4. What do you say, boys? Was this portal a test bed for the market? How would we feel about the Vita 2 not releasing until the end of the PS5 lifecycle? Also, Death Stranding 2 looks absolutely amazing. Keep it limited, Mayor Garbage Man. Thank you so much for writing it. So this comes from Moore's Law is Dead, our friend Tom. I'm actually going to be on his podcast, Broken Silicon, in the coming days to talk about PlayStation, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I reached out to him because I saw this, and this was in a recent a video he did, and I'm like, dude, I, I don't have the time to listen to this because it, you know I woke up, all the news was there, the show's going to begin. I'm like, what do I need to know? And so here's what he said to me. He said, I would boil it down to this. Number one, AMD is working with Sony on launching multiple consoles right now. The PS5 Pro is the first one. And then sub sub text here the silicon was basically finished about a year ago there's plenty of time to do the required validation arguably too much time and it's likely sony at least considered canceling it the goal recently was to launch it during holiday 2024 as for specs what i am see what i am told seems to line up with that reset era leak we talked about that a while ago number two the playstation 6 is the second console a contract is signed it's coming so that's obvious number three the third is a playstation handheld Right now, it is in HLD or high-level development, and thus it's not fully spec'd out yet, nor even really guaranteed to launch. Basically, Sony has contracted AMD to go work with some rough designs and ideas as to what is possible to launch two to four years from now. While it's not guaranteed to launch, it should be noted that the money has exchanged hands already, so at a minimum, Sony is serious. However, it it must also be noted that there was an XSX Elite that was canceled, an Xbox Series X Elite. So these serious projects can end up dying. So... He goes into more about like what it could what it could possibly do and all the rest. I want to I want to say this and then I'll get your guys take on this is that first of all, I think Tom's completely reliable source. So this is very interesting. I've reported on the show in the past that I, I know one person in particular that has played 
unreleased Sony handheld, like a, like an unreleased Sony handheld years ago. I, I've said this on shows previously that a company like Sony, that's a tech company first, is always R and Ding and fucking around with things like Frankensteining things together. And I've known people that have literally played like this is what the next handheld could be, and it's a it's a dual sense control or a dual shot controller with like a screen like you know soldered to it or whatever, you know. And this is the kind of shit that like is always happening. So I've known people that have fucked with that stuff. And this seems to be a level, and that was several years ago. And this is, seems to be a level higher than that. So very exciting. We've long speculated, Dustin, that a, a handheld PS4 would actually be really interesting. It also could indicate why they still seem really hell-bent on releasing PS4 games. We are more than a decade out from PS4's launch, and it is still getting new games, new SKUs, and selling a lot. And as we've noted many times, monthly active users only crossed over from PS4 to PS5 two quarters ago. So are we going to get a handheld PlayStation, PS4, maybe PS4 Pro or something like that in the next two years? I think it's certainly possible. I did watch Tom's video this morning and he brings up a lot of interesting uh, speculative points that make a lot of sense to me. And I think that Sony is has been looking at the Switch's success for a lot of years now. They're looking at the failure of the Vita and why it failed. And in addition, the success of the Steam Deck and something that Tom put out that I, I highly recommend everyone go to watch his video because it's very interesting. But I want to relay his point here is that what if this device can play PS4 games, but in addition, it has the ability for developers to make specific patches for PS5 versions of the game to run on this device where it runs at a lower resolution. It maybe takes out, I don't know, ray tracing, runs at a lower frame rate, but it's basically specced different for the handheld. And the other point that Tom brings up is that Sony really wants people to buy games digitally. And if you have a device like this, where it's like, okay, well, you can buy the game physically and we're already moving digitally anyway, but what if you buy if you buy it digitally, you also have access at a different a different version of it on this other device you have that you can take anywhere. And that's really interesting because just look at how people that have Steam Deck treat it. They say, well, I want to buy it on Steam Deck and I'll buy it digitally there because I'll be able to play it on my gaming PC and then it'll be cross save with my Steam Deck and I can take it anywhere I want. And. That's a really interesting thing that that could happen if they can make it spec right where it is achievable for developers to make patches that to make PS5 games run on it. And Tom brings this up too. again. I highly recommend you should go just watch the video, but maybe not all games are able to do this, but maybe they're like, hey, also any first party PS5 games. If you buy digitally, you'll be able to play it on this device native uh, a lower spec version of course but really intriguing and i know i mean clearly sony has seen the success of handheld gaming right now it's huge it's yeah. it, i mean and switch was just the beginning so it would make sense that they're like hey we we're a technology company we know how to do this shit we've done it before and the thing that killed the vita my last point and i brought this up before is the fact that it's a different game and Tom brings this up as well. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm just copying his point. But I've said it here, too, is that you have to develop a game that costs almost as much as a PS3 or PS4 game and then put it out to a smaller market and charge less for it. And that's why the Vita truly died, is that developers are like, why would I do that when I can charge $60 for a PS3 or a PS4 game and have a huge install? That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So it's the same game that you're developing for and it can be played on both. That's how that's how Nintendo solved the problem. So I'd imagine that's how Sony would want to solve it as well. Yeah, they really. It's funny, man, it's all about timing. Like Vita wasn't really Vita was somewhat wrong, the wrong product to your point. But remember that Vita and PS3 were sharing games and they were it's just like we always bring up the on live situation. Where it's like you're just too early in, in some way. Vita was just it was too precious for this world. In a lot of different ways, you know, it was too special for this world. It was too good for this world. I don't want to see any more special hard, special handheld stuff from Sony. So, yeah, it's got to talk to what already exists. I totally agree. And I'll be very excited to talk more about this and hear more about it from Tom. I'm again going to be on his podcast, Broken Silicon, in the coming days. So 
look out for that and go check out his video on YouTube on Moore's Law is Dead. Shout out to him. Yeah. All right. Anything else to say about this before we move on? Are we, are we no, I, I, yeah. yeah, I think I, Dustin pretty much said everything that I would have said anyway. So okay. yeah, I, I do think I do think uh, I do think the portal is also kind of a design thing or, or a, a test bed, too, because I, honestly, game streaming is really good. Like just generally, like I really have not noticed any problem playing like Skyrim at all on my Steam Deck streaming the PS5 to it. So I would imagine that that would be another way to work around the issue of getting PS5 or P- even PS6 games natively running on this portable handheld um, or not natively running, obviously, but like running on them at all. Um, it's a good time to do it, man. The The Steam Deck is exp- is is huge. The the rogue ally is out there now. And I, apparently there's like a new version of something coming out soon. The Steam Deck OLED just came out. The handheld gaming is in a really good spot right now, and it's in a really interesting spot, and they would be really foolish to ignore it. Yeah, well said. Yeah, Switch must have been... Well, we said it many times early on in the show, right, Chris? Like, back when we started it, why would you ever cede this ground to Nintendo? But they... I had no idea. I thought Switch was going to be... I remember saying... I think I did a video a kind of funny saying the Switch would sell twice as much as the Wii U, which I think would put it at 30-something million. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant yeah ben sharma wrote in said hey there cdc what's your take on the move towards remakes of not so old games is it risk aversion on the part of executives genuine love for the ip or market demand or something else entirely on that note are any of you amped to play persona 3 reload this week <clears throat> i really wanted to ask you about persona 3 reload i do think ben that the there is a risk aversion but i think that there's a demand to get games on unified systems that will no longer require. I mean, I've said this many times. Once you have a game on Switch, once you have a game on PS4, and really Xbox going back a long ways to the beginning of Xbox 360's Xbox Live, you have access to everything. And that requires just less remaking and all the rest. So when you think about Persona 3, this is a PS2 game and a PSP game. There's really no way to play it. I think now they did port it. And you can play it. Mike is playing that version of it. And um, I've been watching her play it. And it's it looks I'd, I'd like to play it at some point. I think I will. I will play the original version before I play Persona 3 Remake. Because no. I, I do want to do that. And I want to go back and play Persona 4 <laughs> Gold. What? What's so funny about that? It's There's there's problem. Uh, well, it's what I was going to say about the remake thing. Yeah, so ahead. well, you take it away. There, there's problem. The, this is what specifically in the case of Persona 3 is that there is no perfect version of the game. With Persona 3 Fess, there you can't control your party members and they're just AI controlled. There's no way to control them, and that's really annoying. The PSP version, you can control them, but they change the out of dungeon stuff to be like a visual novel. And so that's not really ideal either. So remaking Persona 3 is getting the best of all of that stuff assuming we haven't played it yet it's not out it is out for you now as the listener but not yet for us so i can't say with certainty colin but i don't think there is i would say right now i don't think there's going to be any benefit to you playing the original version it's only going to be an inferior version and then you'll never get to play the remake uh well yeah i guess you could but i don't think you will so you should just just go with what I assume again, talking into the future will be the best version of the game. All right. Fair enough. So, but that, I guess to sum things up, that's my point about remaking these games in general is that a lot of times there isn't this, there's like some Achilles heel to a lot of these semi older games. And so why not fix those things and make a beautiful thing? And you can always have the original like Resident Evil 4 still have it. There's nothing wrong with it, but they made a lot of awesome changes and made a big, beautiful version. A big beautiful version <laughs> on uh <laughs> with Persona Three Evil Four. You're telling me remake. this Persona Three's been remade. You're telling me this for the first time. <laughs> All right, Chris. Let's hear from you on this one. Meatball wrote in, sure. said, "Greetings, Sacred Dads. Will we ever see a return to in-game rewards? I've recently been looking for a competitive shooter to play in the background. Every option I've tried is completely littered with incentives to buy the latest battle pass or one of six currencies to unlock cosmetics or items." Gone are the days of grinding hours upon hours to earn that one special reward that no one else has. This cookie cutter formula is so disingenuous to the original premise that made these types of games fun to, to begin with. Perhaps I'm a pessimistic boomer, but multiplayer games have really lost their luster in recent years. Have a lovely weekend. What do you think of this, Chris? Because I was, again, a multiplayer virgin, basically. I mean, not a virgin. I mean, I've, I've been penetrated once or twice, but oh. I, I typically don't play multiplayer games. So my assumption about these games were was that you could do all that stuff 
or you just spend the money. So like, I thought that was part of the marketing was, no. was saying like, oh, you could do these things if you want to spend 5 million hours or you just buy this little battle pass. But I guess I'm wrong. So talk to me a little bit. No, about no, this. no. Yeah. I mean, it largely depends on the game. Like some games are more egregious than others, but um, Halo Infinite is the one that I've been playing. And it's the one I know more intimately than a lot of other ones. And they handle it pretty well. They have battle passes that don't expire, which is nice because it kind of, you know, a lot of times battle passes will expire and then you'll you'll not finish them and then you'll just lose that content. That'll be really shitty. Um, So it's nice that they have that. But at the same time on their battle pass, they do have there's rewards per level. And like some some levels will have a free item and something that you can only get if you bought the battle pass or just something that is exclusive to the battle pass that you have to pay money for. Like, or presumably you would either buy from the shop or buy it or get it through the battle pass, which you pay money for as well. So that's kind of the issue is it's, it's not really trading time for money. It's just, yeah, if you want this cool suit of armor, uh, you're going to have to buy it. And that's kind of lame. It, it is definitely worse. I don't like this, the way things have gone in that sense. Um, at the same time, I'm a weird person to ask because I've just never really cared that much about cosmetics in multiplayer games ever. Like, I've just never really been that person. And that might be because I've, I've, I've been playing these kinds of multiplayer games for so long that I remember a time where there really weren't any, <laughs> you know, like you maybe in Halo, you could change your color, but that's a first person game anyway. So you're not really seeing what your guy looks like. It's mm-hmm. really more about showboating to other people. So by the time this kind of cosmetic or, or this like battle pass driven environment came out. I remember people complaining about it. It's like, man, I got to, I got to pay, I got to buy this battle pass to get access to the cool armor. And I'm like, why do you, you're shooting each other. Why do you care? Like, it's always been like, I totally get it. I agree that it's dumb and that it's anti-consumer and it's not fun. It's not cool. It's very, it's a lot lamer than in the days of halo three, when you would get an, uh, you would get like a very specific helmet. If you beat the, if you beat the entire story on the hardest difficulty. And that was and then that helmet was like a badge of honor for people when like you would go into multiplayer and you would see people. It's like, oh, you know what that person did to get that. That's cool. And even like uh, dating back to some of the later Halo 3 era stuff where there was like a special kind of helmet that only Bungie themselves could give out if they acknowledged you for something special that you did. Like it, like I know the Rooster Teeth people, um, the red versus blue guys had like a, a very special helmet that could only be bestowed by Bungie for like crazy crazy feats and that that shit was cool too like that's there's there's history to that there's like a there's like an energy to that that kind of makes it feel like man this game really rewards you for for getting better at it and for putting in the time um that is kind of gone now and i I do lament that um but at the same time i've just never really been a battle pass person i've never really been a cosmetics driven person if the game is fun I will play it and I will probably ignore the battle pass entirely. I've been playing the finals for a while now and I haven't even fucked with, (laughs) I have not edited my character once. I have not looked at the battle pass even. I think maybe I looked at it the first day just to see like what it looked like, but I I don't engage with those systems because when I play a multiplayer video game, I'm in it for the fun, not for what I can unlock. It's actually my biggest issue with call of duty back in the day was like, I remember being irritated that, so many of my friends were playing it because they're not even because they were having fun, but because they wanted to, Oh, I want to get to this level so I can unlock this good gun. So that it almost felt like oh, you want to play this game so that you can unlock a thing that makes it fun for you, but you don't want to play because it, it's fun for you right now. That's right. like, it, it always, it, it always struck me as weird. And that was always the kind of crosses. That was always the, the fight between Halo and call of duty for me back in the day, because like you, you don't unlock anything in Halo outside of helmets that you get for feats. And uh, I much prefer that. But so while I do lament that, I do wish that we had a more um, a more rewards driven gameplay economy in multiplayer, especially because I think single player games still do that. I, mm-hmm. I mean, spider Man's is a great example, right? Like Spider-Man just came out and you get all those you get all those costumes for um, I mean, not it's not as interesting as like getting them for doing a specific mission or anything, or though some of them are. Um, but I, I think that spirit is still alive in some single player games. But yeah, it's dead in the water for multiplayer. And that is. That is a shame. Me, Paul. Thanks for writing in. Stay tasty. I just had a couple of you yesterday, like four or five, actually. Just a cyber oh, yeah. lad wrote in. So sup, guys. First part is for Colin, but then the second part is for everyone. With your keen interest in Exodus. 
It was just announced sci-fi author Peter F. Hamilton will bring will be writing two novels set in that universe with the first due out in September. Will you be picking it up? And do any of you guys indulge in cross media for any franchises, e.g. the 50,000 Halo novels or even something as simple as the Alan Wake novel that came with the collector's edition of the first game? I did see that. I heard the first novel is going to be like 900 pages long. Whoa. That seems pretty ambitious Whoa. for me because I always have these uh, these lofty ambitions of reading these books and i read I, I at this point i really only read in the spring and summer now when i'm in the pool so i'm getting through a few books a year probably well below what i used to read so in my heart of hearts it's like yeah i'd like to read that but in my gut and my balls i know i'm not going to because it's never going to happen there's going to be no time as far as the cross media stuff i do i don't mind it at all chris have you been watching halo Season two? Is it any good? <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's out yet, um, but I will be watching it for uh, research reasons. I'm in the middle of making something. Oh, okay. That very good. Requi- that, that requires me to see it. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like I, I. We're getting a little too cute sometimes with with this stuff. Like you don't need 50,000 Halo novels. You don't. I read I read The Fall of Reach, which is actually like unironically some. That's a unironically like fantastic uh, sci-fi book. Like actually, like e- even if it was not connected to some big IP, like that'd be a, a genuinely great book. But I don't know. You can only have so many of those. And in my experience, the the novels connected to certain games are, you know, they're they're only so good. And and there's also the aspect of it is like how how long is this even going to remain canon before someone Star Wars Star Wars is this shit up into into complete irrelevance and start over so i don't know i don't i try not to engage with uh video game stories beyond their native uh medium really because that's i i honestly just feel like those supersede anything like a big issue with reach the game halo reach was that it didn't a lot of people were mad that like oh well they they broke the canon of the book and it's like well it's a video game series so in my like to me like the video game takes president over whatever the fuck was written right so it's hard so it's hard for me to really it's not like lord of the rings which was a book first you know what i mean um or or something else that started that way for me to get into that stuff so i don't know it's there's always a a wall there where i'm like this is cool but it's i'm not going to treat this like it's meaningfully connected to the game in any real way but this is what speaks to me about cross media and what what and again it's we were i'm always shitting on star wars i don't mean to but that's uh, that's why i don't want to get too deep in the cross media stuff is because I spent much of my childhood hundreds of if not a thousand dollars or more on just books Star Wars books in which they were just like oh these never happened and it's like okay so what did I just read like what would I there there is something to that like of, of gaining understanding of a universe or whatever and so I was kind of burned on that like everything half of what I know about Star Wars isn't true anymore in quotes but I don't know like how it all lines up anymore but it's that frustrates the fuck out of me. And um, I, so like what you're saying about the Halo game kind of taking. Taking precedence over the book, that makes sense to me, but I want something. Maybe this is what we'll get out of this, uh, out of the Kojima project on PS6 is. It's crazy to say that is. Something truly symphonic. Where yeah, everything would, works, right? It, Yeah, that would be great, but I, I've just really never seen it. I mean, even games from game to game sometimes ignore the previous, <laughs> you know, so like. There's a t- there's yeah infamous there's a of- infamous had to do that to because yeah. they had to just assume you made the good choices to make infamous too right exactly so like th- there's already a ton of like in game retcons going on within the medium that is in itself primary to the story that you're experiencing so like I don't know I like expanded media I think it's cool I think it's great for the people who really indulge in it there's some there's some books in the Halo series that I really like and and you know there's the, the grimoire and Destiny is really fucking fascinating it's really cool but um, I really only treat that as seasoning to something that I otherwise would still enjoy, if that makes sense. Certainly, or, you know, this would still be a really great piece of grilled chicken without all this extra shit on it, and that's fine by me. You like your chicken dry? Is that right? <laughs> I mean, like the dry to be chicken? honest with you, I'll I'll eat chicken. I don't care really. But like, if it's chicken, I'll probably eat it. You know, when like, chicken's so like, dry, had- it almost turns into like a powder. <laughs> yeah yeah dude I've had, I've had some i've had some dry chicken before and and it's 
you know, it's chicken's chicken, man. Like I, I can't be mad at chicken. I don't know. I love chicken. It's just it's too versatile of a, of a meat for me to. And sometimes I'm just too lazy to cook it well. I'm just like, I know I just need this. I know I just need this. I'll suck it up and put sauce on it, whatever. Right. But the good for yeah. good for the protein. Exactly. Anything you want to add, Dustin, before we move on? Uh, I've read uh, the Bioshock book that I'm assuming is not canon. Oh, yeah, I read, I read say, that, too. Yeah. And it was good. I liked it. Some interesting context. And then just this last week, I watched Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, and it sucked. Oh, I hated that shit. <laughs> we were all excited I, about it, though, at the time, no doubt. Yeah, I remember watching it around the time when it came out, but I remember thinking it was kind of boring then. And I also didn't understand a lot of what was going on. But now I watched it. And I was like, man, uh, some of the fight scenes, very cool. But I, <laughs> I remember watching that, that movie on my friend at my friend's house on his on my friend, Justin, on his PSP in his room. Oh, UMD. We, we were, we, we were watching UMD. it. And, and he was trying to really convince me that Final Fantasy was amazing because <laughs> I was like a really I was a real asshole about it. <laughs> I would make fun of him for like playing all these like girly <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah, so mean games. for no reason. Yeah, you, but he's like, no, man, it's good. And then he showed me Advent Children, and I, I didn't like it at all. And I, I wonder how he feels about it because he really loved it at the time. But I wonder if he would feel the same way about it now today. Advent Children uh, is a really important piece of media, I think, in that Nintendo was really the first ones that that did true cross media, and they got scared away. You know, with uh, oh yeah, like Cap- not Mario only the movie. Mario movie, but Captain N and all that kind of stuff. They were like really in the serial. There was the cool Mario and Zelda serial and all the weird shit. And then they just like ran away. But Advent children are from the square soft era when Enix was still an independent company. And they, that was an attempt to do something like, I think they were told final fantasy seven was so cinematic that they're like, you're right. And maybe we can do something about it, but it just never came together. I remember, uh, I think it was in 11th grade when it came out. Very cool. All right. Jay McGraw wrote in, said greetings chucky phil and lil now i'm curious about this who do you think's who i'm i have to be chucky because i have the glasses that's right yes phil and lil me and dustin okay i realize you are likely all tired of talking about all the layoffs but i wanted to ask you what you think of the end result of a lot of this might be since the current landscape of cost product and risk doesn't seem to be evening out what do you think of the answer what do you think the answer is to find the equilibrium i've always thought that studios should invest more internally to have smaller teams within that are always working on smaller games that would be qualified as indie in terms of size and scope. This way, they can be more diverse in their catalog and cast a wider net on potential IP that hits big. From the developer's standpoint, they can work on games that they might they might have more passion for, all the while having more safety net under them if they were out on their own. Love this show, guys. I signed up for Patreon specifically to support LSM and the great creators that you all house. Thank you, Jay, for being here. I think um, you have a nice idea, but I just think it's an old... It's like the way Japan Studio used to run. And I just don't think that you can make money that way anymore. Sony doesn't want to make $20 million games. They don't understand how to make money on them. And I would argue that you can't really make money on those games. Rare, I mean, it's very rare that you would make a game. What's a good example? Like Vampire Survivors. It's yeah. like this game's budget was probably, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know for sure. I would assume a below $100,000. And that game made <laughs> like, I don't know, 10,000 X or like whatever it may like. In, but like, that's pretty rare when you yeah. when you invest a 10. Let's say you invest. Like I heard from someone recently telling me a, a source telling me that. Like a game like Sifu was like $10 million to make. Now, Sifu sold really appreciably and they probably made a nice amount of money on it, but what they would rather do is and this is where the, the there's this is the risk reward thing they understand that if they spend 10 million dollars on sifu and they charge 40 dollars for whatever they, they really is only a ceiling of so much money they can make but by risking more you can make extraordinarily more money because they look at horizon or last of us or something and they're like all right so we're getting into like seven eight ten fifteen million sold yeah and then you can really expand the budgets out and then you start making hundreds of millions of dollars in profit and that's where these companies want to be so i don't think because you have to look at it jay through the lens in my opinion of every game requires a pipeline and every pipeline needs to be maintained and managed you need producers you need qa people you need artists you need like the whole silo and if you want to replicate it over and over and over again within this team like japan studio did you're going to end up with games like tokyo jungle rain and you know fucking 
Africa and all these random games that came out of that that system. And I just don't think that like it's very it was very rare that you got a Team Eco game or something that like really hit. Most of those games just came and went like a fart, frankly. I mean, if you weren't really playing on the systems, you wouldn't even have known they exist. Half of you listening probably have no idea what Tokyo Jungle is. And so I just think that by saying like we're going to invest more and more games and have things spooling up, I don't think that's the right answer. In my opinion, the, the right answer is having multiple triple A games at multiple studios spooled up at the same time, assuming that one or two of them are going to fail. And that's an almost dangerous thing to, to do, too. I think that's why Sony ended up canceling factions was because they just. It's just not. They want more. They want to they need to extract more value. They're not yeah. extracting very much value below 10 cents per dollar. I think it's not great. So I don't know. I appreciate your thought, Jay. I just don't think it's going to work. We don't need more games. I'll keep saying yeah. this. We need far fewer, more high quality <laughs> games. Yeah, I would say four out of five games. Just get rid of them at this point. Like. We need <laughs> I'll keep saying that we were set. It's different, but Nintendo and and N64 and SNES, these these consoles existed with like a thousand games each. I mean, N64, I think, has like 400. These are these yeah. are legendary consoles. I'm not saying you don't want choice, but you don't want too much choice because then things start to slip through the cracks and no one makes money. The The, the problem is volume. It's all about volume right now. Right. It's fucked. And that's why a lot of people are getting laid off. And that's why a lot of studios are going to go go away. I'm going to talk to Jonathan Blow about it next week. But his whole theory, at least one of his theories, is that studios are just going to straight up close. Like the, it's not about laying off. It's that there's no place for these products. Like there's just no way forward for you. And making more games and, and competing with each other would be a disaster. Unless the only publisher that that works for is Xbox. Because I think that's what they need. I don't think anyone else needs it, though. Finally, Stephen Shifa- what is this? Shifino wrote in and said there was, it's like the I, the F, the I was too much there on the screen. I couldn't yeah, quite make yeah. it out. Hey, Sacred Crew. First, I'd like to say thank you to you and the rest of the LSM family. I finally decided to bite the bullet and subscribe to the Patreon last month after being a longtime free listener. And I'm presently surprised at the amount of content you provide. I used to run out of shows to listen to and, and now I can't keep up. Thank you. My inquiry is for all of you to chime in. You all have mentioned in one way or another using remote play on PlayStation or otherwise. With devices like the Portal, the Backbone, remote play play uh, apps via Apple TV and Google TV and streaming available through PS Plus Premium, what are your thoughts on the next generation of PlayStation embracing a model similar to Xbox? Still offer consoles for the premium experience and offer gaming through streaming and remote play. I'm a husband and father of two boys, and most of my gaming on PlayStation is accomplished via remote play. For context, I recently platinumed Elden Ring after 195 hours, and about 190 of those were spent through remote play. Thanks for all that you do. Sorry for the long winded inquiry. Thank you, Stephen, for writing. And so, Chris, you were saying this earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, where are you on this? You said you were having a very positive streaming experience via um, your Steam Deck. I'm having a very positive experience, which is a more native experience, but it's still a, a streaming experience on the Lesbia portal. So oh, it's not really streaming. It's it's just acting as the console's controller. But we're getting to this point where we can imagine an off console PlayStation reality, which I think will also come to pair on PC will also come to bear on mobile. So I very much think that that is the future. I just think that Sony doesn't want to make that future happen too quickly because they're still busy locking everyone in. And right. once you, like once you go console it's not almost going to matter anymore because they'll just have you because it's be like, oh, right. yeah, well, you've been here for 15 years, so. Here are your games and everything. And, and so I think that I think it's just about keeping people as captive as long as possible. I don't think they're going to talk about that future for as long as they possibly can. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is like a game of King of the Hill where like you just want to stay. You want to have as much time accumulated on that hill as possible. So that way, when all this does happen, you just end up with like so many people with so much time enveloped in your brand and ip and and their library kind of in hinging on you it definitely be it would definitely be good for them because they don't have to sell consoles at a loss or like spend a ton of that money making new machines like that's that's one of the biggest barriers of entry for that in the first place and it's probably a big reason why it's so fucking expensive so it's an interesting future i like i i definitely i'm having a great experience with it um even in this weird kind of you know not native way with steam deck through playstation or even just a, a steam deck through my my pc it's it's been really good and kind of eye-opening and um if it gets if it 
like if it gets better from here, then I don't see any reason why this wouldn't be a, a complete um, upending of how we traditionally play our games. It's just it's just objectively so convenient. It's so convenient to play in bed and get console quality like visuals and frame rate. It's crazy. I almost don't even understand how it works. Yeah, I don't because really I either like understand it. Almost, it. it almost, <laughs> like it almost feels impossible that the delay should be as imperceptible as it is because especially as somebody who's like a, a big stickler for that kind of thing. Like I notice, I notice when the TV is in game mode every single time. You know what I mean? Every single time. I'm like, dude, how are you playing like this? I've, you, I can't even tell you how many times I've been to people's houses and they've been playing everything fucking delayed. Like their entire lives before I showed up with my fucking yeah, like mystic- they almost can't play the right way now, you know. Yeah, there were. I, I've been to, I've been to places where it's like, oh, can you change it back? And they're like, no, <laughs> no, I won't. You figure it out. That's so funny. Yeah, <laughs> but, I've done uh, you a favor. Yeah, yeah. yeah, geez, imagine imagine just disrespecting a favor like that. But yeah, no, I I think um, I don't know. It it really is it it really is crazy. I, I was really down on it for a very very long time. Um, I just didn't really have good experiences with experiences with it prior, especially when it was tethered to a phone, like a like a a device that already has like a very very split purpose and utility. Like I didn't like getting text messages on it. I didn't like having to, you know, pause by like scrolling up and exiting. Having a dedicated device for that is 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 really, I mean, life changing is crazy to say, but like life changing as far as like how my gaming habits are. So it's completely shifted the way I play. Like in almost every in almost every facet. Dustin, so it's a big yeah. deal. When uh, uh, when hardware goes away, will you go off the grid? Uh, yeah. At that point, I'm just going to wrap it up and stop playing games permanently. But no. So I think it's very important to make a distinction, uh, just because I think that there's a, there's a lot of words that get thrown around with this. Is that uh, I'm all about in home Wi Fi based streaming from your console. Yes, that's what Chris is talking about. That's what I was yeah. talking about a few weeks ago. That's what the yeah. portal is. Yeah, we're not talking about PS now where you're streaming like some random digital copy of of Killzone 2 yeah. uh, from from some random PS3 server farm. That, that shit sucks. Still. Right. So I think that it's certainly possible that eventually we will get there, but I still think it's far away. The closest anyone's ever gotten is with Google Stadia in terms of the quality of the latency, the um, the overall low compression on the image. It was close, but it's still for, I would say, enthusiasts too far away. So I think that Sony will hold on to this model as long as possible. And right now I'm guessing they're not that worried because... I personally, and I don't know if it's my location of the data centers, I've never had a good experience with Xbox cloud streaming. And I know some people do, and that's great, but I've not had a good experience. I'm really curious about NVIDIA now, which I think is a pretty good streaming. But for the time being, I, I don't think that Sony is even... the They're only using that route because they bought Gaikai and they're using it as a Band-Aid for their... Uh, backwards compatibility for PlayStation 3. But I think universally it's... I always say I feel like it's universally agreed that it's not very good, but then someone always leaves a comment that says, well, that's how I, I played all of God of War 1, 2, and 3 with uh, the the PlayStation Now. And I'm like, cool. Those are, those are people who don't know that their, that their TV isn't on game mode. <laughs> exactly. I wish that I Precisely. could live in that way and play those games that way, but I just can't. So legitimately and i don't mean that sarcastically i'm happy for you but some of us out there care so deeply about compression and resolutions and uh latency that it's going to be a long time before i want to play a game on some remote cloud all right my friends that's it we made it to the end i think this will be the longest episode ever yeah. maybe will it pretty close I think so. I'll have to look. I thought we did a I thought we did a six hour one once. Maybe we did. I don't know. But it was a good one nonetheless. I enjoyed this episode. It was good to have something to celebrate and talk, you know, positive to yeah. talk about. And oh yeah, we we, we did a five hour and forty five minute one mm. for the game awards. I think this is gonna be a little short of that. So yeah. Oh well. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let's get the hell out of here. I'm fucking shot. Chris, thank you for joining me today. 
us today. Goodbye to you. Enjoy the rest of your day. You still have a day because it's only 345 where you are. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so, so I'm so hungry. Uh, but uh, but it's it's I don't know, man. It's it's good to have stuff to talk about in this way. Like it's we've had, it's been a while since we've had an episode like this, really. Yeah, Especially like with real texture. PS Plus. Yeah. yeah, with with texture and also just uh, a PS Plus that we were all pretty good, like like feeling pretty good about. You know, it's it's nice to have. Uh, it's a nice wave of optimism to get at the beginning of the year. So. Indeed, I'm feeling good. About I feel good. I feel like they did a great job, and I don't know that there's very much to complain about right now. So, um, Dustin, goodbye to you. Thank you for t- joining us today. Be well. Goodbye. I'm glad. I uh, I've been. I got a text update. Said dinner ready in five minutes so it is my time well, look at you time to leave and then i'll be back up here getting this episode ready for you guys for a few hours so uh i've got some time ahead but that's okay because persona 3 this weekend after constellation recording so excellent. i still have a i still have a little ways to go but i'll make it most excellent well, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for dedicating so much time with me today to this. I'm sure the audience is going to love this episode, and I'm sure they're pretty stoked generally about the state of play as well. So glad to be able to discuss it with you guys in a timely fashion. Again, putting this up for free for everyone immediately. That's just a nice little, even to the scallywags, the freeloaders. Um, we want you to have a little fun with us this time too, not have to yeah. wait. So thank you again. Appreciate you. Patreon.com slash Last Day Media for early ad free access and to support us otherwise and lastdaymedia.store for merch, t-shirts, hats, sweatshirts, stickers, etc. Couldn't do without you. We'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. See ya. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.